Okay, so they have to open that door so we can use it as a Can they open that door? Who locked this door? Welcome to day two of our 12th annual Autism Conference 2022. It's such a delight to see everyone again. My name is Olua Sheung, uh, for those who weren't here yesterday. Uh, there's a lot I'll be doing for those of you who weren't here yesterday. We'll do introductions, we'll do all of that. Um, but again, as we started with a chant, with some energy in the room, when I say autism, you say I am awesome with your fist, with some energy. Can we do that? Autism? Autism. Please put your hands together for yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the team, the management at GT Co, we want to welcome you to day two of our conversation as we seek to create a community of autism advocates. Yesterday was packed, it was rich, a lot of conversation, it was very inspiring in many ways, and we intend to continue today. We have a very solid panel, a very solid list of experts, um, panelists, and presenters. You saw some of them yesterday, you see uh, them again today, and some that you did not see yesterday. So allow me to introduce them. They're the actual stars of the show uh, today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to call them on stage. You're going to put your hands together, and then I would introduce those who were not here yesterday. All right. Um, I think he was... I mean, he was one of the stars of the show yesterday, but you guys really loved him. Let's put our hands together for John Paul. John Paul Horsley. Let's also welcome Dr. Larry Duile. Mr. Mr. Larry. He just has this poise of a... Mr. Mr. Larry. He just has this poise of a doctor, you know, he just... And the way he talks, you know, he just... All right, we also have Camille Proctor. Let's put our hands together for Camille Proctor. Then we had a real doctor, Dr. Ladipo Shomi. We also had Dr. Muhyiddin Bakare. Yes, let's keep that round of applause going. Dr. Bimbola Akiyelue. We had uh, Bukola Ainde. We had Beauty Kumesine. Of course, we had Amanda Budge making a presentation yesterday. Whitney was mostly a spectator, but we expect to hear from her today. Please put your hands together for Whitney Hamel. Is Shalakwe Azazi in the building, um, our, our moderator? Okay, she's not here today. All right, um, we also had, oh yes. Forgive me, that I, I need to, you know you saved the best for the last. But it's like my eyes pinning me now because I can't find her name. Joy, O V O J Adeni. Put your hands together for Joy, our behavior analyst. And we have another doctor joining us. Um, he wasn't here yesterday. Dr. Ade Awe, a special care dentist specializing in oral and maxillofacial, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dr. Adeawe, you have to come and help me pronounce that. Yeah, Shalakwe Azazi is here. Let's put our hands together for Shalakwe. Maxillofacial. Did I get that right now? 
So he is a special care dentist specializing in oral and maxillofacial surgery at the Mehari Medical College, USA. There was something about Dr. Awe's skin. I just knew he was from abroad. You know, it's the way their skin, you know, looks, it radiates. Put your hands together for him one more time. We're still expecting Paul Okogo uh, to join us, an experienced sales and marketing professional, has held several senior um, sales and marketing positions in FMCG and telecoms. He's also the founder of Chocolate City Group, now partnered with Warner Music Group, and one of the most respected uh, brands in the music industry. Uh, he, he is also a father of an autistic child, so we're expecting Paul to join us. But here we also have Remy Olutimai. Come and ask her for Remy. Remy is my senior colleague in the in the industry. He's a voice director, voice actor, writer, and producer. His work covers animation, audiobooks, e-learning, documentaries. Uh, he's been a part of memorable projects, including our own area animated series, and more recently, the audio drama series Love, Music, and Dreams, produced by TNC Africa. So come and welcome. Remy Olutimai one more time with a round of applause. All right, so that is our roll call today. If there are any other uh, individuals that I've missed, I'm sure before the end of the day we we'll recognize them. So can you take like two steps forward? Who am I missing? Where's Kane? Oh, forgive me. Oluwatoni Odunui. Please put your hands together for her. From um, Self-published author, writer, and disability advocate. And she was on the panel yesterday. You're very welcome, Toyin. Yes, thank you. Oh, where's um? Let's have photographs, and we also call on, of course, our GT Code team. Please put your hands together. Tolu Anikwede, Adenri Sola, Alex Adedikwe. Again, a big thank you to GT Code for making all of this happen. Remember. The 12th annual autism conference, pivotal part of the Orange Ribbon Initiative, which is really about giving a voice to the voiceless and really helping those that need help in our society. So a big thank you to the Guarantee Trust uh, holding company, uh, Guarantee Trust Bank, and all the different uh, subsidiaries for making this happen. Can I put our hands together for this lovely panel of experts? You may come off the stage now. Ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome our online audience with a resounding round of applause? We have hundreds of people who are watching this conference virtually and have tuned in from different parts of the world. So we really want to say a special thank you to everyone who is uh, joining online. All right. Um, remember, if you're online, uh, keep the conversation going. Our hashtag for this conference is Be A Voice. We're also using the hashtag autism, but we're spelling it A-W-E-T-I-S-M. Now, right behind me is no one other than Camille Proctor. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for her. Good morning, good morning. How is everyone? No, it's I am. Louder, please. I am. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So yesterday we had some very good sessions. Uh, we learned about what evidence-based care is. We also learned about inclusion and transforming how we see the world um, in education, collaboration, and paying attention. Uh, our third session yesterday, we learned about community involvement. My involvement, your inclusion. We also learned about an autistic father's journey, his life, his art, his journey of self-discovery and fatherhood. We had a great panel that covered the circles of care, how the physicians and therapeutics work collaboratively to create the best outcomes for their patients. And lastly, we had a wonderful panel. It takes the village of parents and siblings where the discussion was solely around how parents, siblings, how they 
cope and how they manage, how they care for and support their loved ones. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to, where my hand is? Yeah. So, I guess we're going to get started with our program now. Can we put our hands together for Camille Proctor one more time? Oh, you can do better with that round of applause. Come on. Autism! Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special performance by Corporate Dance World. It was done yesterday to open the show, but we're going to have a repeat performance of that this morning. If you enjoyed it last night, or rather yesterday, celebrate Corporate Dance World one more time. here for about an hour after they close from school. Mm. They spend time here playing, smiling, and discovering their gifts and talents. This looks so nice. I'm sure Tade will like it here. Tade. Tade. Oh. He will. It takes some time getting used to. Let me introduce you to the children. Meet Bolaji and Sarah. Hello. <laughs> they love to play the keyboard, so we gave them Tense. Oh, yes. Nice. Let me introduce you. Computer. I tell you, I do not understand it myself, but I find it quite fascinating. Indeed. <laughs> Steve Bobo. I call him Steve Bobo. Steve, Steve. <laughs> Steve is a genius with an IQ of 130. Yes, he is a member of the Mensa Society. Mm -hmm. Steve. <laughs> Over there is Charles. Hi, Charles. Charles. <laughs> Charles is a great artist. He has even sold one of his paintings. Wow. Yes. That looks like something Tade would like. I'm sure. Tade. <laughs> Sometimes we get worried because we don't know what to do or what he needs. My mother always used to say to me when I was young that I should paint her a picture of what I was feeling. She said that it would help her figure out how to help me. Of course, she didn't mean it literally. Daddy, he takes everything literally.
Loving can hurt. Loving can hurt sometimes, but it's the only thing that I know. When it gets hard, you know it can get hard. us feel alive We keep the love in We make these memories for ourselves Where our eyes are never closing Hearts are never broken and Time's forever frozen still So you can keep Inside the park that he feels alone mm. and nobody likes to feel alone nobody. that is why I brought him here for him to feel less alone <sighs> it looks like he still feels that way
my mommy usually brings me here sometimes. She wants me to play with the other kids, but I usually play all by myself. I, hello. Most of the kids do not want to play with me. They do not want to play with me. Most, most of the kids do not want to play with me. Most, most of the kids do not want to play with me. They do not. Pray. How about that? How about this? Ice cream. Most of the kids. Most of the kids. Ice cream. Buy ice cream. Ice cream. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, young man, how are you? How are you doing? Uh, you want to buy ice cream? Which one do you want? Do you want this one? Young man. I, I don't make more. I, I, young man. Uh, 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 how are you, Daddy? Which one do you want to buy? Hey, where is the money? Okay. Ice cream, buy ice cream. Buy ice Uh-uh. They -uh. agreed to that, I know I have it. Because they owe me money, have it? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, you want? Uh, okay. Take. You are you afraid the one you are owing. Okay, thank you. treat another human being, then it is you. You claim to be so religious and brought up to be kind and treat another human being with loving kindness, yet you go and do this. 
then it is you. You have a duty and the opportunity with this institution to protect and support our children. Yes, you pick and choose who you think deserves it. It is you who is a waste of resources. You, you. on me that I am different and that's enough for me do not judge people by what you see externally I am this way it doesn't mean I don't have dreams or aspirations just like you do they just might be bigger than you all combined my disability isn't a, a, a barrier to capabilities there is so much more to what you think about me and my kind. We want you to be a part of our story, story, story a part of all that we dream to become because I am something you've never seen before. I am Tade and I am different. Okay. I am Tade okay. and I am yes. different. I am it's okay. I am it's okay. I am okay. I am Tade. Look, look, look at what you did. It's beautiful. Look at it. You should be proud. It's beautiful. Uh, I'll put it in the car. I'll be right back. Uh, okay? Uh, uh, I am different. I am sad.
your sodas down the river too far. What about us? I am Kate Henshaw and I am an autism advocate. My name is Tade and thank you for being a part of my
about us? What about us? Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And again, the amazing Kate Henshaw. Thank you. On behalf of Corporate Dance World, um, this gentleman here, okay, you can stop now. You can stop now. In our own little way, um, this is how as artists we are able to let you know that we are a part of your story. Um, in fact, your story is our story. There, there are no separate stories anywhere. And this little or short production is just to help promote the message of inclusion as much as possible. So thank you, GT. Thank you, the organizers of the conference. And my name is Bimbo Bafunwa, and this is Corporate Dance World. We are Autism Advocates. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now, wasn't that beautiful? Ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Corporate Dance World. And to our superstar actress, Kate Henshaw, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the story is ours. The story is for everyone here. We are part of that narrative. We are part of, you know, letting everyone know that autism means that you can be awesome. Right? So, autism... Autism! Well, let's get right into the hits and think of it. We have four sessions back to back this morning. The first one would be by Dr. Muidin Bakare on the topic validity and reliability of the Nigerian Autism Screening Questionnaire. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Muidin Bakare, who is a renowned researcher and expert to speak on this topic right now at the 12th Annual Autism Conference. Please put your hands together. Uh, we've learned so many things yesterday. We've learned that we need to provide interventions for our children with autism. We've learned that we need to identify their area of needs intervention and engage multidisciplinary professionals. But before we can provide intervention, we first need to make diagnosis. And how do we make diagnosis? Where there is no doctor, where there is no developmental psychologist, we need to do assessments. And to do assessments, we need tools. We need tools to do assessments. So uh, there are a number of tools that we can use to do assessment to make diagnosis of autism. Many of them are of Western origin. They are developed either from Europe or North America. And they are unaffordable, especially to us in low resource setting, like in Africa. And they are leading with cultural bias. 
and they don't fit properly into our cultural setting. So uh, we look at these issues and we say, me and my team, we look at developing indigenous screening questionnaire that can be used as primary care setting and secondary care setting. No specialists, no developmental pediatrician, no developmental psychologists, no psychiatrists, but we have community health care workers that can use these instruments and say, okay, your child is likely to have autism. That is the reason why we go to, towards developing this indigenous screening questionnaire. And we intend it to be made available freely so that everybody in low resource setting especially Sub-Saharan Africa, can make use of it. Briefly about the tool, the Nigerian Autism Screening Questionnaire. So Nigeria Autism Screening Questionnaire. Uh, I will talk about the development and the clinical validation that we are doing. So it's a two-phase study. We've done the first phase. The first phase, which is a community study that we do a household survey using this questionnaire. And uh, we started in 2016 and we completed writing this up and getting it published in a journal in uh, 2022. So we have a second phase. Second phase is what, uh, what we are trying to implement with this, uh, with this clinical consultation we are doing at this conference. And we hope it will yield positive results after testing in the second phase, which is the clinical study. The second phase requires us to compare it to standard diagnostic instruments like DSM-5 and some other standard instruments. So that's the first phase and second phase. Yeah, that's the paper for the first phase. We've written it up, it's been published, and uh, we, are, we use it in the community setting and did a household survey in Nigeria in the six geographical zones in the country. So we say the need for a free informant based report screening tool that can be used in low resource settings like Nigeria informs development of this our screening instruments. There are previous existing instruments that we reviewed and look at their, de their development and all that and we synthesize it. And we, when we they are developing our own, we make sure the Nigeria Autism Screening Questionnaire was developed based on criteria specified in DSM-5 to make diagnosis of autism. So we develop the criteria and uh, we give it to a number of experts to look at. Uh, they look at it and we do some peer review. They remove some items, they have some items before we get to the final 26 item questionnaire. After we are satisfied with pre-testing, we now use it in the general household survey. Uh, we did a 5,000 sample household survey based on the representation that has been done by the World Bank together with Nigeria, Nigeria uh, Bureau of Statistics about development and uh, agricultural 
issues in, the, in Nigeria. So the participants included informants. They are typically biological parents of children between age one to 18 uh, during the terrain also survey that was conducted between 2015 and 2016. The field worker collecting the data for the general household survey, they call it wave three data, were trained at the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics Office in Abuja. They were trained on the use of the questionnaire before they went to the field. So and, uh, and uh, after that, we put the data together. It's included 26 item questions, like I mentioned, and have dichotomous responses, like yes and no. The first two questions assess the presence of expected level of speech, and the remaining 24 of the items assess the core autism symptoms. So there are four questions that we develop to first assess any form of developmental concern that we interview the parents. Those questions are, are you worried about language and communication development of this child? Are you worried about relationship with peers? Are you worried about development? So I want to talk about the results. The final sample included 12,311 participants, age 1 to 18. Most participants were biological children of the informants. That's 86.7%. Uh, the sex was shifted slightly towards male, which represents 53.4%. And a substantial minority had developmental concern, about 15.9% in total. So geographical distribution were consistent with greater population in northern region of the country, with most 76.1% living in northern Nigeria, and nearly three quarters living in rural regions of the country. Nigerian autism questionnaire total raw scores at a positive skew, with overall modern, median, and mean scores being two, four, and 4.9 respectively. So, uh, our study essentially describes the initial psychometric evaluation of a newly developed culturally sensitive autism symptom measure, the Nigeria Autism Screening Questionnaire, as part of a national representative household survey in Nigeria. The present investigation takes an important step by identifying that Nigeria Autism Questionnaire is a reliable tool with good structural validity and may be useful as a screening and symptoms tracking instrument in this resource limited environment. We are not sure yet, and that is why we are doing the, the clinical validation, which is the phase two. So, but based on what we did and what we found, we found that a score of seven and above is likely to predict that a child have symptoms of autism. And this we can confirm definitely after the clinical validation, which we are presently in. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Moedin Bakari. Do you want to take questions? All right, we can squeeze in actually maybe just two quick questions. Okay, going. Okay, Dr. Muidin, it seems like you did a brilliant presentation and we have no question. All right, can we put our hands together? Okay, okay, finally, two hands up. Can you make it very brief, sir? Hello, sir. 
please. I want to know whether abscesism is a disease or, or what, what is it? Okay, so this is a very basic I, question. I, I didn't get that. Is autism a disease or what is it? Well, a disease is a condition that you can identify the pathology whereby you under this, this is the pathology of a disease. But autism is not a disease. It's a disorder that has constellation of symptoms. Disorders are conditions that have constellation of symptoms that you can make pathological diagnosis like malaria or pneumonia, for instance, or tuberculosis. Okay. So those are diseases. Autism is a disorder. It's not a disease. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, doctor. Uh, my question is, you stated earlier that there are screening tools. Yeah, there are screening tools. Okay, because I know that most hospitals in Nigeria, to the best of my knowledge, apply the use, they, they use a questionnaire. Can everybody hear me? Good morning. Um, thank you very much. This is an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I was really excited to come here and talk. And so today I'll be talking about um, dental considerations for patients with autism spectrum disorder. Um, I'm a resident over at Meharry Medical College. Um, I did my dental school at University of Maryland. And that was the first place where I got to work with special needs. And then at Meharry, we do have a special needs clinic where we work closely with um, autistic patients and we do cleanings, extractions, um, fillings for them. So let me go ahead and start with my PowerPoint. Am I doing it right? <laughs> uh, okay. I don't see it working. I'm sorry, give me a second. Get okay. Well, okay. I'm just going to talk about my PowerPoint. So, um, <laughs> voila, <laughs> let's try this then. So overview, I'll talk about general characteristics of ASD, um, dental considerations and management, talk about behavioral methods used by the dental staff and home-based preparations. So let's see, I'm going to skip through all this part. Um, so. going so fast. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay. Anyways, um, so big things that you worry about with autistic patients, you worry about social interaction, you worry about communication, you worry about repetitive behaviors. And so when they come into your practice, you want to tr try to keep things as the same as possible when they come into the dental practice every single time. Um, the CDC estimates that there are approximately 730,000 individuals from birth to age 21 who have ASD. Um, so, individuals with ASD usually may engage, yeah, thank you. Individuals with ASD may engage with repetitive behaviors. This repetitive behaviors include, um, they wanna sit in the same dental chair when they come in, they wanna go to the same dental room when they come in, they want to see the same dentist when they come into your practice. And so those are certain things that you want to keep in mind when you're treating patients with autism. So what do you see when a patient comes in with autism? You see things like what we call bruxism. 
where they grind their teeth and they break down their teeth and that can lead to infection. When they have infection, what can happen is it can affect their airway and then it can lead to swelling down there and when there's swelling there, that can lead to us taking them to the operating room to do something called an incision and drainage. A lot of times when people think about autism, about surgery is really essential to the special needs population. So other things that you see is macrocephaly. Macrocephaly is a bigger proportion of the upper, upper, um, upper head compared to every other part of the body. Other things that you see also is bruising and, bruising, um, bruising and abrasions of their forehead. Surprisingly, they don't have as much breakdown of their teeth when you compare them to um, people like a normal population. So sometimes the other issue is they have difficulty. Yeah. Let's try it. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay, here we are. So sometimes they have difficulty accepting brushing and flossing. Sometimes they're restricted with the foods that they can eat. So sometimes the, the foods that they like might be high in sugar and that can lead to a breakdown of their teeth. Let's see. So patients who have ASD diagnosis do not, mouth is dry, that leads to the breakdown of the teeth and that can also lead to infection and loss of teeth. Um, and then gag reflex. Gag reflex means dry heaving where whenever a dentist goes in their mouth, they feel like they want to throw up. They feel like they're nauseous. And so that can prevent the dentist from doing the work that he or she really needs to do. And then, so basically, what, what do you need to think about when a patient comes to your practice? What you need to think about is from the front staff, the person that meets the patients when they first come in, you have to make sure that they're trained really well. To the dental hygienist that is going to be doing the cleaning, to the dentist that will be doing the fillings, the extractions, and um, the root canals. So um, let's see. So there's something called tell, show, do. Tell, show, do is basically you tell the patient before they come in, you tell them what they're going to be doing, what to expect at the dental practice, and then you show them, you can show them on a dummy or something called a mannequin, how to brush their teeth on a mannequin. Once you do that, that establishes trust between you and the patient. Once that happens, then once they trust you, then you can go ahead and do the procedure that you need to do, such as a cleaning or a filling. But that's very important. The other part that is important is making sure that the patient is desensitized to the dental office. So the first time that they come in, the first thing that you can do is have them just walk into the dental office and then leave. Then the next time that they come in, you have them sit in a dental chair and then leave. Then the next time they come in, they sit in the dental chair for about five minutes and then sit in the dental chair for about 10 minutes, sit in the dental chair for about 15 minutes till they trust you as a provider. And once that happens, then you can go ahead and try and see if you can do whatever procedure that you need to work on with them. So the other thing is, make sure you have a warm, calm, soothing voice also. If, the other, if you're in a big dental practice, one thing that you think about, there are other patients coming, there are other kids coming, and, they might, and that might affect an autistic patient coming into your practice. So you can, the lights are turned down, you can play some videos for them while you're working on them, that way that distracts them. Make sure that whatever you're playing it's not something that they've seen before because it would not be as effective if, if it's not something new. So, and then visual tools. Another way you can go ahead and make them trust, familiar with the dental pictures. Or the, and then they, there's something called applied behavior analysis. Um, this is just something where they learn how to, um, they teach specific skills. So you teach them how to um, use a toothbrush. Um, you teach them how to floss. Flossing is very important. I know it's a pain, especially at night when these kids want to go to sleep, or even adults, even us, when we want to go to sleep, the issue is sometimes we don't feel like brushing our teeth or we don't feel like flossing. But it's very important, especially in these kids, because the biggest thing is you do not want to have these kids come into the emergency room 
with infections to their teeth, which can affect their airway, because that would lead to them taking taking them to the operating room and trying to make sure that um, you know trying to do an incision and drainage. So again, make sure that they're brush, um, brushing and flossing. So just like individuals who do not have ASD, individuals with ASD respond well to the use of verbal praise and smiles. So again, if they do something right, make sure that you praise them. Um, another thing you can do is social stories. So the dental books that involve Dora the Explorer, they involve um, Sp uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. And so something that will keep them interested in making sure that they brush the teeth and they um, come to the dentist. Um, so again, prevention. Thank you so much, Dr. Adewe. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. All right, I can see a hand in front. Good morning, um, that was very insightful. Thank you. My question, at what age would you recommend my first dental visit for um, a child? I would say as soon as they start having teeth. So I would say as early as a year old, you want to bring your kids to the dentist and take for us to just take a look. We might not do anything for them at that age, but um, I think that's very important for them to come to the de dentist as early as possible. All right, thank you for that. Thank you so much, doctor. I have a 25-year-old young man living with autism, and uh, usually if he's brushing, uh, he bleeds because he, he has so much uh, pressure when he's brushing, and if I tell him to slow down, he will tell him, mommy, no. How do I make him stop bleeding? Or is there any toothpaste that you can recommend so that... Uh, if he's using it, he can't be bleeding. And then when I, the last time we visited the dentist, uh, they recommended um, Colgate maximum cavity protection. And that's what he's using. But with that pressure he has when he's uh, brushing, he still bleeds. So when I, when I was growing up... Are you charging by the hour for this consultation? Huh? It's, it's, it's paid by GTCO. Don't worry, go ahead. <laughs> so when I was growing up, the biggest thing was they said, the harder you brush, the whiter your teeth are going to be. We all know that's not true. <clears throat> so what I recommend for my patients are very soft toothbrushes, not hard. <clears throat> so no matter how hard the brush, the bristles on that toothbrush is soft. And so it decreases the chance of erosion on the teeth. So that would be one way to go. As far as the toothpaste that you asked for, this has to be, I'm not sure how it is in Nigeria, but we have to prescribe Previdin 5000, depending on what, uh, how bad the caries are with the teeth, so, okay. All right, thank you. We have one more question. Good morning. Just like mm, Dr. Obiodun Bakari said that autism is not a, uh, can we say, is the root cause of autism. You know, as we are taught in school, as we are taught in school, as we are taught in school, generally, the cause of disability can be classified under, I'm coming, I'm coming. And, All right, let's settle down. The people at different levels of um, understanding of this issue so can we just settle down not everyone is an expert so we would assume um, so we'll have a doctor show me help with that answer okay all right thank you thank you all right good morning everybody I'm, it's part of being tolerant so we need to understand that we're all in different levels of understanding and i'm sure most people really don't know the cost so and they really want to know so I'll just start very simply. So mental health disorders 
like neurodevelopmental disorders, are not like the regular illnesses that we're familiar with. So it's not like malaria caused by a mosquito, beaten by an Ophelis mosquito, blah, blah, blah. So generally, mental disorders have three possible causes, a physical, a psychological, and then a social cause. These three causes combine to let it happen. Essentially, we all have the risk factors or things that can make us have it. So we have physical components. So that could be genetic. Okay, it could be um, a tumor, an infection, everything that you can see physically that can cause it. So some people can have a road traffic accident and then develop um, something of that sort. But that's different from autism. So autism, usually the trauma is in the womb. So it could be the mother is using psychoactive substance, maybe some form of concussions, taking drugs, cocaine, blah, 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 and then all those stuff. Then you could also have the psychological components. So all of us have traits. So it's not like we're all boxed into the way our psyche is. We have traits of different things. So we all are alike but not the same. So we pick things from different places, which makes us independent. Then we have social components. So I usually just divide it very simply. Your individual home, your extended home, the society setting you are, and then the larger community. Now, we all know that in this community, um, there are things we do. So there's the culture in which you're born into, or which you live in. So if you live in Lagos, you'll be different from someone like me who lives in Abelkuta because the things you do are different. If you are born in Ajegule, you'll be different from somebody who lives in Banana Island. So the struggles are different, but they all add up. It's the way you negotiate, which essentially is politics. So if you grew up in a streetwise environment, your skills for negotiations will be different from somebody who lives in Ekoi and then has very few people who understand and then believe everything you say. You get my drift. So the whole thing, both the physical, the psychological, and social, they add up. So when it re reaches a tilting point, then somebody develops a mental. So for example, a child. Um, will have contributions from his parents from different things. So there are a lot of things that can cause it. So all those things can be broken down in very simple terms. I don't want to go into complicating the whole issue. You understand? So that's the cause. Then I also want to make a comment about um, somebody who said that um, in Nigeria we use questionnaire to make... What is autism? You know, how do you know if you have autism? You know, just those basic questions in two minutes. Okay, so like uh, has been described, autism is a developmental disorder. And you cannot diagnose it through blood work. If you do a million blood work, you won't see autism. In fact, the guy with autism may be healthier than I am. All right? So no, no um, laboratory diagnosis. They are uh, behavioral markers. Is this child having a dysfunction in communication? If the answer is yes, check. What about behaviors? If the answer is yes, check. What about social interaction? If the answer is yes, check. And then with some other um, 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 assessments, the doctor makes a determination. If I can get this working now. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Do we remember our chant? So say, I am awesome. No. Hey. <laughs> Autism. Great. Let's do that one more time. Autism. Wonderful. Good morning. Happy to be here with you. Um, my name, as you said, is Whitney Hamill Annie. I'm a behavior analyst and also a special educator. And I'm actually based in Ghana. Um, but I always coming to Nigeria too, so I'm happy to see you all here today. I'm going to be talking about the use of compassionate care 
and why we need it. But before I get into that, I'd like to know a little bit more about the audience. So if you're a parent, can you raise your hand for me, a parent or caregiver, when you're searching for support? And most importantly, the majority of the audience here are teachers, are educators, are professionals. And I want to talk about the skills that you need to develop to be able to do your best work with families and make that greater impact on your work. So this, this um, presentation is based off of a research article in the field of behavior analysis. It's, um, you can look this up, it's in the uh, Behavior Analysis and Practice Journal, and it's by Taylor LeBlanc and Nozick. It has to do with compassionate care in the ABA field, but I wanna make it a little broader today. So first off, let's look at what is compassionate care. We all know that um, we hear a lot about empathy, right? And that's more so about being able to walk in the shoes of the families that we are interacting with. We're able to feel how they're feeling, they're more so as support. But compassion is empathy with action. It's another step beyond that. It's not just about listening to the family's stories and, you know, feeling, um, you know, some, some sadness or, you know, wanting to, um, like I said, there's be feeling. When we were all watching the play earlier, we could feel how the mom was feeling. She but the piece that is, is, along with compassion, is offering those next steps, offering the ways forward that support the parent in finding the... Um, the way to support whatever the needs are of that child, and also helping them have compassion for themselves, too. So when it comes to um, the medical field, many doctors and nurses, they have training in how to have what we call bedside manner, right? You learn how to be, um, to, to do your best in, in listening well to the, the patients and, uh, be able to support them not just clinically but emotionally as well. But to please go back. When it comes to educators and therapists, we don't typically have training in this, right? We just focus on what are the um, clinical skills, what are the educational tools that we need to learn. But we also need to be a more well-rounded individual. It's not just about um, being knowledgeable, but you can't really make that impact with the families. When they've looked at research in health, they've trying our that um, when the, the health professional has different um, skills related to empathy and compassion, it creates more parent, uh, patient satisfaction, they're more likely to listen to the advice of the doctor, and um, of course, improved clinical outcomes. You're gonna create that relationship with your client, and they're gonna be more likely to listen to you and do what's being prescribed, what's being addressed. So when it comes to the work that educators are doing and professionals, it's very important because it's likely that you're going to be incorporating the concerns of the parent and using that to plan for your goals. It's not just what you think is best for the child, but what is also important to the family and including that. They're, the parents are gonna be more likely to follow through with the advice and also share that, hey, this doesn't work for my family, you know, and you can find a different way to approach it. And also when everyone in the client's life is on the same page, it creates that level of consistency that's needed for learning new skills and especially decreasing maladaptive behavior. If the teachers are doing one thing to address how um, we're managing tantrums, but at home, maybe grandma is doing her own thing and sister is doing another approach, 
you're not going to see a decrease in that challenging behavior. If you're teaching a new skill and people are doing it different ways and not collaborating together, the child is less likely to make the progress that everyone wants them to, to see. So this is to the parents out here. Lanre spoke yesterday about the importance of evidence-based therapies, of making sure that the people you're working with are credentialed, um, are, are able to, um, to do things and have you know, the, the further governing boards and such. It's not just about someone who wants to do well for your child, but someone who is well-trained to do what they need to do for your child. So in addition to that, when you are seeking services for your child, ask to speak to other parents that are receiving those services, other parents at that school. Not just one parent, because oftentimes they'll point you to the direction of someone who, you know, uh, has had a really great experience. You want to try to talk to as many families that you can that have been interacting with people receiving those services. And you're going to ask them, do you feel your concerns are heard, okay? It's not that you're just dropping your child off at that school, but if you have a concern about something going on or um, the different goals for your child, that those teachers and those school professionals or speech therapists are listening to you and incorporating your concerns into the goals. Like I said, are, your concerns, are their concerns incorporated into the goals and targets? Also, are they assisting with helpful suggestions for home that consider the family dynamics and culture? What's happening at school should also be able to be um, incorporated into the home environment, and it should be addressed from the, um, the side of what works for your family. For example, I have a, an ABA center in Ghana, and we have some children where they primarily speak Fanti in the home. That's one of the languages. Now, we're not going to just be teaching just in English, right? We're going to teach the child in the language that they're using in the home environment so that they can be better incorporated and everyone on the same page and that child can make progress. If we're just teaching in English, but everyone at home and in that child's life is speaking a different language, do you think they're going to make much progress? No. So it's really important that you're all working together. You're, you're going to ask those other parents who are receiving these services, are their feedback welcome and responded to? Now, I get it. As a, as a leader of a school or an organization, you have a lot on your plate, and it's hard to listen to everything from every single parent, but there's, uh, you want to do your best to be able to listen and hear the concerns of families and welcome feedback. Um, not just the good feedback, the constructive feedback as well. And, sorry, one, go back. The last point. Now, we talked a lot yesterday about multidisciplinary teams. So if you're working with a speech therapist, you want to know, do they collaborate with others that are working with the child? Does the speech therapist attend the meeting at the school with the SEND teachers for helping create the individualized education plan? Does the occupational therapist coordinate goals with the behavior analyst? Um, the, the doctor, the dentist who was just up here, he was talking about behavior analysis, right? If you have dental concerns, are we working with that dentist to help break down the steps of how he's going to do things in his dental practice, and we're practicing those skills ahead of time. It's all about collaboration of care, and we talked a lot about that yesterday. So I, I added some tables in here from this um, uh, research article that I mentioned, but I won't break it down too much. You can look it up. It's a little hard to see. But let's go ahead and jump ahead to the one more. Skills to teach, okay? So this is what I want those teachers, those school professionals out there, speech therapists, these are the different skills that I want you to look at. Now, that research article, they broke down some different um, important skills that practitioners need to develop to have and use compassionate care. 
Because as we saw in the medical field, if you're able to empathize and use compassion with your clients, you're more likely to have better outcomes. The same as with education and other types of um, uh, uh, therapies, speech, ABA, and such. There's a lot listed here, and I'll go through just a couple. Um, these are different skills to teach for positive social interaction. Um, one thing I want to note is about making positive comments about the child's behavior or making positive comments about the parent's behavior. The, the person who, uh, you're, say you're working with a child, you don't want to just focus on the negative, right? You really want to also be focusing on the positive of the child, what the child can do. If you're seeing the parent do something great, you want to give them that reinforcement and encouragement. Hey, when I started working with you, this was something that was really hard for you, and now I see that you're practicing brushing his teeth, and it's not easy, but I see you're trying, and that is awesome, right? So you're not focusing always on the negative. Um, this uh, other skills to teach, um, for example, let's see another one. Um, I just did this. Demonstrate general enthusiasm about the direction of the child's program. It's individualized to the child. They're making steps. Not everyone goes from here to here. Every child is different. So we want to celebrate those little wins and point those out to the parents. Sometimes parents can, there's a lot on their plate and it's hard for them to see the little wins. So remind them about those. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> can move, okay. So these are some skills to demonstrate empathy. Now, this, um, these were pulled from that research article. The article also detailed these out a lot more and described some different curriculum and steps that you can take to teach your staff these skills. So if you're a, a school um, owner or you own a speech clinic, I recommend you look for that research article. You can also email me as well for it. Some different skills. Sorry, go back. The empathy one. So different skills. So you're also acknowledging and naming the, the parents' feelings. It's not that you're just hearing them say what they're upset about. You're saying, wow, I can see that that must be really frustrating for you. You know, you're demonstrating that empathy for them. Another example, you're, um, you're op asking open-ended questions. Right? You're, you're not just asking a, a quick little question and getting a yes or no and ticking your box. You're really asking those open-ended questions to listen well to the, um, the parents. Next slide. Now, to demonstrate compassion, remember the difference between empathy and compassion is the action, is the steps that you're going to be taking to support that family. We don't want to just skip over the empathy and go straight to like action where you're trying to fix the problem. It's not about fixing the problem, it's about hearing the whole picture, seeing the whole picture, empathizing with the family, and finding the best steps to support them in making positive steps toward the direction of where they want their child to be. Okay, so some of these are, um, you're offering actions to take, uh, actions to take to alleviate the parent's distress. Um, you're giving supportive comments, you're confirming their emotional response in a non-judgmental way. Families have a lot of judgment from society, and we've been talking about breaking down stigma a lot today. You don't need to add to that stigma and that judgment, right? You need to be there, you need to listen and, um, and support. And the last slide is about um, demonstrating collaboration. This last point identifies and adjusts treatment goals based on the family's culture, religion, and lifestyle. If I'm working on a goal that doesn't, doesn't really translate well to the environment the child is in, I'm wasting that child's time. Wasting the child's time is more harmful than doing nothing. So you have to take the, um, take the big picture of things and what actually works for the family. You're also going to ask them if the treatment recommendation is acceptable. Joy mentioned yesterday when we're doing an assessment for a family, we don't just do the assessment, list the goals, and say, okay, let's go. 
We have a meeting. We go through everything. We see, do we, did we cover all of your concerns, right? And do these different approaches work for your family? If they do, then great, let's move forward and let's get started. If they don't, let's make some adjustments. I want to make sure that your main concerns are being addressed. Um, and finally, skills that you can work on, but it's very important to keep ethical considerations with everything we do, right? So we want to lead with compassion, but it's also important to maintain boundaries. The reason why we do this is if you become super, super close with the, with the family or if you're a family, you become very close with the speech therapist, maybe you can't give them the feedback that you need to give them because you're worried about of offending them, right? They're so close to you. They're coming to your child's birthday party. They're hanging out with you all the time for dinner. And you're not really happy with the direction of how things are going. And if you've gotten so close, you may not be able to voice your concerns. On the alternative side, if you're an educator and you're so, so close with the family, it could be that there's some um, things that the parent lane, you have to put on your mask before you can put on the mask for the child or the person next to you. You have to extend compassion to the child or the person next to you. You have to extend compassion to yourself and be able to look out for your best well-being to be able to do best for others. If you're a school owner and your team is overloaded and the special educator has 100 kids on their case and they need to see all those kids in a two-week time period, do you think they're going to be able to lead with compassion when they're working with families? No. You can't burn out. And it's really easy to take on a lot when you're in this field, right? We're all compassionate people. We all want what's best for our children and the children we're working with. But if we also don't look out for ourselves and take care of ourselves and our colleagues and our employees, they can't do their best for families. So I have some, um, these are just some references. Um, if you go to the next slide, it has my email address. Whitney at autismcompassionafrica.org. So if you'd like a copy of this, um, of this uh, article that has more detail about how to learn these skills, I'm happy to share that with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Whitney. I believe you're going to take questions. Um, a number of people have asked uh, about whether the presentations will be available. I've just been told that um, it will be made available on the website okay. after the conference. So I think we can put our hands together for that. All the presentations, and that's www.gtcoplc.com forward slash autism2022. All right. Um, a few questions have come in online and from uh, some members of the audience. Um, some are not directly, um, you know, like referring to your presentation, but I believe you can address them. And if there are any other experts um, who want to um, throw in uh, something, they can do that as well. So a question here is, I have a son of four years with mild Down syndrome. He has a behavioral pattern that when he poos, he immediately puts his hand in it. Some says it's a form of discomfort and he still uses diapers. How can I make him stop doing that? I, I didn't hear the first, you said a four-year-old child with Down syndrome. And Mild then, Down syndrome, behavioral pattern that when he poos, uh -huh. he immediately puts his hand in it. Okay, gotcha. So this goes along with the same piece that Lon Ray was mentioning. When we see different behavioral concerns related to toileting, such as smearing, we need to do a functional analysis to see why that behavior is occurring. Maybe one child is doing it because he likes the feeling of it on his hands. Maybe another child is doing it because when he does, you come running and you give him a big reaction like, no, 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 stop. And he's getting a lot of attention when he wasn't getting attention before. There's different reasons why behavior occurs. It's always important we first find out why that behavior is occurring and then develop interventions for it. For example, if we have a child that likes smearing because he likes the feel of it on his fingers, can we give him opportunities to play with something that gives him the same sensation? So if he's getting 
the opportunity to have that same sensation across the day, he may not need to do the smearing because he already has that. He has that feeling. For example, if I like chocolate cake and I'm getting small pieces across the day, I'm not going to go running and try to uh, eat that chocolate cake later when I see it, right? If we're getting small, small pieces across the day. But it's very important that we're addressing things from the function of why the behavior is happening. That would be attention, escape from something they don't like, access to something they do like. It could be a person, a location, an a, a activity, an item, or um, uh, attention, I think was the one I, didn't, I left out, right? Yeah. Sensory, I'm sorry, and sensory. Yes, so we say everybody eats, E-A-T-S, escape, attention, tangible, sensory, okay? So that's where behaviors come from. And you gotta look at it specific to the child. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Mwidi Mbakari, this one is for you. Um, you talked about giving out the questionnaire to identify a potential case of autism. Um, we, and the person is asking if we're likely to get it, that you made a promise. So how, how can people get their hands on that questionnaire? Is it just for um, experts, for doctors to handle? Uh, people will get the questionnaire when it's finally uh, validated and reliability well tested. And we are sure it's actually working for the purpose we design it. I, it's, it will be available. Currently, we are using it for this conference. We use it for the consultation for this conference, and it's part of the testing. Okay. All right, so the questionnaire is being used um, for the consultation, the one-on-one -on -one consultation at this conference. It's still undergoing testing. We're still refining it, and at the point where all of that testing is done, it will then be made available uh, to caregivers and, and um, other practitioners. All right, we have some other very basic um, um, questions. Um, we have someone saying, is autism hereditary? I think that has been addressed several times at this conference. Um, do parents um, who have autism before death connect to child? Sorry, okay, I, don't, I didn't quite get this one. But final one, does all children with autism, do all children with autism have ADHD? Okay. So I am not a medical professional, so I think I would like to defer this to um, Dr. Bakari to comment on that. Lonre, can you pass in the mic? It's always best to know our, our scope of practice, right? And if I'm not a medical professional, medical things should be given to a doctor to address. Not all children with autism have ADHD. But the percentage of them between 20 and 25 percent in our environment are comorbid ADHD. So if, if you heard him right, he's saying about 25 percent of children with autism also have ADHD. Okay, okay. Okay, we have a gentleman with a question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to the doctor, and I don't know which of the doctors will answer this, would you recommend a child with autism to play any sport? I can address that. So he asked, would we recommend a child with autism playing a sport? And if you were here yesterday, Mandy, Amanda Budge, um, gave a talk about different pieces related to inclusion, but it was very also pointed out in her talk that you need to follow the lead of the child. The parent your job as a parent is not to force your child one way or another. John Paul has done amazing with music. That doesn't mean every child with autism will flourish and do well with music. Pay attention to what your child does, notice what they like, and see if you can steer them in that direction. Um, Mr. Okeke? Okay, okay, I tried. I'll get it. Um, he mentioned yesterday that, um, oh, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, for his son, he likes the painting, right? But it's not just about forcing him. And he had to try, you had to try different, different things, right? You tried music, you tried basketball for the sports question. He tried basketball. His son didn't like it, and he said it was a waste of his time and money. 
but it's good to expose your children to lots of different activities and see. We don't know. We don't know that um, he didn't know his child would you know, do so well with painting and be showing his paintings around the world. It's about, um, they, they saw him scribbling. He went to an uh, art teacher. The art teacher said, wow, your child has something. You should continue with this and see where it goes and look where he is now. And yeah. so it's about giving opportunities and seeing where your child goes and what Mandy said, paying attention. Yeah, so that was a key point yesterday. You need to pay attention to the particular child. Interact with them. What does that child like? If they don't have any interest in sports, then maybe that's a waste of time. So you need to, you know, figure out what the child likes. Sorry, it may also be harmful to force children to do something they don't like. Maybe in, in a particular place like a basketball court, it could be very sensory overload for the child, the sounds, right? So it's not about forcing a child to be somewhere, but seeing exposing them and if they're tell they'll tell you if they like it or not right yeah again i think another thing that has been a recurring decimal is every autistic child is that autistic child right so every case is unique and you know you need to you know make it very custom made approach or interventions all right this question says um, i just got it right now does the parents age does the age of a parent before birth um does that affect you know is, is that a ca causal factor for autism then I'm also going to defer to um, the doc here. Or All right, so and it's a possible cause. Um, so it's not like it's definite. Um, usually, the figures we look at for males 40 and above, then females, once you are towards the tail end of the very productive age. So the most um, viable period is 25 to 35. So once you are towards... 35 and above going towards 40, they are possible. It's not that they're definite. Thank you. All right, so there are a lot of questions, but I'm just going to rush through. Um, someone says, for a child that does not have autism, but is super hyperactive, lacks concentration, how do we manage that? Or what kind of intervention do we need to apply on such a child? So, so not that... been diagnosed with autism yet, but is super hyperactive. Yeah, so uh, as we mentioned earlier, looking at first getting a diagnosis, having the psychiatrist also prescribe which type of people you should be engaging, whether that be... you to curate them as the conference goes on and hopefully uh, in between other sessions uh, we would have time to address the questions. We're moving swiftly to our last presentation just before lunch ladies and gentlemen, and that is by Remy Olutimai, who is our celebrity voice actor. Can we put our hands together for him? Remy will be looking at the topic, Becoming a Voiceover Artist, How I Channeled My Autistic Strengths into a Career. One more time, please put your hands together for Mr. Remy Olutimai. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so th there, are, there are a few things that I would like to um, uh, clarify. Um, there are many voice actors in Nigeria. There are many voice actors in West Africa. I'm the only voice director amongst all of them. Um, that's one. Uh, two, um, what I'm going to share here is not medical advice. This is like literally, I didn't, I happened to it as it happens to me. All right? So any illusions about, you know, control of destiny, you know, exposure, I, mm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to fake it. All right? Um, the thing I can say most confidently is that um, it was immersion. It was immersion. Now, uh, I want you to imagine with me if you can. Um, I was born in 1978. At uh, that time, Obasanjo was, okay, no, Dermot, yeah, so. 
Uh, that's for people who are aware of Nigeria's history. Um, the things that would keep me um, occupied also included television. Now, if you were born in that era, if you were born in the era of the 80s, if you grew up in the era of the 80s, you knew that television did not start until 4 p.m. And then you would have two hours. No, no, sorry. You start at, it started at 4 p.m., then you exchanged to 3 p.m. for that one hour of instructional television, television where they would record the lessons in uh, King's College Laboratories. They then put it on NTA. And I remember quite a lot for somebody that young girl. Yeah, so put on NTA. Then after that, they will show the cartoons. Then at 6 to 6.30, they will show Tales by Moonlight or one of those Nigerian struggle, struggle shows, you know. But the thing is that um, it was not until I was in my second year in mass communication that I realized that I was not consuming the media. I was studying it. They, 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 I went through iterations. I wasn't aware of it. This was a personal interest. If you ask my sister right now, of the kids growing up, who grew up with me right now, they'll say, I oh, know, yeah, Remy like to do voices, you know, stuff like that. They didn't understand. Even at that time, I was going through iterations. You see, the thing is, I've had to develop this warm effect. I had no idea that I spoke flatly until a friend of mine, George Mbagwa, he, he, he noticed I was, um, I was 18 at the time, and he said, you know, you have a very good voice. You have a very deep voice. I said, yeah. He said, but you're flat. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean I'm flat? You're flat, but I'm speaking, yeah. You see, for the kind of work that I do, advertising, you need to have, but I didn't know what advertising was. I didn't know what voice acting was. So I thought, you know, that's just his opinion. Fast forward to 2002. I get a job as an intern in an advertising agency called SONU. There, I work under a copywriter, a creative director called, uh, his name is um, Ayo Elias, and he put me under a fantastic copywriter called um, Anthony Echo. These names are very important, and these steps are very important. Please, just keep up with me. You see, it was with these guys that I understood where the stories were coming from. You would imagine that, you know, with voiceover, you know, you're, you know just give the person a script, the person gets up and just, you know, just do it. Yeah, that's if you want to stay average. If you want to move to the top of the game, you need to understand where the stories are coming from and then you can appreciate where they are supposed to go to and who is supposed to listen. That is who you are actually performing for. Not the producer in the studio, not that, that's who you are producing, but that's, you have to be aware of that. And I went through iterations of storytelling. Then I became a producer. And then I started to understand, you know in the movies where the producer kind of loses their temper at the performer. No, 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 you're not getting it right. I experienced that. And then I moved over to being a voiceover. And then I experienced that rage from the producers. And it tweaked. We had different languages. The language of the person who's writing the script is different from the language of the producer. It's different from the language of the voice, voiceover. Typically, if people, people in voiceover work, if you meet any of them, just this is a joke in the, in the industry, regardless of what country or what language. Can you make it faster but slower? Somebody, somebody here has experienced that. The thing is that um, for me, I experience intersectionality. Sometimes I sometimes that road and just keep going, but I experience intersectionality. It is um, it's a blessing. 
sometimes hard to communicate, but it's a blessing. It was in that intersectionality that I started to understand a few things. Like, for example, um, right now, I run a community on, online called Voice Acting Africa. I have about 102 people on it from different parts of just teach, letting them understand what is really involved when it comes to voice acting. You would hear my voice and you would think, ah, you know what, I need to have a voice like this before I can. No, the, is there truth in your voice? It's got nothing to do with the timbre or the, no, is there, is there truth in your voice? And the truth in the voice generally just means, are you comfortable with what you are saying? Do you bring believability to it? But it is something I had to teach myself first. The good thing for me is that in immersion, as I was a producer slash voiceover at the time, I will do the work, I will then stay back, and I would feel like my parents were wondering what I was doing. Work finished at 5 p.m., I would leave the studio at 7.38, because I'm playing it back and I'm listening. What, what, did, I, what did I miss? What, what, what tone did I miss? What did, what did I drag a bit too long? Now, I spent so much time doing that, that um, is there anybody here familiar with waveforms for audio recording? All right. So you know what an S looks like? Yeah. So you know the S, the Ks, the Ts. At a glance, I can tell. I may not know exactly what the sentence is, but I can tell what is wrong. Like, and I just edited. But anyway, sure, that's pretty just showing sure enough in my own private way. Um, this is where I'm going to segue into the reason why we are here. We're not here for me. We're not here for the experts. We're here for the warriors amongst us, those who are here and those who can't be. Um, in my case, Tolo Ajayi was responsible for my safe immersion. Contrary to what you might think, advertising is a very, very rough field. Oh, it's rough. And he shielded me. And I have no idea why, but I'm always eternally grateful to him. As an eternally grateful to him. You know, when the rough stuff was coming or some sort of backlash, oh, why didn't you blah, 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 he just stepped in the way and calmly explained to me what I did wrong. And I was like, oh, okay. And I'd fix it. But I had no idea that was what was happening. In my 20s, all the way into my 30s, I just assumed that is how people are supposed to talk to each other. Imagine my shock when I went into banking and found out, yeah, no. Um, whatever kind of immersion you can arrange for them, safe immersion. It is already clear what they are interested in. It's clear. You know, kind of like if you're learning scuba diving, you need to have somebody along with you who's going to be watching and monitoring you, making sure that you're, I've never scuba dived before, I've just read the books, you know, making sure that your oxygen is at the right rate, all those sort of things. Just have that person there who's just looking out for them and um, answering the right questions. And... Um, you know, amazing things will happen. As in, I've, I, I've, I've opened doors that people never bothered about because things occurred to me that nobody was interested in. Audiobooks, who does audiobooks in Nigeria? Um, animation, how? Um, E-learning, when? All, all this is, and what I'm talking about is not 10 years ago, it's like from like 20, 2008. But I saw these things, and I, when, when the time came, I landed prepared. I landed prepared. So um, I'm going to stop here and uh, invite questions. But if you're going to take anything from this talk, 
please just understand safe immersion. If you can recognize what they are interested in, go for it. But have somebody there who can answer their questions, who can interpret for them. Um, funny joke, not really a joke. Uh, About a month ago, I had a run-in with somebody from the government accusing me of um, Nepa bypass, let me put it that way, which is something that I, I, have a, I have a distinct need not to have anything involved with that sort of thing. And he kept on saying, eh, so you know what you're going to do now? I said, no, explain it to me. Ah, no, but you know what you're supposed to do now? So yeah, so tell me, what am I supposed to do? And we went on and on for like 10 minutes until my neighbor came in. As in literally, we were in that loop for like 10 minutes. Until my neighbor came in and broke the loop, and as we say here, he spoke street to the guy. And he got to the point. And I was like, why didn't he just get to the point? He said, it's the way you are talking. It, was, um, it seemed like you were going to put him in trouble. <sighs> say laughing. So, um, yeah, any questions? Any questions at all? I intentionally, yes, sir. Can we put our hands together for Mr. Remy Olitimai? I think you will pardon my ignorance. No, 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 please, no, no. Uh, will you explain in simple terms what voice acting actually entails? All right. Um, Yes, yes, yes. I would, I would love to. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to explain it in three basic steps. All right. Um, the first step is to explain what the voiceover is. You know how in the, how in the war, World War II movies, where the hair, where, or even right now in the action movies, Rover Rover, so so so. You could read me? Yes, music over. That's speaking over the radio. That's a voice over. Voice acting, however, is um, I'll ask you I'll ask you two questions and that will give you the door into voice acting. All right. Um, do you have older siblings? Do you have younger siblings? All right. Do you have um, an older uncle? All right. The way you would speak, the way you would ask for water from your older uncle, is it the way you would ask for water from your younger sibling? Culturally, no. That is voice acting. Right there. That is voice acting. No, I'm serious. See, the thing is, when it comes to voice acting, it's not so much about them giving you the script. You have a part to play. There's a story happening. And when you read the script, what's happening is that you are not reading, you're not repeating the words that are given to you. You are responding to someone else. Um, either somebody else who, is, who has spoken before you or who's going to speak afterwards. But essentially, there's an exchange going on. And we all know, for those of us who are above the age of 10 or 12, we all know what it's like to enter a room where they are just talking about you. Because what they are saying, the exchange does, does not make sense. It's like, hey, so did this, eh, uh, yes, so. And you're like, why are they sounding fake? And it's because they are doing very bad voice acting. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Remy. Hi. Thank you for sharing. My pleasure. I, I would like you to, um, if you could, share a little more about your journey to discovering that you are autistic. If you could share about that a little more. Okay, sure. No Thank problem. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, it didn't quite bother me for like the longest time. You know, I just understood that, look, there are some friends I wasn't going to keep. 
there were some relationships I was not going to have. I just, you know, kind of like a soldier, I just like zeroed it out. Then I made friends with a psychiatrist. All right. And um, we've known each other eight years now. And I noticed that the way he, he, there was more respect with him. And um, it was about four years ago. You know, generally when, children of the 70s and 80s in Nigeria, if you, like the cultural examples he was talking about, the cultural differences. If you showed a cultural weakness, you were removed. They just hid you somewhere. And those were the people that I felt coolest with. As in, we didn't, there was no long talk. We just, we just be ourselves. And the next time, he's not there anymore. Wow. And this happened almost consistently till I was like, um, it was primary two that it clicked what was happening. So I started to study people, started to study the kids around me. I started to try to imitate them. I was considered it to be safe behavior. I didn't know whether it made sense or not, but I just... It was almost, I had to develop this counterintuitive way of relating with people. It didn't seem right to me, but it seemed to be what everybody understood. So I do it. So I do it. Um, then, you know how people jump on the wagon train? Oh, yeah, you know, maybe it's OCD. Okay, yeah, then, you know, maybe it's ADHD. And, um, yeah, I kind of jumped up with those wagons. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 let's do this. And it will stop making sense after a point. It's like, okay. Went on the ADHD because, yeah, the ADHD, it's, it's, got, it's got to make sense. I mean, how so many details in my head, you know. And I kept jumping on that wagon until it stopped making sense. So I reached out to my friend. And I was like, dude, what do you think it is? I think you've known me the longest. You've seen, you've watched me the longest. And it was like, uh, bruh, if, um, if you ask me, it's, um, it's Asperger's, man. I was like, oh, okay, I thought it was normal back there. Okay, all right, cool. Because I could not explain... There was nobody to talk to them, put it that way. As a kid, no one's going to help you. You just hide in plain sight and try to keep yourself safe. Don't get taken to the village like the other kids or wherever it is that they ended up. Don't um, hide your obsessions. I had to hide my obsessions in plain sight. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much further I can actually... Is this... Is this we, we, we're diving. So I'm going to have a panel. I'm going to moderate a panel with Remy and Jean-Paul. I think we need to celebrate that, all right? That will be the last panel today. So those of you who eat our lunch and run away, you better don't do that. We will lock the door after lunch because we're going to dive in. We're going to dive in and, you know, and I mean, just see, he's 44 years old. He's been living with autism. He's successful. Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. Um, so I'm going to come to you, Mr. Tagbo, but I thought there, there are a number of questions that are coming. And please, you guys, ad address all your venom, all your anger at me, all right? Because there are just so many questions. We cannot really dive into all of them. But I'm going to draw your attention to page, um, the page on the program that has a directory. Because some of you are asking for contacts for some of our specialists and all of that, if you go to page 23 and 24 of your program, there's actually an autism directory that has contact details 
of a lot of um, resource people, all right? So special schools, um, intervention services, uh, psychiatry services, dentistry services, that is our, that is our resource uh, 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 book right there. So please, if you need to reach out to anyone, please do that. We're going to um, have our occupational therapist just give us his contact because someone asked for that. So if you need an occupational therapist, uh, please just get his contact. Oh, my email is um, akinyelurebimbo at gmail.com. Akinyelurebimbo at, at gmail.com, right? Uh, I practice at the orthopedic hospital in Bobby, occupational therapy department. Uh, you know, uh, maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps you can write it down, then you yeah, can put it up on the screen. Yeah. All right, so we'll get that as well. Um, so thank you. Let's put us together for Remy one more time as he come up, comes off the stage. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you... Okay, sorry. Mr. Tagbo wants to quickly... Mr. Tagbo, you have just one minute. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for sharing, you know, your brave story. Thank you, sir. Um, one, my question is, when you were growing up, did you have this um, attachment to... The TV screen, the computer screen, a lot of parents here who have kids on the spectrum say that their kids are always with the iPad, always playing with the iPad, always playing games, um, and a lot of them are looking for answers. Now, were you always on the TV screen, always focused, um, fascinated about the TV or the computer? That might, if you, if you were, that might also... Um, give them hope. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but growing up, my best friend was a Sony Triton color television. Yes, at the age of eight, I knew how to lift it with my body. When my dad said, enough TV, I'd lift it and take it to my room. It was larger than me. But, I understand, but the, thing, the thing is this. I knew how it worked. If I interacted with it the way that you're supposed to, it would give me exactly what I wanted. There were no surprises. The pattern was very clear to me. Stereo systems together that way, unguided, because I figured out how to record myself um, with the Sanyo uh, cassette recorder. How many of you are here have seen cassettes before, sir? Talk us of cassette before. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing is, the thing is that I can't, I can't speak, I can't speak for other kids, but for me, there is something that is soothing about knowing that if I do this, this is going to happen, and then from this I can do this, and this thing carry, this carries all the way into my voice directing. Yeah, as in like literally everybody who I've heard speak right over the last um, hour, I've been casting them in my head. No, I'm serious. The thing is that uh, people think that you need to have some really fancy voice. No, look, your sound of truth is your sound of truth. It doesn't, the microphone will not lie. The microphone will not lie. So when... That's, the human voice is now my instrument of choice. As in, I, I get it. I get it. I know how to bring the best out of you. You know, I get it. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Make that round of applause louder as he comes off the stage. We have, we have about four odd minutes to, to spare, so I'm quickly going to dive into some of the questions and then have our experts respond. Someone is saying, we've heard a lot about sensory overload, sensory overload. What is sensory overload? Um, Camille, do you want to attend to that or pass it on to someone quickly? And then, um, what do you do uh, to parents who are not cooperating with the school um, when, when there's some intervention that is about to be done? Sensory overload. Yeah. Um, sensory overload. We have uh, what we call um, sensory modulation disorders. So, we have what we call over-responsive. We have um, under-responsive, and we have craving. 
When I'm talking about um, over-responsive, you will see the child, we call it on the toe, on the goal. It's everywhere, bouncing, the attention is not there. And uh, when, I th when I'm talking about under-responsive, the child looks, sometimes looks passive. Sometimes they're in their own world. They, you know, they, they just keep to themselves. Even when they bump to Thompson, they don't really feel pain. And craving, you see them touching their hand. You know that you know, they try to touch things, they fixate objects. You know, sometimes you may think they are hyperactive. You know, sometimes you may think they have HDHG when they're actually seeking for sensation. And how do we manage this? I think I will discuss it yesterday. We have what we call sensory diet. So and, um, every school, even every house that have a child with all the other um, sensory issues should have what we call a sensory room. So we use sensory diet. Sensory diet is not food. There are a series of physical activities that we use that make the child calm down. It makes them regulate. So when they regulate, you know, they, they calm down and they can learn for a while. Thank you. All right, so there's still a lot of questions here. I have people raising their hands, but it's time for lunch. Should we eat into lunch time, or should we just go for lunch now? You, you people that will decide, though. You people that will decide now. You eat your food, fast food. Should we proceed, or should we go for lunch? Which one? Make it a democracy. Proceed. Put your hands together for yourselves. Uh -huh. In fact, we are going to fast. Please, you people can take the lunch home. We are going to fast for lunch. All right, Shalakwe, you want to quickly add something? I want to quickly add something, and it's directed at you, Mr. Mapimbola. Um, so I have two bedroom. You say I should create sensory room. How is that possible? Or, I mean, please expand shades. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we consider um, financial constraints sometimes and the space you have. You just have to make it of whatever you have. Even though you send a room, apartment, you can still manage that room. But what I don't want is distraction during therapy. No distraction during therapy. So that is that you can use a room, but everybody in the house needs to understand that the therapy is going on. So everybody has to excuse. Not that they are doing therapy, somebody is going in, coming, you know, so we don't want distraction. Thank you. Okay. And just to add to that, it's not just about the sensory integration things. It's about how can you teach your child coping skills so that they can calm themselves down and they, in any environment, say you're at the grocery store, you don't have a sensory room at the grocery store. What are the skills that the child can develop to be able to calm themselves down and keep themselves safe? Thank you. All right. Um, a quick, you want to add something, Camille? Um, yes. So when my son was two, three years old, I would take him to the grocery store and he would just have a fit. I didn't understand why. It wasn't until I realized I needed to chart. Yes, chart. Remember yesterday I told you, you needed to be a data collector. You need, as a parent, you need to be collecting data on your children. When does he or she do this? When does he or she do that? so that you recognize the triggers. For my son, it was the fluorescent lights in the grocery store. It was the background noise. So we had to get him ear defenders to lessen the noise. Eventually, we weaned him off of the ear defenders because he had to, you know, function without headphones on all the time. But you need to find out what triggers your child because you are your child's best advocate. So you need to be able to speak to your teachers, your therapists. You need to be able to articulate your child's needs. And you cannot do that if you're not taking note of what their issues are. All right. Now, there's this... Uh Forgive us, forgive us for that. There's this 28-year-old autistic child who has been locked up in the house since childhood. To, to begin care now, where do we start? What professional should we see first? Someone said the police. To get the people arrested, the people that locked this child up for 28... That's the first institution to contact. Okay, you want to respond? 
I don't want to respond to the whole thing, but I want to also talk about how some families are doing the best that they can with the knowledge that they have. So it's about empowering families and breaking down stigmas in the community and with families so they can get the support they need. But let me let someone else address where the first step should be for that family. So who wants to go? The first step. So thank you very much once again. So the first step is to get a diagnosis and a proper assessment. You need to know what the problem is. So just simple. Okay. Is it louder now? All right. So I said the first step is to get a diagnosis and a proper assessment. So it's proper that you just go to a view. So if you're in Lagos, you have a couple of them. You know, psychiatric hospital, um, Yaba, the children's session in Zoshodi. The other private facilities also are available, so depends on your pocket, because everything is out of pocket cost. So whichever you can to Abel Kuta, the Aru, the name Aru is actually the community where the hospital is sited, and you know the name, what we call it. So, but that's where I work. So thank you very much. All right. Um, this other question says, again, it, it has been addressed in many ways, but I'm just going to read it out the way it is so that uh, we can give it one final address. And any other question that comes in that relates to this, I'll just chuck it aside. All right. If autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder and it develops in the womb, I want to know if it is hereditary. So we want to answer this question once and for all for the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th annual autism conference. Can autism be passed on from mother to the unborn child? And is there a way to prevent autism in an expectant mother? As per what should she eat, what lifestyle should she be jogging on Lekki Koi Bridge? Should she eat only cabbage? All those things. Will it affect the child? Who's going to answer this? Doctor, is like, we should just put the mic in front of you. Okay. All right. Okay, so just like we explained there's a genetic component to the disorder. So we all know we pass the gene, our genes to our children. So like any other mental health disorder, it doesn't mean if you have, your children will have. So it can skip generation. So I don't want to bore you with what genetics is in terms of, let me not bore you with it. So essentially, it's not a death sentence that, okay, I've had all my children we have, okay? So, for example, all of us have a dose of it. Let me put it that way. So, as you marry, um, the dose increases to your children, and then it might not manifest till the cup is full. I'm trying to be as simple as possible. So, so for example, if Paul doesn't mind, I mean, Paul had the disorder he didn't even know. He has children that have, and he has children that don't have. So it's not a death sentence. So it can skip four generations and then appear at the fifth. So um, there's no family that it cannot happen to. I'm not trying to lay a course and then we say, not my, not my portion. Okay, so essentially it's not a death sentence. There's help, and then it's quite important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we put together for a doctor? A number of questions are coming from our online audience. Just to let you know that we're seeing all your questions. A lot of them are already been addressed. I have a question about how we can get the slides. We addressed that already. There will be, the slides will be made available on the website after the conference. Can I get a list of recommended special needs professionals? We addressed that already. You can download the uh, brochure from the website as well. One more time. The website is also on the program. gtcoplc.com forward slash autism. 2022. You can download the entire brochure. You, on page 23 and 24, we have a directory that has a list. Um, how do I help a child who is hyperactive settle down? That has been addressed. Um, um, I, um, I notice you are married. Were there issues hanging around relationships for you? Finding a wife, her family's acceptance, a reaction as an adult living uh, with autism. And I think we can extend that question to John Paul as well. A lot of you are saying yes, yes. You want to know the answer to that? Uh, not to like love. 
All right, so uh, quick note. I got married at the age of 40. So yeah, the yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the earliest, the earliest memory of giving my potential date's mother the heebie-jeebies was, uh, was when I was eight, 17. And that heebie-jeebies feel, it, it, it never stopped. As in, in 17, mom just didn't like me. Then when they were moving, that's when the mom actually opened up and started talking to me for the first time like a person. And I was surprised. I was like, you never talked to me before. Why? Are you? Oh, it's because you're not going to see me again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it continued to when I was 24. It, um, it, got, me, it got me to a very, uh, should we say, it got me to a space where I pretty much just... I desired a relationship, but I wasn't going to hurt myself trying to get one. And um, the one time I did try to bend, and I went counterintuitive really, really hard. And it punished me. You know, so I said, you know what, no more lies. I'm not going to lie to myself. If I don't really like something, I'm not going to do it. If, I don't, if it doesn't make sense, I'm going to say. You know? uh, my wife, thankfully, looked at me. I was like, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. And... Um, we have two boys now. You know, so um, does it work with, look, love will happen wherever it wants to happen. You just, you just love yourself first. Don't lie. Don't try and form. No, pick me. Pick me. No, no. Love yourself first. No, love yourself first. Love yourself first. No one's going to do it as well as you can for you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Fantastic. John Paul, do you want to do you want to add some perspective to that? I think for me, um, I never really had a problem speaking with females. In fact, I found it easier to speak with girls than I did with boys. Um, <laughs> over the past 25 years, I've been involved in two um, long term relationships, one being for uh, 16 years where I had three children and one being for nine years where I had two further children. Um, again, I think, um, whoa, 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 I'm single at the moment. I'm not in a relationship at the moment. <laughs> but I'm enjoying my freedom being single. Um, I'm not currently dating or anything, but as I say, sometimes maybe it's the autism. I want that time for myself. I want to re-collaborate and, um, you know, just, just be able to clear my thoughts about what I want for the future, you know? So again, you know, getting in or out of relationships has not been the problem for me particularly. Um, but I do enjoy having my own space and my own time to, you know, collaborate my thoughts. So that's where I'll end it there. That's, that's a very interesting perspective to have. But thank you so much. All right, this question was raised yesterday. It's come back again today. How many special needs students will you recommend for an inclusive class? Who, who, who can help answer that? Amanda, do you want to give that a, a shot? Yeah. Well, hello everyone. There's no easy answer like everything in this field. Um, Multi Kids Inclusive Academy has 75% kids with needs and 25% kids who are neurotypical. And obviously that isn't the ideal balance because um, let's say Montessori education, which I'm also studying, recommends 15 to 25% special needs kids in a typical classroom. And that feels like a good idea. Um, but the issue I just want to refer to is that if you set out like I did to have an inclusive school, you've got to face the fact that many, many parents, even though their kids may need your services, do not want to send their kids to a school where they're special needs kids. So it's really hard to get the balance right. What I did was I opened up the option of places to my teachers. So to start with, all our teachers had free places in the school um, with their neurotypical kids. And it made such a difference because when parents came in and they saw that there were other neurotypical kids, they, 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 they said, yeah, okay, I really like the school. Um, I'm going to give it a go. 
and you may have kids with dyslexia or ADHD whose needs were a little bit different and they really benefited from our small classes and our therapy team and specialist teachers. So I would say there's no answer, but if you want to go inclusive, you've got to go inclusive. That's all. Things will change eventually. So that's, I think, what I've got to say. Thank you. All right, Amanda, I'm going, to, I'm going to hold you up for a minute. There are a few other questions that relate to this. Is it advisable for autistic children to be enrolled in normal school or preferably special school? So again, special versus normal. And um, in addition to that, um, as educators, what should we do when parents ignore observations by teachers about their children and refuse to take them for these um, assessments? Okay, so the first one, I was getting a bit worried this morning thinking about our references to inclusion yesterday. And I think most of us were thinking that inclusion is a situation where you've got a, a mainstream school and a few kids with special needs are added in. Maybe you could just show me your hands if that's been the, your experience of inclusion. If you've got children who are in a mainstream setting. Yes, yeah, so one person said, yeah, I'm sure there would be more. But um, the issue is, is there provision made for the child with special needs? Because it doesn't really matter if, if there's provision, like in, in multi-kids, for example, it's perfect place if you have an autistic child because you're going to get the services that you need. That's what we're geared up for. Similarly, if you've got a typical child, we also have a very differentiated curriculum for that child. And we're focused on creating a culture of inclusion, but many schools are not there yet. So I think um, if, the if the school, the special school, is providing the services that your child needs at that point, that is going to be a preferable um, solution than a mainstream school where the child's getting sensory overload. I think John Paul also referred to this in, uh, when he was speaking about his son. So it's about the school. Check the services check out the environment, and I think I can't, you couldn't recommend one over another. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yeah, we can put our hands together for her. All right, this question, even I'm, I'm dazed right now. Um, all right, how does a mom or wife get their spouse to be open to their child getting valuation? So if you're married and your, your spouse is not open to your child getting evaluation, what do you do? Especially if that spouse, husband, or wife does not believe in neurodivergency or any of this. So, like, with the way you're smiling, it's like you can answer this question. Okay, so. Very good. Um, I think the first step to that is if you yourself, as the mom, has come to terms with that diagnosis first. And um, if you haven't, you cannot force the diagnosis on another person because they, it's a different journey. They need to see you walking the road of acceptance. When you indeed have walked the road of acceptance, like, okay, this is what my son is dealing with. This is how I am going to help my son. When you start to show those actions, trust me, people around you will start to buy into it. So you need to stop doing the talk. You need to start to embody the acceptance you want your spouse to buy into. Does that make sense? Fantastic. So basically model the sort of behavior you want to see and then they'll catch on. Let's put our hands together for Shalakwe. Um, Mr. Tagba, I'd like your perspective on this as well. And in addition, I want you to address the question, how do you discipline a child with autism because some some people are saying hey a child still needs some sort of discipline you know spare the rod spoil the child do you just indulge their every whim um how, so how do you how do you do the balance and then that question okay let me i'll first start with um the question which um shall be answered yeah um i think it's also very important that you get the um you get the your partner you have to speak with your um, In my case, uh, I, I'd always use my example. Um, we got the, my wife was the one that um, 
got the diagnosis and um, called me, called me and let me know that, hey, you know, they said Kanye, Kanye Chuku has autism. And uh, the first question I asked was, what is autism? What is autism? And um, then she started explaining it to me. I think, if I can remember very well, I said, okay, he's going to get better, right? And then she said, no. Actually, the, the doctor who she spoke with said, listen, this is a lifetime thing. Get yourself ready. You're going to be looking after this child forever. And she said, no, you know, the us- we, we went spiritual I, I, over my dead body. I, uh, it's not my portion. But at that point, I said, if that's what the doctor said, then let's get ready. And that agreement had to first come between myself and my wife. And so I think it's very important that where you have a spouse who is not um, in agreement with you, you have to sit him or her down. You have to make them understand. I have heard, I mean, there are situations where spouses leave. Either the husband leaves, the husband abandons the child with the wife and leaves, or the wife abandons the child and leaves. Yeah, that happens. Um, Get yourself ready, just like Sherlock we said. You have to, you know, get yourself ready. But you must speak with this, your spouse and get your spouse to understand the condition. That is very important. Now, the second one is you spoke about discipline. I discipline Kanye Chuku almost, almost the same way I discipline the rest of my kids. Almost the same way. Why I say almost the same way is because I do understand that there are, for him... There are uh, parameters. There are, for him, there are certain lines that I know even he can't, I mean, he, he, can, he just can't cope. He just can't understand. But I do also know, because I watch my child a lot and I'm, and I'm very attentive. I watch him a lot and I'm very attentive and I know that there are some things he does. He's very aware of that thing he's doing. He knows that thing he's doing is actually wrong. And he will still go ahead and do it, believing I'm, I'm special in a way, and so nothing's going to happen. But I tell him, no way. Now, the way by which you will discipline your child varies. And I'm not here to tell anyone how to discipline the child, but like I said, what I do to my other kids is what I would do to him. Um, he has the, the time out. He has the um, things that are denied from him. And um, recently, what I did, what we did recently... Um, was usually Kanye has to go here and go there and go here because of his eyes, because of his art, and his brothers and his sisters stay usually at home. And so this time around, I said, you know what? Um, they were on break, and I said, the, your 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 brother, your brothers and your sisters will think when we say punishment, it means doing something negative. That's not it. It is something that weakens the behavior. So. Um, Spanking, some people, you can spank them all you want, and they are still doing what they're doing. So does that mean spanking works? Not all the time. Okay? So we have to understand consequences. If I slap Dr. Shomi, and he says, don't do that, and I slap him again, and he says, don't do that. His don't do that has no effect on my behavior. In fact, it's encouraging me to keep slapping him. So the don't do that, that he is saying, intending to uh, weaken my behavior, is actually reinforcing the behavior. So as parents, we need to understand consequences and the fact that those consequences can either be reinforcing or punishing. And what constitutes reinforcement? It depends on the child. To one child, if you yell at them, that's reinforcing. To another child, if you yell at him, that can be punishing. So you have to know who that child is. And when you make a rule, like uh, uh, Mr. OKK was saying, if you say, you're not going to travel with me, you must follow through. If you don't, A child with developmental disabilities may just write you off as unserious. So they will keep doing it. So you make a rule, you enforce it. And when you enforce it, make sure that your goal is achieved. 
if the child is still not doing well, so that thing you're trying to stop is continuing to happen, it means what you did is not working. So you have to keep looking at the behavior you're trying to address. If what you did slows it down or stops it, it means it's working. If that behavior continues to happen, it means whatever it is that you're doing is not working and you need to change course. Um, so whether it's punishment, I mean, whether it is spanking or not, um, abroad, we don't say spanking is bad. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, okay. Just checking. Is it? Spank, ah. you cannot use a weapon. Please, I should have invited my mother for this conference. <laughs> it might be too late, though, but yes. I... I... And really? what constitutes a weapon is you use your... your ah. Spanking is your hand. How many of you have been weaponized? Have you dealt... <laughs> oh, my God. My mother's shoe, belt, slippers. <laughs> In fact, that thing they used to turn Amala. <laughs> That's a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> what? Oh my God. Hey, sorry, so, Mr. Larry, continue. Ah. Yeah. So, you do wrong mm -hmm. as a three year old, four, five, I can hold your hand out and spank. Ah. <laughs> it's okay. You should better open your ear and listen now. <laughs> okay. But, guys, you see, the issue is whether that works. There are other strategies that work better than spanking. Jokes aside, jokes aside, yeah. And at the same time, correct the behavior. Did your parents ever do this thing to you when you're messing around and, you know, there are visitors around and they call you, they are smiling like, come, come. And then when you come close, mother will not pinch you. And she's just smiling like, don't cry, don't cry. Yes. I mean, has that happened to you before? <laughs> See, we, we need to have another conference to address. Where did Dr. Awe go? Dr. Awe, where? I had a question for you. Just before, just before you go, please. I'm so sorry. You can put us together for Dr. Awe. Sorry. Yeah, just one question. Um, how do you get a three-year-old with autism to brush her teeth without intense resistance? A three-year-old, so, yeah, with autism. So, that's tough. Um, usually what we do in my clinic, um, we do something called behavioral therapy where we have them, we have the parents in the room. Again, we do the tell, show, do. And so we try it on a doll first or a mannequin first. We see, let the um, kid play with that first, establish trust, and then we go ahead and try it on them. It doesn't always work, but... That's the best thing you can do. Because at that age, they're so young that you can't even do sedation on them or do anything on them. And so the best way to do it is use a mannequin and let them play with it first. If that works, then you can go ahead and try to brush the teeth. In the event that they're not able to do that, so this question says, how do you just even get their attention? You know, are there any tricks up your sleeve? Not really, to yeah. be honest with you, because a lot of times they refuse to do it. And so what we end up doing is just use a mouth rinse for them which is called chlorhexidine or paradex. And so that's what we use for them at that young age. All right. Yeah. Can, we, can we thank Dr. Adiawe for stopping by and for being such an excellent expert at this conference? All right, now I'm going to take a few more questions in the audience. Um, there's a gentleman who's been holding his hand up. He's going to attack me at some point if I don't bring the mic to him. I know you're not going to attack me, you're a gentleman. Please try and get, put your hands together for him. <laughs> Still before, but wow. giving me this opportunity. No, Uncle, you I have just 30 speak. seconds. Just... I will speak. Okay, I will good. Speak. Yeah, we have heard about uh, empathy and compassion in one of our lectures today. My question is that, and thank God our doctor from Aru talk about uh, those that have autism, you based on your pocket in anywhere you go. Uh, sometimes ago, there is a boy that we discovered that he needed speech, speech therapist, and then they have been to consult one person. He said, before he can do anything at all, we all need to pay to his account uh, before he can attend to the boy. 
I was irritated. Uh, since you talk about empathy and compassion, where is empathy? Uh, we are not pray for, no parent pray for that, for their children to uh, have autism, but when they come, it is come. This last question is that, since we don't have money, because all this thing is money, it's serious money, is there NGOs that can help us? All right. That's a very important question. All right, so you respond, and then I have Dr. Show me respond as well. Okay. So the piece that you mentioned, the speech therapist was going to see your child, but he wanted you to pay first before he would see the child. So my advice to you would be to ask to speak with some other parents who have worked with that speech therapist to get like Camille says, collect the data. Ask them, what are the goals he's been working on with your child? How long has he been working towards those goals? And is the child making progress? So you know you're not wasting your, your precious money, right? As you said, things are expensive and it's not easy. But from his side, being a practitioner myself, sometimes parents don't pay. So I understand too that sometimes you have to take your fee up front but you should be able to show the parents and demonstrate what they're going to be getting for the money they're going to be paying, and it should be very clear and outlined for you. Now, from the, the NGO side of things, there are a handful of different NGOs out there. There's not a lot related to uh, services and such, but for example, mine is called Autism Compassion Africa, and at our center, the program or the services are highly, highly, highly subsidized for the children there. So it's mostly one student to one teacher. 90% of it is covered. Now, we can't take a ton of kids. So there's a huge need. But what I want to empower parents to do, and when we were doing the consultations, this is what I tried to focus on, is there's so many free resources online, right? You want to learn more about behavior analysis, ABA therapy. You want to work with your child to teach them basic imitation skills. There's a lot of great free resources online on YouTube that you can learn some very small basics in how you can do these things at home with your child. If you're doing toilet training, you're struggling, there's free guides online um, by Dr. Mary Barbera. She's a behavior analyst and she has a lot of great resources and she has a free toileting guide out there and she's a mom of a child with autism. Them. So yes, we need a lot more services and support for families, but right now there's, there's not a lot out there, so parents can't wait. They have to empower themselves, go online and look for the support so that you can be the teacher for your child. The siblings and other family members can be working with your child as well to practice the skills they need to develop. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Can we give GTCO a round of applause? Um, I mean, yearly they provide free services, all the services that you need, um, and then some more that you don't know. So they are not advertised because of the Nigerian syndrome. So generally, when you come to the hospital, you'll be evaluated and then see if you actually need one. In my facility, we do that, but I mean, it's not something that we say, okay, once you get to our room, it is free. I mean, everybody will come, plus the person working in an oil industry. So everybody wants something free, you understand? So we've started by appreciating GTCO for providing consultation for the past 12 years. And people, I mean, essentially have had their needs met. Two, if you go to public institution, there are funds available. So we have philanthropists who have dedicated funds, and then our social workers evaluate you. But don't think if you just come, I do have money, that immediately somebody is going to bring out money for you. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to be evaluated, check exactly what the situations are. You understand? I know of somebody, I know of people, even within our institutions, that have been helped for more than 30 years. You understand? They've been given jobs. They've been paid. In fact, there was one that even after he was rehabilitated, the family didn't want him again. And then the hospital employed and did some other things. 
I mean, the hospital is not going to employ everybody that need needs that has the needs, but everybody is evaluated, and then at some point in time you get help. But if you are the kind of person who wants to just take all the problem and then hand it over to someone, hoping that it doesn't work that way. So the truth is that in all public institutions there are help, but you don't know we evaluate you. You just think, okay, they are not helping me, and um, consultation should be free. This should be free, you understand? It doesn't work that way. If you meet the criteria, you will get help. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shomi. All right, I'm going to take two more questions from the audience. So if you just raise your hand on this side, I'm on this side now. So if you just raise your hand, oh, wow, she's fast. I'm coming to you. Thank you very much. Um, my question is for Dr. Muidin. Um, I know you did not mention all of the questions in the SASQ. But I would really love to find, if you can just mention one or two, that has to do with the cultural sensitivity in Nigeria specifically. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Muidin, that's a fellow researcher. Let's ask the research specific uh, question. Well, issue of uh, high contact is one of them. And uh, we look at it the way we frame it so that you know, when you are talking to elderly, culturally, you don't look straight into their eyes. And we don't count that as very important culturally in Africa, unless it's extreme, unless the child is actually staring into space. That is what we look at, not that the child is not looking at you, the child is staring into space. That is one important point. Okay, so another one, do you want to give us another example? Well, the issue of uh, repetitive behavior, like toe walking and all that, we frame it differently in terms of uh, the child rocking and moving. Sometimes we don't find this exactly the way it is among African children as it is in the Western culture. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I hope that answers the question a bit. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a friend that has a son. The son is about 11 years and is very hyperactive. In fact, when I was listening to this uh, conference speaker since yesterday, to me, I'm coming up with diagnosis of him being an autism child. But I know. You have become uh, you know, uh, yes. a specialist. Wow. <laughs> just since yesterday. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Just, just after so 24 hours. I was even saying it that wow. even if we are going to. Uh, finalize the diagnosis, he needs to go for assessment uh -huh. based on what they have said. Good. But I observe some things on him. Even at his age, he's repairing fans, televisions. If you give him computer, he will want to scatter everything and rearrange too. Then I observe that he's always having a spasm of one part of his face. Mm. What could be done to such Okay. I, I think you have the answer already, but um, I guess we'll get one of our... But let me get one more question at the far back, and then we'll have a response, and we'll see how much time we have left. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is, at what point should we encourage parents with... Um, children with disabilities to go for checkups so that to know the progress of that child. And secondly, um, like you having a child that has been denied for about 28 years, like the other person asked, um, at what time will you tell the child that, or at what age should we stop that child from going into inclusion? probably move that child to a vocational school. And also, thirdly, it's just like a suggestion. I don't know if g 2 Co can extend this awareness to our various branches of GT um, so that when we are having autism um, awareness, we can go out there, not to limit it to this program alone. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, just before our specialists attend to this question, let me say that the theme of this conference is creating a community of advocates. And um, we just want to remind everyone here that everyone here is an advocate. Everyone here is 
empowered to take the message to your community and be a voice for the voiceless in your community. All right, so let's remember that. Autism. Can we do the I am an advocate now? Autism. Autism. All right. In the interest of time, we would have just this final response and we'll take questions during panel again. So thank you very much. So I'll keep repeating. It's always important to have a diagnosis. So um, going through this conference increases your awareness. It doesn't make you an expert. I usually tell parents that neurodevelopmental disorder is like salad. So you have a lot of ingredients. It's all alike, but they're not the same. So you can have symptoms of so many things, but there's a major problem, you know, because of the development. The brain is not fully developed, so it, it won't be as easy as an adult brain. So a lot of things will look similar. So you look something that looks like ADHD, language disorder, autism, blah, 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 and the rest like that. So you need proper diagnosis and assessment. And so concerning the other question, the best time is now. I mean, we cannot keep crying over spilled milk. Whatever has happened has happened. So the best time to make, to go for assessment is now. So it's, in the next one second will be late. So as soon as it's possible, let it go. So concerning going for inclusion or non inclusion, also very important. The essence of everything is your child must be properly assessed. So I'll give a very simple one. So if your child has an intellectual disability, in addition to having autism, the intellectual disability will, decide, will determine a lot of things that can be done with the child. So there's no need flogging a dead horse. I mean, if the child is not able to cope with secondary school and you're saying this child must be a doctor, I mean, it's, it's going to be a far cry. So it's important ensure that proper diagnosis and assessment is done, that will guide you on what needs to be done. So the ultimate thing is that everybody in the team is working towards a particular goal, and once that is done, you will be able to achieve the set goal that you have for yourself. Thank you very much. All right, let's put our hands together for Dr. Shomi. Um, okay, so we're going to break for lunch now, but I just want to allow any of our experts who want to add anything um, in conclusion. Okay, so you, Dr. Muidin, and Tagbo. I just wanted. Muidin and Tagbo. I just wanted to add to the question about toothbrushing, right? Um, our dentist mentioned some things they do in the clinic to help. The question was about a three-year-old boy, and what we typically do for any type of. Um, Toothbrushing or medical intervention is something called shaping. He described something called a task analysis where you break the steps down. Brushing your teeth isn't just one thing. There's many steps to brushing the teeth, right? So you want to start where the child can be successful. If they just scream at even touching the toothbrush, you want to start by creating opportunities for them to get used to the toothbrush being around in the environment with them with using reinforcement, things that motivate them to take those next steps. So maybe they love the iPad, right? So first, they need to just touch the toothbrush, then they get the iPad for 20 seconds. Then you try again, touch the toothbrush. Now remember, it's never about forcing. If you are forcing the child to do different steps, they're gonna become even more resistant and it's gonna take you longer. So it's about small, small steps towards working towards the child being able to First, we're, you know, maybe brushing on this side. Then later, we're brushing this side and this side. In the meantime, the dentist mentioned using a mouth rinse or something. I'm not a dentist. Talk to your dentist. But um, that's how we behaviorally shape a skill up. You don't push the child. You go at the pace of the child, and you use what they love to motivate them to try to go to the next step. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Muidin. Yes, there was a question that was asked about sensory overload. And I believe the person that has the question, probably a lay person, that want to understand what sensory overload is. Sensory overload just means the five senses, like the sense of taste, the sense of touch, the sense of hearing, the sense of smell, the sense of seeing. And in children with autism, 
this is hypersensitive. They are hypersensitive to some certain sound. When they hear it, it upsets them. What sometimes things they see, it upsets them. Things they smell, they have eyes as smell, and it makes them uncomfortable. When these things occur, that ordinarily a typical brain person will see it as a normal experience in terms of that's why they select food. The way it should taste in their mouth. So sense of taste. So when their senses of taste, smell, and all that, they are uncomfortable with it. That's when they display symptoms of sensory overload. All right, thank you. And finally. Um, my question is actually to the speaker. Um, I think it's Whitney. He has spoke about compassion and um, empathy. Empathy and compassion. And, um, you know, you, you, was, you spoke about uh, leading with compassion but maintain boundaries. Now, uh, I have an issue. I have questions, especially, with most um, therapists, occupational therapists, ABA specialists, um, teachers, anybody that has anything to do with a child on the spectrum or any child that has special needs. Where do you draw that line? Because um, a, lot of peop a lot of these specialists, teachers, they, they come with, please um, permit me, they come with a, a, a type of um, um, a verdict. You meet a child who has special needs, who has autism, you come with a verdict automatically. This child is not going to amount to anything. So let's just manage him. So let's just, you know, just get to learn this, try to learn that, and... Um, so, I'm out of time. <laughs> I'm out of time. But this is really a very serious um, question which I have. I think okay. I'll push it to after, after lunch. That where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? If you get close to the family and you show compassion and then all of a sudden you have to now become professional. You can't, you can't be pulling back, right? It's about guiding your connection with the family with compassion, right? You're empathizing with them, but you're providing action and steps to make the progress that's needed. But what I talked about is more of the boundaries that then make it so that things get messy. And if you get too, too close with the family, I mean, these people are in your home, right? I'm assuming, or you, you see them, you interact with them a lot. Of course, you want a very great relationship with them, but it needs to be that there's also an understanding of the goal for both of you is to help the child. It's not about necessarily the friendship coming first, it's about the goal of helping the child. And if you become so, so, so tight, sometimes you can't say the thing that you need to say to the family that's about what is most important for that child. Maybe the parents really want you to be working on ABCs and this child is 14 and they need to be looking at vocational skills and you can't speak up. So it's more about having that connection, leading with compassion, but remembering from both sides that the goal is uh, what is best for the child and client. That's what I mean by that. And we can talk further about it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, can we make that round of applause loud for everyone? That was intense, but that was beautiful. Again, apologies if we were not able to get to your question. I want to believe that we've you know, touched on almost everything. All right, so we're going to break for lunch. That is already happening. Uh, as we did yesterday, please remain seated. Um, your lunch packs will be passed to you. Um, we'll resume at 2, so we've uh, taken just 11 minutes from lunch. That's not too bad. All right. So at 2, we're going to have our two final panel sessions for the conference. The first one will look at um, finding your child's passion, um, and then the last one will be about centering autistic voices and refocusing the narrative. All right, so lunch break starts now. Um, remember, the conversation continues online. The hashtag is be a voice, hashtag autism. See you at two. Thank you. Yes, if you want to clap, you can clap now. Yeah. Autism? You, everything together is all right. <laughs>
times who I am. To be just like every other kid, the more he does on me that I am different. And that's enough for me. Do not judge people by what you see externally. I am this way, it doesn't mean I don't have dreams or aspirations just like you do. They just might be bigger than you all combined. My disability is it a barrier to capabilities? There is so much more to what you think about me and my kind. We want you to be a part of our story, a part of all that we dream to become. Because I have something you've never seen before. I am Tade and I am different. I am Tade and I am. I am it's okay, it's okay. I am, I am, I am different. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Autism as it is, as it's defined, is a multidimensional problem. And symptoms presentation varies from one individual to another. But if you plan properly and you understand that child A is different and child B is different, and child B needs X, Y, and Z, articulate the child's needs and plan it properly. Now somebody asks a question in the morning, that how do we cope? With that stigma. It starts with you. So tell whoever everybody around, I mean, um, Mr. KK already also said that he educated the people around him just so that the education can. So if we have more people advocating, talking about it, acceptance will drive up. The reality is of it is is that autism is not the end of the world. In fact, it's just a developmental disorder. We all have a part to play in inclusion. We all have a part to play in the inclusion of children with autism spectrum disor disorders. So that for me is so resonant because, it, you know, so far we're all in this together. It's going to take years, but just like the head of GTQ's CO said, it can't finish after 10 years. It's never going to finish. In summary, it is that you must be so close to the child, so, so close to the child, that any single thing, you, you, you just pick it. If I just come in, in the middle of the night, you just see something, you, get, you grab it and you walk with it. Autism, put your hands together for yourselves. <laughs> someone at least one person everything you've learned here today you don't know when that person is going to make use of it be a child be a voice to that child in living a fulfilled life
My name is Remy Olutimai. I'm a voice director for animation. Um, I'm a voice actor. Uh, I'm a writer and a producer of animation. Um, I'm also on the autism spectrum. Uh, where I am on the, on the spectrum is uh, not, as I put it, this sexy side. When I say that I'm not on the sexy side of the spectrum, I'm very fortunate that I'm verbal. Very, very, very fortunate that I'm verbal. It took a while for me to um, understand that it was a spectrum. I read a ton of psychology literature in secondary school. Not to understand other people, but to figure out what was wrong with me. I, I think I got to where I am because of practice. A lot of failure into that practice level. I knew that my parents were struggling with me. I didn't understand why, I didn't know what they were dealing with. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine the scope, but I could see that weight. My parents never um, got exposed to the idea of uh, the possibility that I was on the spectrum. So they kind of just had a lot of patience with me and they would recognize what format I was working in and try to work along with that. How I met my wife. I was invited to do, to voice act for a radio advert. That's where we met. The rest was organic. I didn't try to be who I was not. I didn't try to put on a mask. I've, I've got two children. There's literally no part of my life, uh, education or career-wise, uh, education or career-wise or otherwise, where uh, being on the spectrum did not did not give people the wrong vibe around me. But thankfully, through those experiences, I learned to develop my mask. There was, there was nothing wrong with me. I wasn't uh, demon-possessed. I wasn't... Um, I wasn't stupid. You know, I just... I, the way I... I, the way I, 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 I framed the situation in my head was that I just needed to pay more attention to who I am than other people. I turned all of my classes, all, whether it was mathematics, uh, introductory technology, it did, it's integrated science, it did not matter. I turned this thing into a story in my head, which made a lot of things very easy to recall. When someone's on the spectrum, it's not, I don't see it as a disorder. For me, it's, it's a superpower. I will maintain this as a fact in history. There has literally been no forward movement in human civilization without the autistic. Only a mother knows how miracles happen, goals happen. How the spark of an idea becomes a heartbeat. How a universe is formed in the quiet of her womb. Only a mother knows how to house a galaxy in her body. How to speak its light into existence and weave the thread of life in her gentle hands. A mother knows how to protect her child how to swoop down and snatch it from the mouth of any danger. This is what they say. 
that mother knows best, guided by a spiritual intuition, an umbilical connection to her child, she anticipates every need before it arises. But no one prepares you for this. A body that betrays itself, a muddy gene pool, nerves that jam like a trigger, there is no manual for a lifetime of standing in the gap, of stretching hope to its very limit, of crying out to God, to doctors, hoping madly for anything that can bend time. Fold me back inside my own body to find that errant string of DNA and pluck it at its roots. I want so desperately to gather the mangled cells into my hands hold them still and beg them to give me back my child, weave them into a chord, a melody, a voice that can call me by name, say, I see you, say, I love you, say, mama. But only the silence answers back, a shadow of a word, eyes that will not latch on, Fear presses into my belly with open palms, forms a fist that knocks the air out. Strangers' whispers crowd the room, judgment falling from their faces. For the mother of this child, whose body folds forward like a question, they cannot understand this desperate wailing with no language. But I still remember how it felt to house a universe in my belly. The quiet victory of your becoming. So for this child, I reach through membrane and blood memory. Sit with you. Match my body to your rhythm. Vibrate back a love song. Even when your body is a wall I cannot get over, I will still love my way through to you. And I will wait. For that one look, one step, one word, the power of one touch, I will offer up my back again and again for my rainbow child who dreams in color, who moves to a divine rhythm even when I cannot hear it, who knew that I could mine joy from this sorrow. Use your laughter as a balm, a kind of healing so that when they ask about you, I will offer up my voice when yours fails. Snatch you out of the mouth of any danger. Guard your ears from the voices that follow. Tell them you are otherworldly. You are magic and moon dust. You are a testament to a love that persists in spite of itself. This gift, this child who is still a miracle. This child who is still mine. is a neurological disorder that affects one in 59 children worldwide, I'm not quite sure. So healthcare transition is something that should be integrated to allow children with autism spectrum disorder to develop health skills and health knowledge so they're be better able to care for themselves, advocate for themselves as they go into an adult. Children with autism can sing, can dance, can do anything like every neurotypical child can do. 
Um, we just have to consider that all can do. Um, we just have to consider their strength. So when we're talking about autism, we want to consider the deficit skills that these children have. And not all of them have the same um, challenge or the same deficit. They need that social space to be able to function as well as other children without autism. So they need the social interaction, they need the social skills. There are social skills to be built. So inclusion is good. Ori Ofe came to us at 21 with no skills. Can you believe that? You didn't get any intervention. That tells you that you never give up. It's taken us about nine years to get from the Ori Ofe of watering the plants to learning to play the piano in six months to working in the admin section before we introduced him into the classroom. Now he's a staff of Patrick's. That tells you that our children have the skills. Okay. You need to look beyond the challenges. If you look for it, trust me, deep enough, with love, with care, with a lot of expectation, you will get something out of it. I've made a little table of important keywords. They're not always the ones that we want them to learn, rhombus, square, yellow, circle. It's help, it's hurt, it's she, it's he, it's me. Those are the key words that we want to be building with our children so when it comes for time for them to express what they know, they can actually make a meaningful sentence to you or utterance to you that gives across information because I don't know how many of you have used the word circle to mean anything, really. My passion is children with special needs. I think most people here who know me, that's what my life is all about. Visuals are a big, big, big part of it. Talking about what they might see or hear or smell. It's all about preparation. Planning, preparing, and the visuals. Key things to remember in transition. Prepare a pack about the child's profile. Do that so whenever the child is leaving you and going somewhere, hand it over to the parents and say to them, these are the questions you can ask and these are the things you try and find out. If we locked up these children, then it means even for us as parents, we've not fully accepted these children. So it needs to begin with you. It started with her and you need to be able to talk to people about it. If you want her to do anything, just tell her you will go to village. And she'll say, go to village, yes. Do this and you go to village. She will happily run and go and do it. Because she knows she loves village now. If we are coming home, she will cry for almost an hour in the car. She wouldn't want to come back to Lagos. She wants to go to village. Thank and that's because she's been accepted. So that is our role. You're not likely to find any particular gene that is necessary and sufficient for a child to have autism. What you would have is eh? different genes which are responsible for different functions. And when you think about it really, we're talking about language, repetitive behavior, and so many other things. There are different pathways to these behaviors. So it's not gonna be one gene, one effect. But what we do know is that the heritability for autism spectrum disorder is high. Mental health issues are more in children with autism more than 40 percent of them could have mental health issues so they when they can have phobias they can have obsessive compulsive disorders they can have anxiety disorders they can have depression especially the adolescents and the non-verbal ones frustration let us begin to see whenever there is a change in behavior the increased hyperactivity the aggression let us know they are telling us a story let us not say oh it will be all right let's pray it out there is a story the child is trying to pass a message across. Something is threatening me. I am being abused. Somebody is hitting me. Let us listen to our instinct and do something about it. We take communication for granted. Communication is a big piece in everyone's life. I remember I went to Spain and I don't speak Spanish. When I got to the train station, I was trying to get direction. Nobody understand English. So I had to use whatever I could. Pointing. Where's the train? Choo 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 choo. Train, train. <laughs> So whatever the child, you know your child, the strength at home, look for it. Cut up pictures at home. You have pictures of stuff at home. 
cut it up, picture of brushing his teeth, picture of eating, use that to exchange, to communicate with your child. You're going to be the parent, you're going to be the therapist, you're going to be the teacher. Use for, look for anything in the house that has picture of the child's daily needs and want, and use that to teach the child to communicate. Autism is different for each person. So one child's autism is not the same as the next child's autism and can be typified in different ways. Um, children with autism can go as far as their ability will take them. To be honest, I don't know anywhere else here in Lagos that does such a comprehensive program. You can't leave here without learning something or feeling like you know what the next step is. Hello? Hello? See, what exactly is going on? Hello? Please come, come, please. Isn't really from your back, and I'm counting on you not to notice. Now that's settled, let's get to business. I need you to click the link in the email I just sent to you and then fill in your banking details. Please do not leave any information out. I will receive the details of your input on my end and then use it to access your account. I hope that wouldn't be a problem. I know. I'm just looking for spare change here and there. And I'm sure taking a few thousands of all of your money would not shake you for too long. Money comes, money goes right. I know this is an odd request, but please do not hesitate. And do not even bother to cross-check the email address. I mean, if you did, you'd have noticed it's a fake address. But you wouldn't cross-check, so that wouldn't be a problem. And don't even bother to call your bank. I mean, what are you going to say to them? Hello, I'm just calling to confirm that the email GT Bank sent was in fact from GT Bank. Listen to yourself. So now, hurry now, click the link we don't have all day. Oh, actually, I do have all day. I'm relentless, you see. I will try thousands of tactics just to get you. And maybe one day, one day I'd get you. Me and you. Like five and six, right? So she's going to introduce herself um, this morning. Good morning to you, madam. Oh, good morning, sir. What's my, your name? My name is um, Abdurrahman Haulat Balande. Okay. I'm a professional nurse and a pediatric nurse. And by extension, a nurse educator. A nurse educator. I'm from University of Illinois Teaching Hospital. University of Illinois Teaching Hospital. So you Kuala come State. All the way from Illinois exactly. To Lagos for this conference. Because That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> How did you find out about it? Mm, through my Gmail. Okay. Yes. Through my Gmail. I'm a customer of GTB. Okay. okay. And I received an email. That's and since I'm passionate about children, I decided to come down. So you took time off work? Yes. To make this work. Exactly. That is incredible. So we're sending greetings to everyone who might be watching from Illinois in Kwara Thank State. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now what, is, what has been your experience as a pediatric nurse um, dealing with, with um, individuals with autism? Hmm. It's been really tough. You know, as professional losses, yeah. we cite them right from birth through infant welfare clinic and other 
scenario as nurses and we go through the journey all along, all, all along with them, okay? So we appreciate what it takes to take care of autistic child. So as professionals, we take it to the tables. We are always there. We had the bridge between the parents and the specialists. Now, do you think that nurses are getting the representation that, you know, that is due to them in this field? Do you feel like their voices are heard and some of their concerns are, uh, you know, experiences are acknowledged as we, as we seek to improve healthcare delivery, especially for, for people with autism and other developmental disorders? No. Absolutely no. You know, we have the background. We have the community, we have the contact with the parents, and we have the people who refer these parents to the appropriate quarters, but we don't get recognized. We go through the journey with these parents, emotionally we attach to them, though we try to maintain therapeutic relationship as much as possible in order to not to overstep our boundaries as professional nurses. So I think we need more recognition. And being part of the team to manage this, will be wholesome. Fantastic. OK. Yeah. Now, now you, you talked about being a nurse educator yourself. Yes. Um, with what you've learned at the conference, what would you say you're going to take back home with you and, and you know, add to your curriculum for training and all of that? A lot. I'm going to take a lot back. I got to realize that the difference between occupational therapies and physiotherapists. I got to realize that we have uh, analyst, what the technician, no, behavioral technician. I don't know, I don't know of analyst, but I never knew we had behavioral technicians. So it's, it's interesting to know. Okay. And I will be able, I'll be able to take that to my students. Okay, so, final question. Final yes. question. For you personally, mm. um, what has been the most striking thing at this conference? What, is, what has been the biggest take home uh, striking thing? The biggest thing here is I was able to realize people are in the know. The psychological impact and the social cultural impact of having an autistic child is quite a rough journey to go through. Because along the line, we get involved emotionally with the parents. I got to a stage, usually the mother got tired, and you have to keep encouraging her to keep moving. It's so tough. It's so tough. It's easier said than done. So basically, nurses need to be equipped to provide not just clinical assistance and care, but a little bit of that you know, emotional, uh, psychosocial support. Especially at the community level. Yeah. Yes. We just support them using the human face. Okay? You know, there's, there's more to be done okay. aside from the human face, okay. the professional thing, having the li right linkages with the experts that needed to collaborate to get it right. Mm. All right thank you so much. It's, okay. such being, it's mm. been such a great conversation. With thank you. you too. All right, we're back. OK. I'll always love and support our son. I realized he started to need more and more attention, and, and I knew it was going to be difficult, especially with all the barriers in our minds. So I started to do some research of my own.
verse 21. Verse 21. Verse, uh, I'm sorry. See, it says here that the second step to helping him is eliminating barriers. I, I know Mama Nkechi and, and, and Mama Tommy. What Can you stop? What is it now? Is your mother on the spectrum? No. Your father? No. Okay, maybe anybody from your family. Uh, where are you going to with this? Just answer the question. No. Neither is anyone from my family. And neither will anyone in our family have this. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's how it works, so. Then we need to pray. Prayer is the solution. Okay, we, we pray that we have everything we need to help our son. Amen. And Amen. What are you doing? Has it come to this? If I want.
took a lot of convincing, but Ifeiwa finally came around. And when she did. All right, so we're back here, and I have someone really special with me. Now, Bolu was the best YX student in Lagos State last year, the whole of Lagos State. Right? Bolu, am I correct? Yes, sir. That's, that's incredible. So I want you to meet Bolu. He's a special, 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 special kid. Good afternoon, Bolu. Good afternoon, sir. It's good to have you here. Same here sir. So you live with cerebral palsy. Yes, sir. And it's also and I'm proud of it. And it's awesome and you're proud of it. Yes. I love that. I love that energy. Now, you're a celebrity, Bolu. <laughs> In many ways, you're a celebrity. Tell us, what was the experience like, you know, to be, what has the experience been, you know, recognized as the best YX student in Lagos State? Uh, the experience has been good, really, because the amount of crowd now seeing me for who I am and not for who I look like has been really great. Previously, you showed a video of a child in the park and bully and everything, it actually portrayed what I felt when I was growing up. And really, seeing my stage now in Lagos State, I mean, wow, marvel. And I'm just thanking God for all the glory and adoration he has given to me now. That is incredible. That is incredible. Now, Bolu, you have a sibling who has autism. Yes, Was that sir. why you came for this conference? Yes, sir. That's what I mean. Okay, tell us, so what have you learned so far? I've learned, I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot. I've even understand him by being here better. Because sometimes I will show transform and it shows a little bit of some things that we don't understand. But yeah, I'm able to understand it better and know how well I can cope with my younger brother now. That is incredible, that is incredible. Um... Do you, do you guys play together? What, what's his name? Yes, it's Taiwo. His name is Taiwo, okay. Yeah, he's three. How old is he? He's 14 years old. He's 14? Now, how old are you? I'm 19. You're 19, so he's big brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so, do you guys play together? What's the relationship? Yeah, both of we you have? play together. We just together. Well, most time, I know autistic children don't want to be alone. But sometimes we don't always accept that for him. We want to push him be together and do things together. Fantastic. Now, looking at Nigeria and your, the community that you're living, how, how would you say um, we're doing, how well are we doing in accepting and including people with special needs? I would say we are far back behind, but we are better than years before. Mm -hmm. Because years before, I wouldn't be given the opportunity to go to school at all, not to talk of being here, but now we are getting there, but we are not yet there. We're not there. There's say. still a lot to do. Yes, yeah. there's still a lot because, to do. Because, because we need to create room for people with special needs, people like you, to be seen, to be appreciated, you know, in society and be, and be respected and be loved. Yes, sir, because growing up really, I've been sweet, <laughs> but then difficult when you have your peers. Don't think you are laughing at you. Yeah. And then, at the end, I just give thanks and accept who I am because after you accept who you are, nothing anybody else will say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matter. It's been such a great time with you, Bolu. Thank Same you here. so much for Same stopping here. by and having this conversation yeah, no, with mind. me. Awesome. Awesome. For you, and you will get to meet some of them as we go on. All right.
wonderful. I know firsthand taking care of a child on the spectrum isn't easy. Sometimes it's tiring and other times it's just plain frustrating. But through it all, I've learned kindness, I've learned patience, I've learned that to be different doesn't make you better or worse. It just means that you're unique in your own special way. Seeing my son on stage remains a very special moment in my life. I guess I'm just glad you all get to see him, finally. Same as it is, as it's defined, it's a multidimensional problem. And the symptoms presentation varies from one individual to another. But if you plan properly and you understand that child A is different and child B is different, and child B needs X, Y, and Z, articulate the child's needs and plan it properly. Now, somebody asks a question in the morning that's how do we cope with that stigma? It starts with you. So tell whoever, everybody around, I mean, um, Mr. KK already also said that he educated the people around him just so that the education can. So if we have more people advocating, talking about it, acceptance will drive up. The reality is, of it is, is that autism is not the end of the world. In fact, it's just a developmental disorder. We all have a part to play in inclusion. We all have a part to play in the inclusion of children with autism spectrum disorder, disorders. So that for me is so resonant because, it, you know, so far we're all in this together. It's going to take years, but just like the head of GTQ's CO said, they can't finish after 10 years. It's never going to finish. In summary, so, so close to the child that any single thing you you, you just pick it. It might just come in, in the middle of the night. You just see something. You get, you grab it, and you walk with it. Autism! Put your hands together for yourselves. The more I try so hard to find who I am, to be just like every other kid, the more it does on me that I am different. And that's enough for me. Do not judge people by what you see externally. I am this way, it doesn't mean I don't have dreams or aspirations just like you do. They just might be bigger than you all combined. My disability is it a barrier to capabilities. There is so 
much more to what you think about me and my kind. I'll find it. We want you to be a part of our story, a part of all that we dream to become. Because I have something you've never seen before. I am Tade and I am different. I am Tade and I am. I am it's okay, it's okay. I am, I am, I am it's okay. Okay. I am di- Is audio okay? All right. Welcome back, everybody. Lunch break is officially over, and very soon we are going to kick off. So, if you're watching online, um, you know we need your attention now. Uh, it is time for our final uh, panel sessions to start. If you're in the hall and you're still outside or, you know, still having lunch or getting something, it's time to wrap all of that up and get back to your seat as we have our last two sessions of the day. All right, the first one uh, would have some of our parents on the panel. And then uh, the second one, uh, which I would have the delight to anchor, um, we'll look at how we can shift the narrative and um, start to uh, look at autism beyond being a deity. All right, so um, the first session, Finding Your Child's Passion, will be moderated by Camille Proctor. Um, it will have Mr. Tagbo Okeke and Dr. Mrs. Sylvia Tagbo Okeke, as well as uh, Mr. Paul Okeugo and Mrs. Esther uh, Sule Okeugo. And these are parents um, that have autistic children, so it will be a very practical, very down-to-earth panel session, so you do not want to miss it at all. All right, so you, if you're watching online, you really need to leave wh- whatever you're doing and start to get ready uh, for that. And then after that, we're going to have the session that I will moderate, uh, which will center autistic voices and refocus the autism narrative. And that would have uh, Remyo Lutimai, who spoke earlier, our award-winning voiceover director, and John Paul Horsley. John uh, spoke yesterday. He answered a few questions today as well. Uh, so I look forward to having Remy and Paul on that panel session. All right, so if you can hear my voice in the hall now, please settle down. Uh, we are getting ready to kick off. If you're watching online, welcome back. It's a 12th annual autism conference by GTCO. See you in a minute.
Yes, 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 yes. Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's still the 12th Annual Autism Conference 2022. We just had our final launch for the conference. And what we're going to do now is different. Everybody stand up. Everybody rise. Rise, rise, rise. Everybody rise. Rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. That music you were playing, I like it. Just make it a little lower. So keep playing the music, but just keep the volume low. Now you're going to do something for me. You're going to put your hand on your waist. Just to wake you up after lunch, put your hand on your waist. Then you will spell your name with your waist. Uh -huh. So if your name is shown like me, it's S E U N. All right, so can we do that? One, two, three, go. Everybody, spell your name with your waist. Camille Proctor. You have to spell the full Camille Proctor. K C A. Put some volume on the music. Put some volume on the music. Let everybody spell their name. You put, you put a stand. Is your name I? They're just standing like this. Just I in your name. Uh, doctor, you've not spelled your name yet. I know your name is Shewumi. 
All right, put your hands together for yourselves. You're wonderful. You may have your seats. Thank you. Thank you with the music. Thank you. All right, so this session will look at finding your child's passion. We've already touched on this in many ways throughout this conference, but want to dive into it a little more. And our moderator is no one other than Camille Proctor. Can we put our hands together for Camille? Make a clap for Camille one more time. All right, and we have um, two sets of parents who have autistic children who are going to share from their own wealth of experience and um, give us their own insight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Paul Okeogo and Mrs. Esther Sule Okeogo, Ziza's parents. Put your hands together for them. Come on, don't get tired of clapping. You're very welcome, Mr. Paul. We've introduced you like... You're very welcome, Mr. Paul. We've introduced you like two times. We introduced you yesterday and today. Um, you know, so you're welcome. Sorry, in his absence, we, we, we introduced him, yes. But we've already heard a lot from Mr. Tagbo, but we're meeting Mrs. Tagbo for the first time. So let's welcome Mr. Tagbo Okeke and Dr. Mrs. Sylvia Tagbo Okeke. Please put your hands together for them. They're parents of the amazing Tagbo. Kanye Tagbo. People are tired of clapping. Why now? Or should I give you another dance? Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to hand the microphone over to... Is this panel complete? Okay, who's the extra chair for? The Holy Spirit? I'm just, just wondering, you know. Okay, I'm going to hand the microphone over to, to Camille. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see everybody again. We're going to talk to parents, these two sets, about how they channel their children's abilities. So if we could just start, I would like for them to reintroduce themselves to you and talk a little bit about their children. I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Sil Dr. Sylvia. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Maybe I'll pass the phone to Tago to start. Um, my name is Tabo Kiki. Um, I'm the proud father of the very handsome Kanya Chuku Tabo Kiki. Uh, <laughs> I'm not just trying to hype myself up. Kanye is actually a very handsome boy. Very, very handsome. <laughs> And um, so, is that okay? Yeah, thank you. That's fine. <laughs> okay, Mr. Paul, go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Paul. Okay. And my son is also very handsome. We should probably have a he competition. He is, he is. <laughs> He's handsome. And uh, happy to be here to share uh, our experiences here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want you to think about uh, what led you to your discovery of your child's, um, I want to call them hidden skills. Um, I'll start with Esther and Paul. I know that getting a diagnosis in itself is difficult and often hard. And there's a lot of disappointment sometimes in regards to what you thought Zeza would be and what, who he is, right? Tell me a little bit about how you felt when you realized he was autistic and take us to the journey of where he is now. Um, I'll go first. So, um how did I feel when we got the diagnosis? It was relief, to be honest. I was quite relieved um, because 
for a long time, we didn't know what was wrong, right? So, um, and knowing is always better than, uh, you know, uh, not being sure. Um, because when, sorry about that, when um, Ziza was around two or three, we thought, first of all, he was deafness, because you would speak and he wouldn't respond. So we thought, okay, maybe the boy is deaf. And then we went, ran and did a, you know, went to a ear and thing place he was checked and they said no this guy can hear perfectly and then we thought it was you know some I mean something else and then you know he asked as well seizures you know so there was a, a whole gamut of things that it, it, it could be and because we were not sure what it was we were sort of in limbo for a while so when the diagnosis came that this is what it is there's a name to it you know there's a definition it was more there was now a lot more clarity in terms of what to do, like what do you do now? Because like the way I, I think, I like to solve problems, you know, it's, you know so uh, for me, having a problem to solve is better because once I understand the problem, I can go about sort of solving it, which is, you know, which is much better than not knowing, not knowing what to do. I'm going to turn it over to my very shy friend, Sylvia, who I'm going to force to talk. Okay, for us, um, initially, um, Kanye didn't uh, present the way the typical autist, uh, a child living with autism presents. Um, he just wasn't talking. And uh, we took him to a pediatrician, and um, they said, he's a boy, he, he'll talk, uh, give him time. And um, other people, friends, they said, he'll talk, give him time. And then one day, I think a family friend that came to the house that we had Kanye and them the same time. And the way the girl was talking, and, and I'm like, no, something is wrong. We knew something was wrong, but we were just hoping, living in denial, like my husband said yesterday, sleeping that in, maybe... In he, churches sleeping in churches, <laughs> that it will get better. And then we had to go for the diagnosis. And um, when they told us we were, it's you, are, you are devastated. We, we were devastated. And of course, uh, you go through all the emotional roller coaster. You go, you Google, Google will become your friend. It became our friend. And um, after that, of course, we had, to, we had to accept that this is it. This is what we are dealing with. And we have to look, start looking for solutions for him, look for ways to get the right resources to be able to, you know, make him functional in the society. Thank you. So this question is to both the fathers. I want you to think about how you felt, um, and I always joke about men always wanting a perfect son. How did you overcome your expectations of your sons? Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, hi. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I want to get, I'm the very, um, I want to get some clarity here. So, you know, maybe this is sort of a sexist question, but most of the time when, 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 you know, you have your sons, men and their sons, you know, that tight, mm. tight bond, okay. right? The so good, the, 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 the good child, the good child is the right. man. Right, The right. bad child is the, is the mom. The, correct, correct. <laughs> but yeah, what? Well, how did you get over your expectations, you know? Because you had expectations for Kanye. And, and um, as a baby, you looked at him and you said, oh, we're going to enjoy football and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. How did you overcome all of that? Well, I think it starts, it, it start from, you know, where my, like my wife said, where we got to the point where we um, now came to that conclusion that there is a problem here and we need to solve it. So immediately we found, we, we came to that conclusion. I think at, the, at, at, at a point I had no expectations. All I just needed to do was, I kept telling myself, I just need to care for my son. 
Uh, that was the first thing. And then after that, um, it now became, I have no expectations from you, Kanye, but I need you to just walk with me. And so I, I would take him out with me, um, even not taking out the other kids, I would take him out with me. And then we started going jogging together. I, think I mentioned it yesterday, he would ride his bicycle and I would go jogging. And because of that, he started riding his bicycle very early. He was about maybe um, four or five, four or five when he started riding his bicycle, no support. Uh, and we would, go, we would go riding for an hour. And then, um, like I said, I took, him to a, um, I took him to a soccer academy. I mentioned it yesterday, it was a waste of time. But I did take him to that soccer academy and I would sit there with him. And I remember very well, you know, one thing I would always do is sit there. I would be there for any activity I would take him to. So there were really no expectations. I wasn't saying to myself, once you keep doing this thing every day, you're going to be perfect. No, I just wanted him to have something to do because, um, of course, one of the, um, one of the, uh, the things we noticed, which I'm sure every parent notices as well, is the hyperactivity. And we needed him to be calm. I needed him to slow down. Yeah, so no expectations. I, I didn't have any. However, I was also very particular about whatever it is that he would do, where he would go, what activity he would take part in. And I wanted to see him just do something and get himself busy. Yeah. Paul? Okay, this is a very... It's a tough question, really, because um, it's something that has... Uh, that is, it's still ongoing. You know, because my son is only 13 years old. And as a father, when I thought of my first son, I had a whole different plan in mind. So, uh, of course, he was very, um, um, you know, coming from where I come from, and, you know, I, I, most men in Nigeria will recognize this being like, you, are, you, are, you know, we're Igbo, we're strong, and there's this expectation of, uh, you know, what, <laughs> you know, the dreams that the father has with his son. So I had all these plans, like, for my boy. Um, I'll teach him how to drive, you know, teach him how to chase girls, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, do, like, PlayStation with him. There's a lot of stuff that I had planned, and I, I'd wanted a son for a long time. My first uh, child is a girl. Love her to bits. Um, but when my wife was pregnant with my daughter, they told us... The, the, they sort of made a mistake, and they told us it's a boy. So when the girl came out, I was like, oh, nice, but, you know, I thought it'd be a boy. And so I had bought all this stuff, you know, that I was going to use to bond with my kid, and, and then I couldn't do it. So, of course, it was a, it was a shock, um, and it was something that I had to emotionally adjust to. I had to accept, first of all, because it, it took me a while to accept that I, I couldn't actually take my son to go play football, or I, I couldn't just do the regular stuff that um, father liked to do with their, with their, you know, with their sons. So, so um, and then now that he's, th he's 13 years old, um, it's pretty much the same, because like, you know, as, you know, the things that you do with your son, they change as he grows older, right? So, when he's young, you do, and then as, as he's older now, he's, 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 he's 13, there are certain things that you do, he's about to hit puberty. You know, with me and my dad, it was at puberty, you know, you, I could talk to my dad and he'd tell me, look, now that you're older, this is what you should do, this is how you should drive the car, this is how you should, and I, I, I don't get to have those conversations, I don't get to experience that. Well, luckily, I have another son now, I have a, a five-year-old who is beautiful, so, um, I did that, thank you, because I wanted to have that experience. So I'm having that now, but with um, Ziza, I couldn't have it. So that's, that's the biggest challenge from, um, if you ask me from a, a father to son point of view. Not that it's any different from a father to daughter point of view, because I'm sure if Ziza was a girl, I would feel the same way. Because like, you know, I enjoy being a girl dad as well. I enjoy the time I spend with my daughter, it's also very important. So just, you know, it's an emotional um, adjustment. I'm sure for um, Esther as well, it was the same, yeah. And actually, that's my next question. 
as as mothers, um, I have a 16 year old autistic son. I you know getting a diagnosis was difficult. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a relief, just like you and Esther said. I was relieved, but then it was like, now what? And so we spend a lot of time worrying about all sorts of stuff. And sometimes the things don't make any sense that we're worrying about, but we worry. Um, so my question is, how do the both of you process that worry? And do, how do you pack it and throw it away? How do you get through your days, you know, where you say today, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to have a great day, and so is Kanye, so is Ziza. How do you process all of that? It's your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think even, even um, having a neurotypical new child, I don't think you ever stop worrying mm -hmm. as a parent, really. So um, for me, it's the same. Uh, of course, there are some things that are different um, when it comes to having a child with autism. Um, I got to a point, I had to, so I, I find that from the beginning, it was, the worry was more like not knowing, you know, the fear of not knowing. You're just starting a journey, you don't know where, where, where that destination is going to uh, be or whatever. And, you know, along the line, you're learning things, you're researching. So I find that, you know, worry for me has decreased. I don't know if that makes sense. It has decreased, and then um, I remember meeting a lady. I had one, and I had so many unanswered questions, and I met someone who had two autistic sons, and she actually kind of like opened my eyes, you know, to not worry about the little things, because I'm like, how am I, how am I going to cope? And then I, I'm around her, and I see that she's, not that she's not bothered, but she's like, look, <laughs> you have, you have so many things to do with your children. You know what you want them to, to do. You know where you want to uh, get, you know, the point where you want to get them. There's really nothing that you can do. You can't control it. So it has to be, you know, getting to the point where you're taking things one day at a time. So for today, if we're doing speech therapy, if we're doing ABA or whatever it is that we're doing, and things are not working out, and the only thing that we're able to achieve is Ziza just being calm for today, or just being able to be happy because he's in the swimming pool, then I'm happy that that's what we're able to achieve for today. I don't worry about any other thing. I'm like, okay, tomorrow we're going to face whatever comes. So it, for me, it's worrying is day, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I face whatever is in front of me for that day. If we're able to achieve what we have on our list, fine. If we, if we don't, that's fine as well. You know, so. Okay. For me, I'm just going to be very, very honest. I'm just going to say it the way it is because that's the way I feel. Um, there are two kinds of worry for me. There is the everyday worry and there is the future worry. As a mom, the everyday worry is, okay, milestones now. That is the little worry. I wake up in the morning, I have four kids, but Kanye pops into my head because to me, I, he's the one that needs my, the others that need my care, but he needs more. That's why they call them special needs. So he pops into my head, his schedule for the day. That's my daily worry. What has he achieved? What, where should he be? And um, for every mom that has a child on the spectrum, time is not on our side. Because what he can do, what he does at two years, three years, four years, and everybody says, oh, this is so cute. When he's 16 and he's doing it, it's no longer cute. So you are racing against time. So I worry about that. How can I get him to that point where he's not doing what he's doing now, that when he's doing it at 16, it will no longer be cute. And then the big worry is, if I'm not around, if the dad is not around, because we're not going to live forever, what happens to him? How 
Will they be able to live an independent life? How will people treat him when we are no longer there to protect him? How will they perceive him? And basically, that's why we do what we do. Awareness, awareness, acceptance, acceptance. Because autism doesn't go away. Our children, they say, oh, you're lucky. They have this big gift. But does it take care of the autism? He, he, he can paint, yes. But he's still living with autism. And he still has all those things that comes with autism that we as parents, we have to take care of. So my worry doesn't go away. I worry. And I'm OK, because that's the life of Thank you. It, it, it takes a while to get there. I know it's not immediate. You just, it takes a while to get there. And then finally, you resolve in your mind, this is it. This is what it's going to be. This is our lives. So um, what I'm interested in knowing now is how both families discover their children's talents. Who would like to start? How, you, how, how did you find out? So, I mean, for me, so, uh, I just, how do you discover his talent? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, um, be before that, I wanted to just say something about the, something that she said, the last thing, the bigger worry the big worry, um, that's my worry. Most, most times, I, I don't get involved now with work in the small things, but I think about 10 years down the line. In, in fact, the decision that you, that you make as a family, they change all of a sudden. Like, when we got married, we, we, we planned to have two kids. Now we have three, because I figured it's safer for Ziza to have a sibling on either side um, in case you know something happens, then he has somebody. This is the kind of thing that is, it seems a little bit mundane, but it's very important because I don't want him to now be an adult and I'm gone and he only has one sibling. So I'm thinking, let him have two, and then where you live, you know, you change where you live. You, you, you. So it's the big worry is something that most parents with autism need to, again, maybe not worry, but plan. Right, you need to sit down and make a plan. And this plan has to be not for tomorrow, his painting, or it has to be 10 years, 20 years. You know, what's going to happen? Do you have an account where you put some money aside that it's gaining? Because, you know, with a, a country like where we are in Nigeria, we are doing a great job trying to create awareness. But at some point, this kid is going to be an adult and will need money. He will need money to survive and money to, you know, so who takes care of that if you don't start to to uh, build a plan, and, and that's my advice for the parents. Like, you need to take it seriously. It's not a joke, because again, there's no cure for this thing. It's not going anywhere. Plan, make a plan, yeah. And uh, I'll let you answer the talent question. Okay, how did, her question was, how did we discover his talent? <laughs> okay, we've actually talked about that. We, we, we really had nothing to do. I'll let them speak for Kanye, but for two of them, it's like similar stories um, we've, we've spoken. Uh, I think we're lucky in that. Ziza started drawing at age two. By by the time he was three years old, so it was like doodling, more or, more or less doodling. Just my house was constantly, would I say, dirty. Everywhere you looked, there were sheets of paper everywhere, and it, it used to drive me crazy, you know. But when we actually knew that he really, really was good at, you know, with art and all that was, uh, I remember a day when I picked him up from school and he, they complained that he, he didn't just cooperate with anybody, he didn't want to do any work. Uh, funny enough, then Angry Birds was uh, the buzz, you know. So he, he wore a t-shirt with the Angry Birds on it. And by the time I picked him up, the teacher said, he just wouldn't do anything, he just kept drawing the and so the, 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 thing, the thing that was great, look at the picture and draw. And then even if you were looking at the t-shirt, the picture, I mean, it would be upside yeah. down. Mm -hmm. But he was able to bring out that picture exactly the way it was. It upside down. Right? So we figured that out and we were like, wow. You know, so we, we decided to give him all the resources he needed. So I bought more paper, made sure that we, we, we always had pencils, crayons, you know, everything. And 
his initial drawings were stored in his brain. So that's Jesus' gift, actually. It's beyond the art, beyond drawing or painting, is that he has a photographic memory. So, uh, and the funny thing is, you could be watching Lion King, for instance, and he's not really interested in it. He's, he's just moving around. He's, we're watching with our daughter, and he comes like two seconds. He doesn't even look at the TV. And the next thing you're passing, and he has drawn different scenes of that same movie like Simba crying, Mufasa dying, and things like that, the exact way it was in the movie. And so for music as well. So uh, uh, you know, down the line, maybe at about four, uh, we got a music uh, teacher for our daughter. So we didn't really bother. And then one day we sat down again, uh, we're watching the movie or something as a family. And my husband was like, you know, he paused, uh, he put the, the movie on pause, and I was like, we're watching, why why did you do that? And he said there's music, Ziza was playing a piece, you know. So, you know, so, for us, I, I, I mean, we didn't have to put in that much effort. It was glaring that he had these two, um, you know, he, had, he, had, he was talented in music and art. And so as parents, what we knew that we had to do for him was to just push him and, you know, encourage him and just get get him all the help that he needed. And I think uh, for the most part, it's just uh, maybe about two, three years ago that Ziza started working with an art teacher. Up until then, he had just, he just sits down and he draws on his own. You know, he didn't need anybody to teach him how to shade, how to sketch or anything. It just came naturally to him. Yeah. It's oh. brilliant. Um, for, I think, similar story, um, Kanye would just draw all over the house, on the wall, on the chair, like Tago said yesterday, it used to drive us crazy. It would give him a whole uh, rim of A4, Kanye would finish it in hours just drawing. But the thing about Kanye is that he draws abstract. And um, that's just one thing. The first exhibition he, ha he had at Terra Culture, his solo exhibition, we called it Impossibility is a Myth. And that was for a reason, because when we took Kanye to Canada and they diagnosed him, they said he didn't have any imagination, he has uh, intellect, all kinds of stuff that his uh, intellectual ability was at the state, it would not be more than that, that we have to live with it for the rest of our life. And then we came back and this child is just drawing from imagination. He doesn't draw things that you see, he draws, he paints things that you cannot even imagine that masters, uh, uh, artists that are masters, they interpret it. I can't interpret it, and that can because we are not artists and we don't really know much about art. That's why at the initial stage, we didn't really understand what he was doing until somebody came to the house and said, who did this? And we said our son Kanye. And then we took him to Kokab Farouk and Atan, the lady called us and told us, your child is a genius. I have goose pimples. Initially, we thought she was just trying to make us feel good until one day we went and we actually saw Kanye painting. And we're like, ah, is he the one painting like this? He was calm, he was focused, and we were just blown away. And then one thing about Kanye is you saw him, he ran to the stage because he can't stay still. You give Kanye a book to read, he can't focus. You have to tell him, focus, focus. But if you put a canvas in front of Kanye, especially a big canvas, Kanye can stay there for eight hours without taking a break. And he'll be painting because that's what he loves doing. And it, for us, it's just a miracle for him to be able to bring out things that you cannot see, use his imagination, play with colors in the way that a typical 
child will not be able to play with colors and just put it on canvas and it's just beautiful. That's the story of Kanye. I would like to add, Kanye also has a uh, good memory because he spotted me over there yesterday immediately. He knew his Auntie Camille and he sat in my lap and he hugged me immediately. It's a great memory. So I want to take this to the audience. Um, parents who are out in the, in the audience who have specific questions for the couples in regards to their children and their art. Can we do that? I'm going to re-emphasize uh, what Camilla said about specific questions for the couple. So I can hear some people chuckling, but yeah. Okay, I'll start with this and I'll come to you too. Good evening, I am, I, I'm Cheryl. Um, my question for the couple is, um, you simply observed your child's passion and you decided to work on it, to improve on it. Uh, my question um, is, um, did you ask the child, when you saw like the child painting on his own, did you ask the child, what is this you're doing? Like to hear what he has to say about it, instead of just watching him and you know, acting on it. Okay, that's interesting. Should we take all the questions and then have them respond or one after the other? Camille. However you'd like to do it. Okay, so I think we should take the questions just so that we can just. Please, my question is, talking um, the two families that are here, they are talking about um, the, okay, let's look at it like this, the financial aspect. Those parents that don't have money, like you people, what can they do? Wow, wow, wow. Who told you we have money? Uh, yeah, because, wait, wait. I would love to answer that question. I, mean, I would love to answer that question. Paper and pencil cost no uh, money. You, you want to, you, she, she says the same thing, she wants to rephrase it. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good question. It's easy to discover your words, talents. Let me say, simply because you are rich parents. Uh, uh, Let's uh, uh, go to. Uh, 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 let me stop you there. Okay. Let me stop you there. Okay. We're not going to make these people rich just because you okay, want okay. okay, to uplift okay, okay, your. Okay, if, if you're in poverty, we're not going to uplift that. Okay, if you have a child, no matter whether you're rich or poor, if they have a talent, you can nurture it. You don't have to have your child in art school. You don't have to do any of those things. You can nurture your child. John Paul said yesterday, when his child has a can meltdown, we, can we settle down, please? Can we settle down, please? He covers them with love. So all this money talk, money, 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 it, it doesn't matter. Because if your child has a talent, you can pull that talent out. And you don't, you don't One need house. money for that. You don't need, if, if you have love in your heart for your child, you can pull anything out of them. Okay, so can they respond? I think we understand the question. So can we have the parents respond? Okay, um, I'd like to say something. I think all of us have something to say, so, but I'll just make mine quick. Um, let me say something in, in Nigeria speak. <laughs> so I'm rich in Jesus' name. I receive it. <laughs> but um, just like Camille said, whether you're rich or you're poor, it doesn't take away from your experience as a, as a, a parent of an autistic child, right? But... Um, to answer your question, uh, I said, when, when I spoke earlier, I said Ziza didn't even have like an art teacher. So I'll tell you what I did. Uh, we observed, like she said, um, and to answer your question, our kids are still struggling you know, with communication. You're talking about kids who are completely nonverbal at this point. So there's no how we could have asked them, what are you doing? Uh, communication is not just only verbally, it's also watching, you know, so even with their art, they are speaking to us. It's just if you choose to listen, right? So it doesn't just have to be with just speaking. That's one. Two, I'll tell you what I did. Do I have challenges financially as, as a parent? Of course I do. Uh, we're looking at where Ziza is now, there are so many things I'd like to do with him, I can't afford to do them. If I could afford them, I... I Trust you that Ziza would have been known all over the world by now, but I can't afford them. So I make do with what I have. I'll tell you 
things that I, I the kind of things that I, I did with my son. I would take him to National Arts Theatre for an excursion because I saw that he was passionate about art. We, if we didn't have an art teacher, I looked for things that he could do that, that would make him happy. Anything that had to do with art. Go, go take him to shops. When we want to buy paint and crayons, uh, I take him along with me. Um, at the National Arts Te uh, Theatre, there are people who are doing like sculptures, uh, people who are painting. We'll spend like an hour or two there just watching them. And he's watching and seeing what they're doing. We get back home. He has paper and pencil. I want to believe that no matter what, you can at least get an exercise book and crayons or something, you know? So there are things like that. Besides art also, my son has many other things that he loves to do. He loves to swim. I don't have a swimming pool in my house. I take him where there's a swimming pool. And he gets in the water, he plays. He loves animals. I look for people around. Where can I find horses, for instance? I take him to Ikeja. And we started, um, like, I know there's something called horse therapy. He loves animals. We started going there every Saturday. He would get on the horses. There are polo players there. I didn't have to pay. Sometimes I say, I didn't have to pay. Sometimes I speak with them and tell them, look, this is my situation. This boy is, you know, he's, uh, he's just at home and he's upset. This is what he wants to do. He gets on a horse, 30 minutes, one hour, he's happy. He likes the water. Elegushi Beach is there, we go to the beach. So there are so many things that you can do. You don't have to spend money on that. So I would like to respond and, and, and thank you, Buzi, for... And my, my response is going to be a little more... Um, a little more... Uh, here we go. Um, it's irrelevant for me I'm not going to apologize for being rich to anyone. Like, if I'm rich, I worked hard for that money. So your question, I, I think you should really, really focus. You need to focus. Because th this is a distraction, right? People are rich, people are poor, people are middle class, upper class, lower class. Autism has no class, right? No matter whether you are rich or poor, your child has autism. So, my advice to you, in, in the, again, I said it earlier, make a plan, plan. Planning is very key. I'm not Dan Gote, I don't look like him, well, I wish I was, but when I, when I got my son's diagnosis, what I did was I looked at the, the money I did have, whatever it was, right, big or small, and made a plan with that money, right? Um, money is important, of course. The more money you have, the easier life is. That's very true. But as well, there are people, I mean, somebody once told me, like, look, money, contentment is more important than money. And your child's happiness is more important than money. And there are things you can do within your area um, to make that child happy. I mean, even if my son wasn't opportune to be an artist, right, my job as a father is to make my son happy. And if I can, you know, get rich at the same time, Amen. But it's not really about, you know, rich parents or poor parents. That is bringing a, a bit of divisiveness into this. As a community of people who have autistic kids, we have to stick together. We have to be strong together, to, to, to partner together and raise awareness. I mean, we tried to do sort of um, advocacy and, you know, foundations to, even today, the reason why I came here is, um, so yesterday I was at the office, sorry, and I walked into the office, empty an office, and I saw a lady with her son, and I'd never seen them before, and just the way the boy was walking, I knew he was autistic because of, you know, years of experience. I just saw the way he was walking, and I said, hello, my name is Paul, is your son autistic? And she said, yes, how did you know? And from that point, we spent an hour in the lobby talking about her son, and then I gave her some numbers of people who I knew, you know, this doctor, that doctor, come here, come, I invited them here today, I, I hope they're here, if you're, if you're here, um, I hope you're here, but we have to, as a community, come together and, and support. We should not be, you know, talking about, you know, who has money, who doesn't have money. It's quite relevant. Thank you. Exactly. Um, um, further, further to what um, Paul and um, his wife have just said, it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about who has money or who doesn't have money. I don't have money. Or 
However, however, when you come with a, when you come with a question and you say, uh, you people that have money, it, it now looks like as if you're angry. Yeah, sounds like you're angry. And yeah. if you're angry, um, then you know you two, you, you it might also be needful for, to get some therapy. You see, we are not. Yeah, yeah I, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way. You need to get some therapy um, for you to understand properly and listen to what we are saying, trying to tell you. We have. We have gone over and over and over with one particular fact is that we are attentive with the children. Attention. Because I, I mean, I heard you also say, you people, and then you now said, what do we do? What do the other people do? Do what we are doing. Just be attentive and follow the child and follow the child and be very particular about what the child is doing and don't push anything away. You have heard somebody talk about the, um, the child scribbling. Naturally, if that child was uh, okay, you, you just say, man, stop this rubbish. And, you know, if the child is scribbling on the wall, you tell him, stop it. But for a child that has special needs, you now have to take special, extra special attention on the child. So um, what we do is pay attention. Pay attention and be very focused. Like Paul said, be very focused on that child and what the child does. And... Um, Communication, of course, is, is, is really, really low. It's really, really low. So, you see, what we might have, which is not money, but is knowledge. And anybody here can acquire knowledge. And once you are a knowledgeable person, you're a rich person. Because you can speak anywhere. So, get knowledge. Read books. Go on the internet. Speak to doctors. Continue to get knowledge and get more knowledge and get more knowledge. And then you'll be able to stand. Uh, because... Um, there's something about, there's something, I'm, I'm sorry to go spiritual, but there's something that the Bible says about the one who has knowledge will stand in the presence of kings. So you get knowledge. You'll be able to stand in front of the rich man, like Paul, and tell Paul, <laughs> and tell Paul what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. Okay? So please, just get knowledge and be attentive. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Okeke, do you want to say something before we take the next question? I just want to add something, a little bit of something, like when I was talking earlier on, I said we have four kids. And then when you have four kids and you have one that is special needs and needs all this care, all this financial, uh, you need finances to back him, it's hard. It's hard. Except you are, like you said, dango teeth. And you know, but it's hard for parents because you have to make sacrifices, a lot of sacrifices. And when Kanye started having an exhibition, my husband and I, we said, we actually discussed it. We said, wow, we, he has a job. I left my job. <laughs> uh, and, it's, um, and I had to leave my job. So everything was on him for a long time. So you can imagine the strain that it puts uh, on everything because you have to count every spending that you have to make because you, the woman has to stay at home to pay attention to this child. Because if both of us are doing our own thing, then what happens to him? And when we talked about it, we said, okay, as he's having all this exhibition and he's selling his painting, we normally take a percentage for people, especially people that cannot afford therapy. We can't do therapy. We can't do for everybody, but whatever we can do. And then recently, we also decided to have this portal. It's called the Kanye Chuku Autism Society Portal. What we do is anybody, especially those that can afford it, can go on this portal, just pick a child. We are trying to onboard children that cannot afford therapy. You can pick a child and sponsor that child. That's what we are doing in our own little way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's really profound. Let's put our hands together again. I, I don't know. Has it been mentioned that this is actually Kanye's work? Do you want to see Kanye? Ladies and gentlemen, please, camera, 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 focus on. Okay, he doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be seen, does he? He's a little shy. But put your hands together for Kanye. Come on. 
I, I had to bring that up because I was looking at this work and I honestly, I am stunned. I am stunned that he painted that because that is actually, I mean, this, is, this would command a lot. This is stuff that you would see at any gallery anywhere in the world. This is world-class stuff. And I think we need to celebrate that. I think we need to. Do you want to be seen now? Our superstar Kanye, ladies and gentlemen. I think what I've just gotten is, you know, regardless of what class you are, you have to make those sacrifices. And, and there's a... Oh, look at that! <laughs> All eyes on him. Let's, let's just... Let's, uh, very good, very good. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on quickly. We're going to take another question here and then I'll move to that side. Sorry. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think Mr. Paul has, uh, has been able to answer my question. Yeah, no, 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 but I, I like to talk on the mic. Just give me just, that, this, let me just have my mini talk. 30 seconds of stardom. Okay, so um, Mr. Paul has been able to answer my question. I mean, looking at all four, um, five beautiful people on stage, um, I can guess your family friends. I mean, I have the see, I mean, there's a synergy among you. So I wanted to ask the support um, community or the support group, how um, impactful or how supportive, you know, have they been, all of them? I mean, I, I mean, it made you feel better? So that's the question. And then I wanted to also say, sorry, I have this very restless, creative soul. I mean, have you ever thought of documenting the life of Ziva? I hope I pronounced it well. Ziza, I am so sorry. Ziza, that's a beautiful name, and Kanye. I mean, we could have a Kanye Ziza documentary, just document it for the future. It's going to be a bestseller. And thank you so, so much. And yes, Kanye is very good looking. And I'm sure Ziza is as well. Nice to meet you. Fantastic. Should we take the other questions on this side? All right, good. The stigmatization from people, you know, people with special needs, children, some people find it difficult to introduce their kids, their words. And the community, some people will be like, ah, don't let visitors see my kids. Uh, how do you overcome this situation in the community? All right. Can I start? Stigmatization. I like talking about stigmatization, you know. <laughs> I think it's very important when we um, discuss this stigmatization issue because more and more, if we are able to fight it, beat it, um, every, more people will come out. You will not hear of somebody locking a child up for 20 years, 30 years, and so on and so forth. Um, for us, the stigmatization actually even started from the, um, from the time that we got the diagnosis. Because if you, if you think deeply, if somebody tells you your child has autism, and then the next thing the person does is tell you your child is, is you're going to care for this child for the rest of your life, the child is useless. That's stigmatization right there, immediately. That's the first time we started to deal with stigmatization. And the first thing that we did immediately was to say, no, we're not going to take it. Right there and then, we, we said, okay, you, that's what you're saying, but we're going to deal with it in our own way. And now, so... Going further, I think I spoke about it yesterday as well. I think I, talk, I talked about my wife going places with Kanye and when he has a meltdown and people saying he, has, he lacks home training and so on and so forth. Every single time, what we do is to speak with the person. I think in those situations where maybe I could have reacted more vicious, more angrily, I'm not there. So maybe God has been saving me, you know. I'm not there. So when the person, when somebody's going to talk down on my son, uh, maybe my wife is the one telling me. And so we get us thinking. And what about when, you know, when both of us are not there? So basically, we, what we do is we, we, we spoke about the village, having the village. Our circle of friends, we were quick to let go of anybody who is going to discriminate or who is going to stigmatize. Immediately, we're very quick to let go of you. Because we take our child to... We, we, we still take him to friends' houses, we still take him to parties, and we watch. And we take him to schools, and you find out that stigmatization also takes place with schools, with health practitioners, with therapists even. There's some therapists will even come and say, okay, they are here to actually help your child. But then after doing the, 
the, the, the, what the book tells them to do, the next thing they just discard and say, okay, well, continue with your life. So what we do, we're very particular. So we're watching every single person and every single, and everywhere he goes to, we're we are, we are, we are watching. And like I said, we're quick to talk. I told, spoke yesterday about being bold. You must be bold. I mean, first of all, uh, agree with yourself um, what you are about to face and what you're going to go through. And whether or not tomorrow things get better, first and foremost, it, it helps for now to tell yourself that you have a big task ahead of you and you don't have that task ahead of you just for nothing. I believe nothing just happens. There's always a reason. You can tell yourself that there's a reason. There's a purpose for it. You must find the end of it. Now, I, because we have other kids, I have a, something keeps on always, something keeps telling me, if my other kids are going to be um, protected at any level, then he too has to be protected at all levels. So everywhere I go, I'm talking to you about Kanye. I'm talking to people about him. I told you about how we are going to travel. The immigration officer is talking. He's asking me stuff about him. And I'm telling the immigration officer he has autism. Right there, I take about 10 minutes of, his, of our time, and I start telling him about autism because he doesn't know what autism is all about. And then I tell everybody, taxi driver, and I stop people from doing some certain things. I don't blame them. I don't judge. Some places you would go to, you have a child. They, the next thing somebody says, hey, my friend, how are you? They want to play. That's how our society is built. But immediately, I get to a point... I, like I said, I'm always attentive. So when I get to anywhere with him, I'm looking. If you try to come near him and do that, hey, my friend, I'm watching. If he does not respond to you and you insist or persist, I'm ah, great. Shake my hand now. I say, excuse me, he has autism. Most times they don't even know. So I'll take about five minutes again and I'll school them. We have to continue to talk and we have to continue to advocate. That's the only way you can go about it. You must be bold and then you must be ready to talk. Keep talking and keep talking and keep talking. In 1993, when most studies started coming up about autism, you had studies abroad and studies in America, studies in, even, in, even in Nigeria here, talking about autism. That was 1993. You can imagine how bad it was then. And we're in 2022, and we're still talking. But of course, there have been a lot of, um, there have been a lot of progress between 1993 and now. So that progress took place because people volunteered and people were talking. If you want more progress to take place, you two have to st keep talking. All right. You want to say something before we move? All right. He has said um, almost everything concerning stigma. Uh, but one thing I want to add is, um, on this journey, one thing I learned is you have to, what stigma does is, bring a level of shame, you know, into your life. Society tells you that your child is, I don't even want to use the kind of words, until recently um, in Nigeria, at least in Africa, you hear things like imbecile, all sorts of names are being used for, for, for people who have autism and other disabilities. But um, as a parent, I, one, one of the questions that I ask other parents is that the way I dealt with this stigma is I don't give room for it and I, I feel that at some point you have to come to a level of acceptance as a parent yourself a lot of us parents are saying you know we're preaching acceptance inclusion but we haven't even accepted that this is what our, our kids are this is who they are you know and until you get to that level you don't have that much fight in you so this is who my child is Automatically, anywhere I go, I don't tell you sorry for anything. If he's having a meltdown, that is what is happening. All I need to do is educate you. However you choose to take it, that's your own business. You know? And that's what we as parents have to do. You have to do that. So everybody knows my husband and I. Like, it's funny because I get calls from parents from the UK, from the US, I'm here struggling and saying, we don't have things in Nigeria, we don't have resources, and people that I, I feel like everybody wants to jackpot, I want to jackpot too with my child, and they're calling me and asking me, like, 
You know, how, you, how, how, how do you cope? How did you do this thing? The reason why they ask these questions is because they see how we are with our son. We don't owe anybody any explanation. And anybody that comes around us, friends, family, there's nobody. If you're around me, you must learn about autism before you leave <laughs> where I am. If you don't know what, what the definition is, you at least understand what the different behaviors are. And that's what everybody has to do. I always tell people when I meet them, each one, teach one. If we keep having these conversations, where is stigma going to thrive? It has no space to thrive. Yeah, yeah. Once people come to an understanding, that's it. Everything goes away. So whether it's your family, I tell my mom, if, if you don't choose to understand that this is how my son is, then he's not going to visit grandma. He doesn't go to her house. Same thing with my sisters. Friends, if you don't understand, you don't have to come to my house. We don't come to your house. But as long as people are willing to listen, I will continue to talk, and that's what we do. Fantastic. I think, again, just a reminder that everyone here is an advocate. Okay, I've seen a couple of hands on this side. I will start with this lady, and I'll come to you. Good afternoon. Well, there is this um, particular friend of mine. Thank God for this such program, because I wasn't really aware of such things. And um, I'm not really sure the mother also think of that, that the child is an autistic. She has so many things which is um, somehow peculiar. She can't write properly. She can't walk well. She has speech defects. But one thing I notice about her is that always she loves dressing up. She likes dressing, making up, and other things like that. But I don't really know maybe that is... Um, the way in which the mom should channel the girl into. When it comes to reading, she's not really so much interested in that. When it comes to, but when it comes to dressing or being other things, you see her there. So I don't know the advice in which you can give to me. Let's, let's take this second question so we can have two together. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is going to be a bit of kind of like uh, narrative. Okay, not really long like that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, in this situation, I, I want to see the advice you're going to give. Like, you have um, a husband and a wife that gave birth to an autistic child. And maybe in this situation, maybe either the father or the mother left because they don't want to manage this situation. She's not, she's not comfortable with the situation of the baby. So maybe the father left the child for the mother, or the mother left the child for the father. So it ended up that the child is now left with a parent to manage this condition. So now, um, this father is a busy type, or the mother, that has to go to work, to pay bills and other things. So now, the question is that, okay, the child now ended up, maybe like, they sent the child to a grandma somewhere in the village, one old woman there, that doesn't even have any understanding at all. So you now take this child down to this grandma there and tell her that, ah, my child is autistic. Help me manage her. And you try to even, like, educate her, like, okay, these are the things you should do and everything. And this person is not even knowledgeable at all to get that understanding, not unless trained or to raise this child. What do you do in this situation? Okay. All right. That read like a good script, but yeah. Do you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Um, to the first person, um, I think it's, it's, I hear some good things there. At least um, you, you have seen an interest. Um, I think that's always the, the first step. We've seen kids that um, it's makeup, right, that, that they like, and the, the kid became a great makeup artist. Um, the thing, I don't, I'm not an expert, but when these guys have, there's something called Savant Syndrome as well. I don't, you should check that out. When they, when they really like something, they can put a particular focus. You know, I was in a meeting one time and someone told me that there's a company called SAP for, any, for anyone who's in accounting or in a banker, you get it. So the SAP recently started hiring more autistic kids because when it comes to data, they're very, you know, so they're hiring them for the focus because when, when they get focused on something, they get better at it. So I would say it's a, it's a good thing and, and see how we can focus that towards maybe fashion or, um, I mean, if, if that kid becomes a, 
uh, uh, Clothia, for example, could be very, very good. So um, I think it's a good first start that you're, you're beginning to see um, a lot of um, interest. And for the second one, I think it's unfortunate, like we've seen many heartbreaking things on our journey when we, because we now started doing a lot of work with advocacy and some families, you know, and I've seen worse things than that, unfortunately, uh, where some kids have been about, I, I know a family who the daughter was 30 years old, autistic, and never came out of the house, you know. Uh, I've seen somewhere they, they had chained her to a, they chained her leg to um, a post in the house so she wouldn't run away. And this is an adult. So you can imagine the, you know, the, the, the trauma that that child is going through over and over again. So it's, it's so un, 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 unfair and unfortunate because it's like autism already traumatizes you, then the society re-traumatizes you, and then they put you in, you know, so it's a very sad situation. But I would say, since you are here, uh, and you're talking about it, maybe, you know, do, do, do a little bit more to help them and sort of support them. It's about resources. Maybe that grandma who you feel doesn't know anything just needs some basic um, education or some basic instruction on how the, the child should be treated. But yeah, I mean, you make a, a very, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate for us in that sometimes we see those situations. All right. So I have just one I'll final like question to, here. I would like to add okay. something to that. Um, the first one is obviously fashion. You have to look at every aspect of fashion since she has interest in it, and then try to isolate the one that that is interest is um, most visible in, and then you follow through on it. Uh, on the second one, I was very excited when I saw the uh, topics for this year. And one of them was, it takes a village. It takes a village. And um, why GTB did this is not only to talk about talent and the rest. It's also to tell the couples out there, especially those that are struggling, that as a couple, you don't have to run away. You can do it. We are doing it. You can also do it. You can also focus on the child and bring out the best in that child. That's the essence of having a child. That's the essence of having these meetings. And um, like Paul said, since you're here and you're getting all this information, you can go back and help out in creating a village for that child, not just leave the child for just a grandma. That's the essence of this awareness, all this information, that we shouldn't leave somebody alone with a child that has autism. We should always give support, even if the child is related to us or not. All right, so this is our final question. Hello, good evening. I just want to ask uh, very fast, um, how do you deal with kids whose talents are actually high risk? So I have a seven-year-old and he likes to cook. He goes into the kitchen by himself and puts on the fire and wants to start cooking. He, he chops vegetables by himself and he likes to run also. So if you open the gate, he just takes off and runs. You have to look for him like twice. So his talents are actually cooking, running, and swimming. So those are, to me, I think they're high risk. So my question is, how do you manage kids whose talents yeah. are high risk? Is, is it your okay. child? Yes. First thing okay. we need to do, can we just stretch our hand and do a prayer? Let's just... <laughs> that was okay. a joke. That was a joke. Um, okay, can I answer him? Yeah, so I heard cooking, swimming. Did you say swimming? And running. And running. Okay. Um, they are not high risk, sir. Cooking is not high risk. The only reason why it's, it's high risk is because you have that fear that he's going to hurt himself in the kitchen. But here's the thing. Uh, I, I'm laughing because my son went through the same... He went through a phase. Like, you're in the kitchen, he was near the cooking gas. He wanted to see, you're putting Maggie, his head was almost inside the pot. You know, it was obvious that he was interested in, he wanted to be a chef. He would draw, like, pictures of a chef, try and get, you know, get a T-shirt, try and maybe make it look like he's a chef's uniform. And what did we do? We actually used to, we, we were scared like you, 
and we, we chased him out of the kitchen, right? But then down the line, what, you know, uh, the school where he goes to now, they have a kitchen and they do just that. What I'll ask you to do is, as long as somebody is in the kitchen with him, showing him what to do, when it comes to knives, there are knives that are still, you know, um, you know, good enough for children to use. They are not as sharp. You can look at, you know, getting, getting those kind of knives as in, but still stand there with him and guide him. One thing that we, we as parents hope to achieve with our, uh, with, with our children is independence. You want him to grow up and be able to cook food for himself. So this is a, 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 this is a time to start. Just be there with him, guide him, you know, watch what he's doing. In terms of running, um, for what worked for us, therapy actually helped us. There was a time that, you know, every second we were out, my son would just take off running across the street. Uh, my son has jumped into Elegushi Beach before. Uh, he left the house. We looked for him for three hours. Um, at the airport, we were traveling out. We, we look around two seconds. Ziza is gone. The whole airport is looking for him. As a parent, I tell you, there was a time I had to buy a leash. You know, I was one of those mothers I would see, like, all these, like, Oibo people holding, like, their kids on, on a leash. And I'm like, what the hell is this woman doing? Until I found myself in that situation. So I, I actually got him. It, it looks like a a funky looking backpack, but he had a long rope attached to it. So as, as far as he was concerned, he was, he, he was carrying his school bag on his back. And then if he liked, he would go like 100 meters away. The rope was in my hand. You won't even know. <laughs> and um, I know we came back from, uh, you know, we came back to Nigeria. The first time we moved to Lagos, I went to shop right with him. And everybody that passed us was like, who is this mad woman? Like, why is her son, you know, on a leash? I did not care. Because I'm like, if this boy runs across the road, you know, a car can just hit him, and what will I do? I'll be crying. But what we then did was have a conversation with his therapist, and they started talking to him. So we stand next to him. He goes maybe two steps away. We leave him, but we just tell him, no, you can't go that far. And you think that they, they are not listening. Over time, the therapist said, Ma, I don't want to see this bag and this leash on this boy again. And now he doesn't run anywhere. You won't believe that this was somebody that was running all over the place. He doesn't. If you tell him, if you're taking walks with him, Ziza, stop. He's going to stop. So the thing is consistency. And you keep talking and keep doing. And one day, you won't even realize that that behavior has stopped. Um, the last thing you mentioned is swimming. Swimming, my son is nonverbal. The moment we saw that he was interested in water, I said, put him in the pool. My husband and I. My husband swims, I don't swim. He would jump inside. Even when we put the, uh, what's that round thing? The, the, the safety thing around him. He would just look at you. Two seconds, you're not looking at him. He lifts his hand up and he goes down to the bottom of the pool. My husband follows him down there. He comes up as if there's nothing wrong. So it, I find that, you know, this, they actually can do more than we think they can do. You know, we, we just put fear and we just don't allow them to do things that they want to do. Just give him a try. And have some, as long as there's somebody who can swim and is in there with him, let him just keep trying and you'll be shocked at what your son will do. To add, um, let me add to, to, add to what um, uh, uh, Esther said, consistency. Consistency is key. Um, I, I, I remember I said, you know, Kanye rides his bicycle and I jog beside him. Uh, I remember I'd, I'd give him a very, really short story. There was a day we went jogging together and um, Kanye was fond of always jogging. He, he would ride his bicycle ahead and I would stop him and I would say, come back. And then one day, he's riding his bicycle, he's going ahead. I'm thinking in my mind that, okay, if I stop him, he'll stop and come back. So I let him go a little bit. Then I say, Kanye, he keeps going. I say, Kanye, he keeps going. Within a, within a, a while, I'm find, I find out that I'm here, he's at the road. I'm shouting, Kanye, he keeps going. He's going, he's going, and he's going. All of a sudden, I'm running. I'm not jogging any longer. I'm running. I'm trying to catch him because people are coming from the other side. And, I mean, Kanye was four years old. So he was a baby. So people are coming from the other side. I'm like, and they're like, are you the father of that boy? And I'm like, yes. Catch him, oh, catch him, oh. So at that time, they banned Okada. Because I'm looking for Okada. If I can climb on Okada and push him, because the next thing I'm seeing, Kanye, he's up the hill. Now I'm jogging up the hill. How am I going to catch him? I'm, I'm scared. I'm really, really scared. And so 
what happened finally? God was with me. What happened finally was, while he's pedaling up the hill, the chain of the bicycle came off. So he's there, struggling with, with the bicycle, and now catch him. I said, catch him. I said, can you? <laughs> can you? Anyway, we, <laughs> we, 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 he comes down and he's, he's, he's now pushing the bicycle, pushing the bicycle. As we're pushing the bicycle, we get to a farmer's market where they sell fruits and, and they sell things. And would you believe that the reason why Kanye was racing was because he wants to get to that farmer's market because my wife has a friend that works there who knows him and anytime he's passing, she'll give him Rabina. So we get there and he's going like this. <laughs> Rabina, Rabina. So I realized that was it. So I'm speaking about consistency, right? Tomorrow we go again. We go again with the bicycle. A lot of things will happen. A lot of things that you might not be able to handle. One time they were in Canada together he takes the bicycle, he rides, they go to the library with my, with my other kids. One day, Kanye gets up, gets on his bicycle and leaves them in the library and takes off. So they, they come back police. and they're crying. They can't find Kanye, nobody can find him. All of a sudden, Kanye comes on his own. And he comes back on his own with a bag of, uh, like, Crips. chips. Potato chips. Which, apparently, he must have just stopped at the shop, picked it up and continued riding the bicycle. But what, <laughs> what am I trying to say? is he knew his way back home. He knew his way back home. And with the other situation, like I said, he knew his way back home. I remember I said yesterday, now we're riding the bicycle together, I can leave him to go. He knows when to stop. He knows when to get to a junction, stop. Look, if there's a car coming, continue. Then he knows at a point he will ride, he will look back. He sees me at the back, he'll stop. When I get close to him, I say, ah, Kanye, you left me you just, you just shake his head, and then we'll continue. So, consistency. You have to continue because you don't know where the running is going to take you to. You don't know where the swimming is going to take you to. You just have to keep on doing it. Finally, you talked about swimming is going to take you to. You just have to keep on doing it. Finally, you talked about cooking. Now, I met a lady who has a son who is um, uh, who's on the spectrum as well. He's non-verbal. He's, he's, he's more or less non-verbal. But he's, 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 um, he's working in the restaurant as a chef. So they, they put him in the kitchen. And the only other thing that he knows how to do is to come out and to be a waiter. So he comes out of the restaurant. He wears, the, he wears their uniform. And you walk into the restaurant. Thank you for coming. Please sit down here. He gets the menu. He drops the menu on the table. Please place your order. And he goes away. Somebody comes, takes your order. He comes back and he says, Hi, thank, um, did you enjoy your meal? Whether you say yes or no, thank you very much for coming. He stands up, he goes to the next place. And he continues that, and he has the job. So, he can cook, and he can order you. He can order you, you sit down here. If you say you're not going to sit here, he would, the mom says, because I asked her, I said, what if you don't sit down on that table? She said she will stand in front of you. You must sit down there. <laughs> so, he's doing something else. So consistency is key. Thank you. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, I, I want to add something, um, 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 Tabo, and not to bring everybody down, but there's a danger in ignoring it, that interest. There's a real danger. Um, okay, well, to, okay, two stories. First one, when we moved to our new house, these are always swam, love swimming, so we used to take him to swim. When we moved to the new house, he wake up and dress up in his swimming gear and he say, I want to go swimming. So he's he used to be non-verbal, but now he has maybe like 200 words. So now he can really say he can, I'm hungry, I want to go to school, I want to sleep, I want my dinner. So that's it's good for us, right? So he tells me, I want to swim. I'm like, no swimming today. You know, I'm, I'm busy. And he kept on asking me that he wants to swim for a while. And unfortunately, I mean, where we were living, uh, our, I said the pool wasn't ready and they told me okay, this pool will be ready in like uh, a few months so I said you know this is like in a few months so he kept asking me and we live just by the ocean uh, 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 there and that's why he went because he kept on asking me that he wants to swim and I didn't respond so one day he was like you know this guy is not giving me what I want this boy climbed the fence he literally climbed the fence and went to a Leguchi beach and jumped in the ocean the, the only reason why we didn't lose him was because it was very early in the morning. It was like 7 a.m., 
and I was upstairs in my room reading, and then I just noticed that there was no sound, because I, I usually know in the morning, Ziza usually watches, um, he has his tablet, so he, and when he's watching something that he likes, he makes these happy noises, right, and he's, he's drawing, he's happy, so I always look out for that sound, and then I, I realized that, that everyone was quiet, so I'm like, where is Ziza? And they were downstairs, and like, we can't find him. And suddenly, the whole estate came out, we were looking for this boy, and then somebody said, oh, they found a boy inside the ocean. And I said, okay, that's probably Ziza. And so, luckily, one of, the, one of the guys who rent horses, you know those horse guys that rent on the beach, was out that morning and saw this boy in the water and jumped in and, um, and brought him out. And when they, when they brought him out, they, they were like, okay, you know people in Nigeria, is it Juju, is it Jazz, whatever? Luckily, the, the head of the, the chairman of that whole beach area, his son is autistic. You see how God works, right? So the guy's son is autistic, so he recognized the symptoms and said, no, there's nothing wrong with the boy. He kept the boy in his office, and when we came, he said, you know, I found your son, calm down, don't be angry. I wanted to beat him to death that day. I was like, yeah, this boy is trying to kill me, you know? And, and, and a similar thing when he was climbing, you remember the, the climbing thing? He would say, I want to climb, I'm, I'm Tarzan, I want to climb, I'm, I ignored him for a while. And then one day we were at the airport, my phone rang, I said, your boy is on the tank. Your boy is on the tank. True story. And, you know, and then we started driving back to the house. When we got to the house, this tank was like, it's like a, it's a, a proper tank, not like small tank, proper, you know those big tanks? The boy had climbed the tank, he was on top and he was just laughing, swinging. And at any moment, and it, was, it had rained that day, so it was wet. So I was like, this boy is going to fall down and die, right? So I started climbing to get him. People were on the ground, and luckily we came down. And immediately that day, I started looking for climbing apparatus, right? I said, okay, you know what? You want to climb? Climb, right? So the point of this is, is that sometimes when you, when you stand in the way of, of what they want, they usually try to get it themselves and they cannot put themselves in sort of real danger. So for the cooking thing, one day you'll be asleep, the boy enter the kitchen and blow up the gas. So you need to really take, take it seriously. If he wants to cook, stand there and let him cook so that he gets used to it and it's out of his system. Uh, and that's just uh, advice for everyone. All right. Um, can I okay. say, so yeah, there's a lady, a, a lady here spoke about the relationship between both of us. I'll just be really, really quickly, um, and I will refer back to the, um, pro, the, the, the lecture yesterday on uh, creating a village, okay? Um, when we, after we discovered my son, autism, and then the painting, I have a friend, his name is Abubakar Tafar Balewa. He's a friend of mine. I let him know. He's a really good man. Immediately I let him know, my son has autism. Oh, he started asking. He started talking about who are the people I know that their kids have autism or who are the people that I know. He's not married, he has no kids. But he just started talking about it and so he now mentioned Esther. And he now said, he now spoke about Paul. And I said, I know Paul, I've, I've known him you know, a long time ago. But we've, we've lost touch for very many years. And so he started telling me about Esther's son and he plays the piano and he, 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 he draws as well. And so I said, please send me her number. So he did. He sent me her number. I called her and we started talking. And then I found out that the, he, her son plays the keyboard and plays the, and he can paint. Now, f in further to that, creating a village, I said, okay, please, can you, are you going to be able to come to Abuja? Because we were going to hold the first, um, it's called FAT, Fabulous Autistic and Talented Exhibition, which we put, Fabulous Autistic and Talented Exhibition, which we put together when, we, after Kanye had his exhibitions abroad because we wanted to bring parents who have kids, who they have found out they are talented or gifted in one way or the other, to come and showcase. Because that was part of advocacy. We knew that a long time ago, that that's a good way to spread awareness. Let people know that these kids have a gift and they can, you know, put it out there. And so, in further again of creating that village, I called my sister that is in Lagos and I said, please, can you go to can you call this lady, go to her house? My sister sings. And I said, can you go to her house and sit down with her son because he plays the keyboard? And can you guys sing together, do some stuff together? And my sister jumps on it. And she goes ahead and she does it. And then finally, Esther came to Abuja and we had the exhibition together. We all did it together. And then they, they, you know, we 
came back as she came back and we, we kept in touch and then I finally got connected back with Paul and we kept in touch and from there we also she started telling us about groups we could join we to tell her but they'll save the groups we know and we stay, we keep increasing and we keep on increasing that capacity so that is we're creating you create yeah, that let's village, celebrate that let's celebrate that you stay consistent and you know all right so so this panel can go on and you know right because it's very enjoyable and someone talked about a documentary but we actually have videos um, that would show Ziza and and Kanye. So we want to play that to wrap up this session. So can we have the video? Kanye has really dead rebel skin. Kanye Yachuku was born healthy on the 19th of November 2009 in Calgary, Canada to Mr. and Mrs. Tagbu Okeke, who was diagnosed with Autism Spectrum Disorder at the age of five. On being diagnosed, his journey began to find a solution to a disorder which his parents were totally diagnosed. His journey began. Kanye was enrolled in various vocational classes, including music, basketball and cycling to keep him busy. He began to show signs of being artistically inclined when he would scribble on the wall at home on books, chairs and of course paper. On the advice of a family friend, his parents got him enrolled in an art class. They met a professional art teacher, Mrs. Kokab Farooq from Pakistan, who took Kanye under her care and began to mentor him. It was discovered that he had a flair for abstract art, which was developed while at the same time working with him in the art of painting live pictures. Hence, the journey of Kanye's love for art started. Kanye Yachuku's art has been recognized all over the world and his journey began with him attending local and international exhibitions. He is the youngest artist to participate in the Arno Art Exhibition hosted by OPEC Fund for International Development OFID and Moya Museum of Arts, Vienna, Austria. His art has been viewed by world-renowned art collectors, including the Archduke and Archduchess of Austria, who bestowed on him the prestigious name of Peace Award, which is reserved for artists, diplomats, and world leaders who have used their office to promote global peace. With this award and a series of successful exhibitions in Austria, Kanye and his parents decided to use his voice and art to advocate for children living with autism. This led to the first fat, fabulous, autistic and talented exhibition for autism awareness and acceptance in 2019, an event designed to showcase the talents of special needs children. This exhibition has now become a yearly event co-sponsored by various organizations including Transco Hilton Abuja. A percentage of sales from Kanye Yachuku's works are donated to charity. The Kanye Yachuku Autism Society has also developed and launched a portal that matches donors with special needs children who are in need of financial aid for his gift and art and campaign in the aid of children living with special needs. Kanye Yachuku was recently recognized by the federal government represented by the Minister of the FCT and Minister for Women Affairs at a ceremony to commemorate the World Children's Day. He is also a recipient of the Indomie Independence Day Award 2019 for social bravery for his works on autism awareness and the youngest fellow of APCAD Association of Professional Creative Artists and Designers. In furtherance to his autism awareness acceptance campaign, Kanye Yachiku has a number of his masterpieces in embassies and missions home and abroad. Kanye Yachiku's artwork titled Basket of Unity was recently received by the president of UNICEF as their headquarters in New York. The painting is wireless acceptance campaign UNICEF headquarters New York in honor of Kanye's No Child Left Behind campaign. His work can also be found in the head offices of various Nigerian missions including the Nigerian House New York, the Nigerian Consulate in Vienna, Austria. Kanye Yachuku held his first solo exhibition when he turned 10 years old in November 2019 at the prestigious Terra Culture Gallery in Lagos. This year, Kanye Yachuku had his first of his kind autism awareness charity exhibition with a world renowned 90 year old artist Bruce Onubakbrahi at the Orison Art Gallery. 
Kanye Yachuko is the youngest and first African to have his artwork on the front cover of an international art show catalogue. The Art Vancouver is one of the biggest art shows in Canada. Kanye's story tells you that there is ability in this ability. A new child should be left behind. If you are still sitting now, I wonder why. Uh, let's celebrate Kanye Yachiko and every other autistic child in the building here. By, ex by extension, this celebration is for everyone living with autism. So can we make that loud one more time? Autism, I am awesome. Autism, thank you. Thank you so much. That's amazing. All right, so can we have Caesar's video? Do we have Caesar's video? Can we celebrate Ziza? Yes, yes, yes. Another standing ovation. And ladies and gentlemen, can we extend this round of applause for the parents who are making these sacrifices, who are making it possible for these kids. And if you're a parent here, clap for yourself. You're making a sacrifice too. Clap for yourself. You deserve recognition. Parents, caregivers, siblings, everyone in the family unit and in the community who's bearing this burden, you all deserve to be celebrated as well. So thank you so much. One more time, can we just clap for this panel as they stand and take a picture? Can you stand and take a photograph? Where's our CNN? We have CNN here, we have Al Jazeera, we have... Uh, which other media do we have? We have channels, we have, we have News Central, um, Gist Lovers, Insta Blog, they are all here. Where are they? Let them take their hand. Okay, yes, for Instagram. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah. Sorry, I said you have to be the rich person, the rich lady. I don't have the money and all that. Is she still here? The lady who has the question, I think that's her. Okay, I just wanted to say Sholakpe is here. Um, <laughs> for people, like, if you feel that you cannot afford it, I know that there are people who are doing some work in that regard. For instance, she started a club, a creative club for children, which I, I do as well. Um, you know, we take proceeds from Zizas paintings as well, and we started a haven for autism. We actually do, like, creative club for children, and I, I think, Shalakwe, am I right? You don't, they don't pay, right? It's, you started out, it's free. So... It, It's limited though, so if you can just do some research, I'm sure we're not the only two people doing that. We can't take like, can you experience, uh, so we can't take everybody, but I know that if you ask around, you probably find somewhere you can enroll your child free of charge in places like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Remember in our uh, brochure, we have that directory. Um, in the directory, you actually have contacts for support groups um, on page 23 and 24 of of, uh, the, of the program, there's a directory there and there are some support groups you can actually be a part of. Is that rain? Ah, uh -huh, it's good, we can be here till tomorrow now. That's, 
Nobody, we're not rushing anywhere then. Uh, it's raining. All right, let's put our hands together for them one more time. Okay, all right, so we're about to have the last and final panel discussion. And it'll be my honor to moderate that session. But we're just going to give our uh, stage hands a few minutes to rearrange the stage um, for that. To our online audience, again, a big thank you for participating. Can we, can we clap for our online audience? They've been very attentive, very engaged all through the conference. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm now going to call my panelists up on stage. First, I'd like to call on John Paul Horsley. Can we welcome John Paul? And then, can we also welcome Remy Olutimai? Thank you. You're welcome, JP. Put your hands together for Remy one more time. Awesome. All right. So with a few minutes we have, we're going to look at centering autistic voices, refocusing the autism narrative. Can we please put our hands together for John Paul Horsley and Remy Olutemai one more time? All right, so it's been a long day. We've said a lot, right? But these two gentlemen are well above 40 and they're both living with autism. And they are a great testament to the fact that you can become a fully functioning adult in society, a, success, a successful one at that, um, even though you have autism. Um, so we just want to quickly go through your story, your journey, your life, mm -hmm. and, you know, how you've come up to this point. So I'm going to start with you, um, John Paul. Um, we know that you're, you're a rapper, you're an entertainer, yeah. but you also work at the National Autism Unit yeah. of the Royal Bethlehem Hospital in London. So walk us through that transition from entertainer to healthcare practitioner. Well, um, the first thing that made me want to switch careers was that obviously my son was diagnosed with autism. He was diagnosed really early. He was diagnosed when he was one and a half years old. And that was the first time I took a break from the music industry and tried to realign myself in order to learn about what autism was actually all about, you know? Um, people would guide me towards like movies like Rain Man or something and say, oh, that's what autism is. And I was like, my son doesn't give me Rain Man vibes. You understand what I mean? So, um, literally, I wanted to immerse myself in the um, education of what is autism. And by way of doing that, I kind of, um, I knew I was gonna become other things, you know? The first thing I became was a teacher. And I started to um, specialize in teaching uh, young people who had autism. A lot of them were nonverbal and so forth and so on. So I used the skills that I had from home to um, teach children in, the, in a school setting. Again, it took a lot of compassion, it took a lot of care, it took a lot of patience, but the results were what I was looking for. And I got so many um, good results and you know, turnaround stories that you know, I, was, I was really proud of myself for that purpose. Moving past that, I said, what is my son going to be like when he's an adult? So um, that's what drove me to um, learning more, becoming an OT, and um, working in the hospital setting. And I now work with adults who have uh, autism, but also other mental health conditions. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can put your hands together. 
Thank you. I mean, who better to offer interventions than someone who is living with autism and who's experiencing it themselves? Does Absolutely. that give you additional, uh, does that help in any way? Does that set you aside from other therapists and practitioners who themselves might not have autism? I think so. I think um, having autism myself allows me to empathize with my patients or my students or whoever I'm interacting with if they have the same condition or similar. Um, as I say, I'm probably high functioning autism, so I've been diagnosed with a condition called Asperger's syndrome, which is high functioning autism. Um, my son Richard is what I would call profoundly autistic, yeah? So he's 14 years old, nonverbal, struggles with many things, but he can communicate, he can type, he can write, he can uh, do sign language. And, you know, I kind of look at the things that he can do rather than the things that he cannot. And um, I focus on that and, and we progress from there, you know? Awesome, awesome. All right, Thank so let you. me go over to you, uh, Remy. You are, as you said earlier, Africa's only voice director. No, correction, West Africa's first voice director. Okay, first, for, for not animation. only. For animation, for animation. Okay, got if it. If I said only, that was an error, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, now, tell us about that experience. I know you talked about it a bit earlier, um, but tell us about that experience and how being autistic has made you special, in a sense. Okay. So this is the thing. Um, there's a, I just want to go back to something John Paul said when you were asking about whether or not he, if he felt that being autistic gave him an edge. Um, the thing is that with with us, and with something we even spoke about earlier, meeting other people on the spectrum, we don't regard them as objects that could become persons. They're already persons. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when it comes to um, when it comes to the voice directing, um, the I'm going to use the word language instead of pattern. I, I think it probably sounds less. Um, high pollutant. Yeah. So yeah, the, um, I learned the language of the writers, people who put together the scripts. I learned the language of the producers, who are the ones who are on the console and recording, you know, and choosing the takes. I learned the language of the voiceovers. Okay. That's not what made me a voice director. What made me a voice director was when I moved into voice acting, because I got bored. No, I'm, I'm serious. You can wake me up at any, you can wake me up at 2 a.m. in the morning, give me a one page script and say, read this. And I will scan, I'll remember the pattern, I will remember the cadence, I'll remember the pitch, I'll remember the drive, I'll give you three ticks and I'll go back to sleep. <laughs> and I will be called back for a revision. Yeah, you can capture that. No, no, the, 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 my, one of my nicknames was One Tick Remy. You know, just like bam, 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 I went good. But the thing was that I started to, I could, I could see what the, I could tell what the, the patterns of the demands of the, of advertising at that time, they were repeating. And I had iterated so many times that it was just, I was sleepwalking through it. So I said, okay, you know, what's the next challenge? And I then came across voice acting. And with voice acting, um, that was a shot in the dark with Femi Omoluabi and Namli Woha. Both of them did a composition, a, composed, a composition animation, 2D and 3D, called Coconut Island. It was supposed to be like a trailer. And um, that was my first gig, voice acting. And I was like, that's weird. This was 2008. I'm like, that's... It's a good kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. And in 20, 2010, Femi had left advertising, left animation, left everything. Namdi is still stuck in it. And he said, you know what, Remy, I want to, um, I want to do an animated series. I, I'm in. I'm in. Um, one of the things that I learned earlier, this was part of my defense mechanism in terms of reading if you're going to be a threat. Right? Not all threats are a case of somebody who's going to attack you, but people who can waste your time. People who take advantage of your open nature. And Namde is a very, fo is a very focused person. So I said, yeah, let's do it. 
And 2010, that was when Area was born. And uh, what makes me a voice director is that the other, the, the first set of um, Area cartoons, Willie had two voice actors, myself and the animator. He is not a voice actor. No, he's not. And that, my husband, he possesses my evil spirit. He's a father of two. No, I'm a father of three. He's a father of two. We, the whole gamut, everything, I was the one, I had to, I had to hear his natural voice. And then I had to imagine where I could go, which would be comfortable for him to repeat five, seven, or ten times as needed. And um, got that working. Then I started to study the work of Andrea Romano. Okay. And um, yeah, the, I got a handle of the technique, and it's, uh, it's, it's been fantastic ever since. Yeah, but you, you, you have quite a fascinating story. I mean, you've been a copywriter, a producer, magazine editor, even a banker. Uh, that is incredible. And, and Elliot, the parents on... Yes, if you want to clap, clap. Oh. <laughs> Elliot, the parents on the panel, um, you, know, you know, just admitted that they're a bit worried about their kids. You know, this child is going to grow up and, you know, what would they do? How would they make money? How would they take care of themselves? So the question to you both would be, um, what would you say to those parents and to parents that are here, those watching online who have kids and are already worried, you know, what is the future, you know, for a kid with autism? What, is, what are the career paths that are, that are laid out to them? What, what would you say? There you go. Well, um, to any parent who is wondering what is my autistic child going to grow up and be, I'm going to say this. The sky is absolutely the limit. They can become absolutely anything that they want to become. Um, it's going to take a lot of guidance, a lot of care, a lot of um, working together with your child in order to make that happen, for sure. But the sky is absolutely the limit. There is no... Uh, you know, cap on what your child can become in the end. Um, obviously, sometimes condition can be limiting, you know, so if he's nonverbal, he's not likely to become a speaker somewhere. Yeah. But if you can help him become verbal, being a speaker is absolutely a viable career. You can speak about anything, whatever it takes that child's or adult's interest and speak about that, that's awesome. You can become absolutely anything. There is no cap on it, in my opinion. Yeah, Remy? <laughs> yes, you were talking. I remember to year 2000, my fascination with submarine warfare. Mm -hmm. Submarine warfare? Oh, I could explain. Remember you told us you had obsessions. This is one of them, right? No, no, as in, the thing, was, the thing is that if I found something interesting, mm -hmm. I would study it, hmm. you know, and I would visualize it and... My interests have been pretty wide, but the, the thing that I came to recognize is the fact that my interest was actually in storytelling. It wasn't just the information for the information's sake. There's a story. Who, who are the people involved? What did it, um, what did it feel like? Now, um, regarding um, parents who might worry about their, um, their ch what their child's going to do when he's grown up, uh, it's... I really don't know because I don't know the child. Yeah. I don't know what interest the child will have. If you're going to take anything from me, I invented my job. <laughs> hmm. No, I invented it. As in, there, are, there are voice directors in the, U, in the West, in the United States, in Canada, yeah. But West Africa, there were none. You know, but I recognized the need. I recognized the skills that I ha needed to pull it off, you know, as like right now, I've even taken it further, I've, right now I'm tr I train um, voice talents across the continent on remotely, just because the thing is that everybody, everybody comes with, like I said earlier, everybody comes with this idea of, ah, you know, my voice has to be very deep or very high or very, and I'm like, look, just sound true and um, like even I myself, I cannot, play the, I cannot play the part of a woman. I mean, I wish I could, but I can't. 
but everybody's voice fits something. Yeah. Yeah. So once I get you inside that zone, the next thing I do is I try and find work for you. You know? So I don't know what gift or what interest the child has, but be certain of this. If you groom that interest, we've just seen Kan Kanye and, and Ziza uh -huh. groom that interest. The iterations that most people would have to go through mentally in terms of going over and over again, going through the mistakes, understanding what they did wrong so they can correct it. The way we iterate is, um, is unrelatable to anybody out who's not on this. Yeah, as in, we can't, here and I, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. You get, but if I try to talk with somebody who's neurotypical, it's, it's not, it's going to sound like I'm making up stories. You know, so find the interest, they will iterate. Encourage it; they will iterate, and um, yeah. And then from there, the, the, the career can can come out of that. Yeah. The other thing too, I will suggest is if you get a chance to get a mentor and somebody who will actually shield them, a and mentor, a coach, the world a shield. Yeah. yeah, somebody who will interpret the world or what they are doing to them. Hmm. I think yeah. Remy said a very interesting thing there as well, having to create your your role or position um, when there's not one there. Obviously, I've, I've come from a music background 20 years ago, if you can believe that. When, when I was coming up in the music game, there was no rappers in the London music uh, scene, charts or whatever, that were successful. None. Yeah, we were watching the American artists. By the way, this is JJ's, JJC Skills. <laughs> he, he was instrumental in my, in my early career. So stand and take a bow. Stand and take a bow. JJC in the building. Absolutely. I have to take my hat off to this guy. But when it came down to, you know, creating a position for ourselves, you know, he was, he was very instrumental in that. You know, I probably was already talented as far as rapping was concerned. Again, I immersed myself in, in that style of music. I put all of my eggs in that one basket. If I did not become a rapper, I don't know where I would be today kind of thing. So again, God, God was always with us. And you know, if you, if you keep your eye on God and your talent and what you, you know, want to become, eventually it will happen for you. Mm -hmm. So um, again, creating your own position, even in our condition and stuff like that is very possible. Yeah. You understand? And if you're struggling with it, find someone to, as he says, mentor you, guide you, help you to progress into that position until that role or position becomes available for you. Definitely. Fantastic. Yeah, if you can clap. Yeah. You're an amazing audience. I love how you guys just, you know, bring in the applauses. Now, um, Remy, you've used the word iteration several times, and, and, and I find it interesting. So you're basically saying that for people on the spectrum, for a moment, for a season or at a phase in their life, this might be an interest. This might be a thing that captivates them. And then in five years, maybe Kanye doesn't want to paint anymore. Maybe now he now wants to sing. Is, is that something that you see that can happen? I mean, you're over 40, and so you've had like two or three decades where you can look back and say, oh, I like this, and then I had another iteration. Is that what you're referring to when you see iterations? Okay, this, this is what I mean by, iter um, by iterations, yeah? Um, how many... How many Oh, no, I was, no, 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 that's not going to be fair. Okay, let me see. All right. Okay. There's, um, to say I am, so what's your name? Uluwashio. Okay. So, um, now, on paper, there's only one way to say I am Uluwashio, right? Okay, good. Now, okay, good. Now, as you've said it, I've already gone through um, five iterations of different ways you can actually say it with different emphasis and different pitches. Now, if I had the context for a script or a story that I'm supposed to be on, I would then understand what, what would be the best for the dynamic of the story okay. at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is, I think that's, part, that's the root of my success as a voice director. Um, the last, the, the series that I did, Love, Music and Dreams, when we did an interview on spaces about it, um, one of the journalists asked a, 
question that tickled me. She asked one of the lead, act one of the lead actresses that, um, so um, what did it feel like, you know, the energy with the other actors inside the room? I love the way you people bounced off. And she said, um, we, were never in, we were never together. Like, what? We, were, we were all alone. It was just me and the director. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still giggling when I think about it. <laughs> the thing for me is that when, when I direct, I, I don't, um, I think the greatest compliment I've ever received for my directing was when someone said, ah, you know, when I'm producing artists, they're usually very tired. Hmm. But you own, they are still bubbly. Hmm. I was like, yeah, it's the difference between me and you, man. I'm awesome and you're not, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, so, the, so the thing is that the speed in which I iterate, when somebody okay. comes in, I judge his energy, I judge his... I'm just using voice acting for an example. Got it. I judge his energy. Um, I consider the dynamic of the story and how he's supposed to come in. There are things that people would do and they would think, ah, no, I did a terrible job. Meanwhile, I've already... I'm like, okay, yeah, for this flow, this is where it works. You know, and I say, you know, thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah. And when everything gets put together in post, in the editing, like, bam. Now, this goes for, um, this even goes for art. Um, may, uh, actually, what may, not, what may be known only to my classmates in secondary school is that I used to draw comics. You used to make comics? Yeah. As in, I'll get a higher education book solely for comics. I do the panels, I do the arts, I'll pencil, I'll ink, I'll then use, I graduated from pencil colors to felt pens. But each of those times that I did it, each time I graduated, it was an iteration. Mm, I'll make an error and I'll try to correct it. It's in my correcting, I'll write, okay, this is how I don't make this mistake again. Then if I try it again, I'm like, maybe this wasn't a mistake. This, maybe this mistake here is not going to be a mistake here. You know, and you just, but it's, every, everybody, it's just based on their, just based on their interest. Yeah. Fantastic. So there's iteration within your particular field of interest, and then there's iteration as you move from one field of interest to another, right? Paul, do you want to, John Paul, do you want to say something about that? Um, or have you found yourself just having the same interests and things that you found yourself good at, or did it change at some point drastically? I think, you know, as... For myself, you know, I was interested in many things when I was growing up. Um, at first, I was interested in art. Yeah, my dad used to make me draw eyeballs and label it, you know, because he wanted me to be a doctor at first. So, as, as a young child, I, you know, I went through drawing ears and labeling all of the components and this and that. So, um, again, I was probably more interested in the art than the medical stuff that was around it. But I had a good, uh, you know, understanding. understanding and, you know, I enjoyed learning. I became somewhat of a perfectionist really early on. So anything I touched, I wanted to be the best at it. Like if I went into a boxing ring, I wanted to be able to beat everyone. If I, you know, stood on the line for a race, again, I wanted to be first. Um, when I was doing rap battles, I wanted to win all the time. I wanted people to recognize me for being the best. Um, again, having autism, of course, people will say, oh, socially you're awkward. You're not like everybody. I didn't want to be like everybody. I wanted to be my own unique self and make that popular. So thank you very much. So I think, you know, a lot of autistic people, they don't necessarily have limits. But there is a time and a place to show your talent, to show your skills, to show your ability. And um, a lot of people will wait, you know, in their autistic condition and not do a thing. They won't move, they won't make a sound until they are ready. Do you understand what I mean? So forcing and pushing an autistic child into a certain thing is not necessarily correct. But as I say with the example of my father, as much as... You know, I didn't know why I was drawing eyeballs and this and that and the other. It made me be able to work in hospitals. My, my passion for hip hop made me a chart topping artist. My, you, you, you understand what I mean? There is no 
uh, stopping just because of autism. You can continue and you can fight your way through anything. And we can repeat that there is no stopping because of the autism. Mm -hmm. There's, there are no limits. You can attain exactly. whatever height you want to attain in, in your sure. career and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk about um, the fact that you're both fathers. Um, um, John Paul, you have four kids. Five. Five, but four <laughs> boys. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, Remy, I heard you say you have three. You have three kids. He's catching up. Yeah, yeah a boy and a boy. And, no, no, we've locked up shop, man. <laughs> this is Nigeria. Oh, there's no, there's no social care. It's so, much to have your own. so yeah, it's, I, have a, I have a daughter and I have two boys. Yeah. You have a right. daughter and two boys. Are any of them autistic? Um, I don't. Think Not diagnosed so. yet. Not diagnosed yet. No. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll start with you, Remy. As a father, you know, living with autism and having to raise your kids, any unique experience there? Any, any, any unique thing about, about that for you? Um, well, let me, let me put it this way. Um, I understand my father better now. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as in like, it's not, even, it's not even funny. I understand my father a lot better now. Um, the, I used to think that, um, you know, the relationship between husband and wife should not in any way affect the way the fathers interact with the kids, mm -hmm. but it does, it does. And, um, well, you know, I've, I've been married for about four years now. So, and obviously there would be friction because we are both changing. And um, I noticed that. But it, this, is the thing that, this is the thing that still moves me. Um, my son can be really upset, really unruly. I'll hear my wife, Stop laughing! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! I'm like, all right, fine. And when it's time for bed, I will come pick him up by his arm. Like, ah, ah, ah. Well, you know, the, you know the drill now. Yeah. So he's like doing the monkey swing on my body, trying to grab everything. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. And we'll get into the room. I'll sit him down on the edge of the bed. He will cry, wail, whine, and then stop and just put his head on my lap. He just wants to know that he's safe. As in, I used to think he was scared of something. He, he just, the idea of sleep is the same thing as stopping for him. He doesn't, he doesn't want to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's okay, man. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I think, I yeah. think that, that the fact that you, like you said, understand what your father had to go through and your own experience has made you a little more empathetic and you know, made you a little more patient to be able to deal with your kids when they start to throw their tantrums. Yeah. John Paul, for you? I mean, very similarly, um, I suppose with my autistic children, I have two children that are actually on the spectrum, my eldest son and my youngest son. And um, they, they behave like I behaved when I was, <laughs> when I was um, their ages, you know? Um, I was very close to my mother in particular, more than my dad. But um, I, I think I've developed a lot of my mother's tendencies, you know. My mum was the, the chilled out one, the relaxed one. My dad was the one that was enforcing the law in my house. So um, I didn't, I'd never wanted that, um, you know, power over my, my children, you know. I wanted to be the guy that was always loving, always, you know, hugging, kissing, and, and this and that. So again, when it comes down to disciplining my children, I reason with them rather mm. than anything else. I explain the reason why they can't do things or the reason why they should be doing this instead. And um, they, they all listen to me. I've never really had to raise my voice in my house. My, my partners, on the other hand, I do find them getting frustrated with some of the behaviors that they come up with mm. because it's their first rodeo, you know? It's the first time they're experienced, experiencing this type of behavior or uh, character. So again, I would say, please, don't shout at him. 
tell it to him like this, and then when she um, turns around and delivers in a different way, she gets through. And um, I think that is the difference between my parents and the way I parent. All right. You know? Yeah. Another thing that is unique about both of you is you both, um, you know, discovered that you're autistic later in life. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so I want to speak to people who might not have, adults now, who, ha who don't have a diagnosis yet, but just notice that they have some quirks, you know. Um, they've not been labeled autistic yet. I haven't received a diagnosis, but they don't really fit in. They're outliers in some way. You know, they get bullied or they, they were bullied when they were kids or whatever. They just know that they're different. Yeah. What would you say to those people? Because I feel you can relate to them. What would you say to them? Yeah, starting with you, Remy. All right, so um, one of the things that pains me right now is the fact that um, I'm old. And... <laughs> Um, there are no, as in, I, I'm sure there's, there's focus on geriatrics, mm -hmm. the much older people, there's focus on kids. Yeah, yeah but for people like me, is either, are you mad or you're not mad? But you know, I'd like to know if I'm on the, no, we don't, we, that's not, that was for children, that's, that's developmental something, I developed already, don't worry, it's, it's too late for you, bye bye. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that, when you, there's a part of your identity that is hurting you because you don't, either you see it and you don't accept it, or you see the signs but you don't want to find out what it is. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I'll tell you just five interesting things. Last week, my sister reminded me that I read the entire dictionary at the age of 12. Wow. No, no, unprovoked. No, unprovoked. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I just sat down and started reading from A to Z. Um, I did not... For some reason, um, I was aware of social dynamics such that if I was with maybe two or three of my friends, all right, yeah, we're having a great time, we'll be talking, we'll be laughing, as soon as the fourth person comes in, the leader of the, the influencer of the group changes, and that person does not like me. Mm. I started to learn that very, very early. So if I see that person coming in, I just leave. I don't, my vibe is good so far, let me just, but I didn't know that was, I didn't know that everybody had a level of acceptance of what was, mm. Um, what I found comfortable, you know, even all the way into my adult years, I remember trying to have conversations with some people, and I'm trying to draw this long, this story, I'm trying to give different angles, and I am told, look, we don't really have time, just, you know, get to the point. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, you know, the context is much bigger than, okay, no, never mind. So I started to learn to speak in shorthand which annoyed them even more, but I'm like, yeah, you're the one I didn't want to context, so, you know, make mm. do. Mm. Um, the, I've been termed problematic. Because why don't you do what we are saying? It does not make sense to me. I'm not going to do it because you said it. Mm. Make it make sense to me, or take it away. Ah, you, I don't like the way you dress. I like the way this fabric feels on me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wear something and be a walking cardboard box <laughs> just to... You know what I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a banker, so, you know, even, even in banking time, the, the type of shirts that I wore, it had to be the right... This, this shirt is very comfortable for me right now. It's very, very comfortable for me to wear. But those ones that will be cutting you and be... No, why? Mm. I'll be making shaka 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 every time you're moving around. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that they... For some... The, the things that... Um, it's... It's important to see what... What you can do to get a better handle on life. Mm. Yeah. So if you can get a chance for an adult diagnosis, please go and get one. 
Okay. Don't go and rush for a four-week diagnosis. That's not how these things work. Mm. Got it. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a t there was time I, I attempted that, and I realized on reading some of the questions, my life had advanced pa past where these things even mattered. Mm. As, as in, it's advanced past where these things matter. There are, there are social situations that I would never be, I would never be in a disadvantage, as like ever. Mm -hmm. You drop me in there, I mean, whatever it is I need to command, I'm commanding. Sure. Mm. So, so in, in direct response to that, are you saying that for adult diagnosis, there has to be a, a completely different set of parameters, you know, questions, and the tools have to be um, modified to... For this, this is the real, this is the real, the way I understand it, this is the real um, mountain when it comes to um, autism. Coping mechanisms. Definitely. The world is not going to change because the world doesn't, you're still weird. The world is not <laughs> going to change. No, the world is not going to change. But what you can do, your coping mechanisms, what stories do you tell yourself about what's going on? How do you interpret what is going on? How do you know these people are really your friends? How do you protect yourself? Where, as in, there was a time when it got so bad, I used to be hypervigilant. I still get, I still, I'm still a bit hypervigilant right now. Well, it's, it's Lagos. It's Lagos. If I move around in a crowd of people and I see maybe four or five heads suddenly move very quickly in a particular direction, I, I can't help it. You move in that direction? Too. No, no, I just know problem is coming from there. Anywhere but where these people are going. Got it. Because, you know, yeah, that, that's, but that, that's, that's the way, that's the way. It was. I, I had to invent a lot of coping mechanisms for myself. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And I didn't really have to go through that pain. Because it's, pain, it's out of trial and error, and um, you, you don't, we don't really need to go through that pain. Um, if, if I get coping mechanisms now, I would love to have them. The thing I love about the concept of coping mechanism is this. It is explained to you. It's not, I do it because they tell you to do it. Mm -hmm. What, as in even me thinking about that, there's already a rise in my shoulders, I'm like, do you know how many times I had to do what they told me to do because they told me to do it in primary school, in secondary school? The things that I, the masks that I had to wear. Yeah. The things that I had to pretend to like so that people would feel comfortable around me. Mm -hmm. Wow. No, it's, it's a, and I remember, I remember all these things. John Paul, for you, yeah, like you said, so it definitely starts with self-awareness. Absolutely. And just acceptance that this is who I am. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when I was 37 years old. Um, before I got my diagnosis, they asked me, is this going to change anything about your life? I said, no, I can't see it changing anything about me. If I have the condition, then I've been living with it, it. forever. Um, but I, I didn't consider a few things, <laughs> and which was this, what are my friends going to think when they find out that mm. I have this condition? It changed everything, to be honest. Um, my friends treated me differently. I mean, some of them started speaking so slow to make sure <laughs> I'm getting the story and stuff like this. And I'm like, guy, I have not changed is still me, hmm. you know. Um, I believe in certain circumstances, it, preventing, it prevented me from getting certain jobs because, you know, as you uh, are going and filling out the application, it says, do you have any disabilities or conditions that you'd like or need to mention in order for, um, to get through your occupational therapy stuff? So I would say, I have autism, but I'm not affected by it, you know. This is just the condition that mm. I have. Mm. Mm. Again, they would call up, hey, do you need any special chair for your autism? No, I'm fine. <laughs> you understand what I mean? It's a, it's a neurological condition. There's no chair you can give me that's going to fix my brain. Do you understand? 
My brain works in a particular way. It's black or it's white. It's right or it's wrong. You, you know, there's no gray area for me in life. And um, I think also that's why I achieve so much because I'm either going to win or I'm going to quit. I don't like quitting, so my only uh, result is to win. Make sure that I battle until it's over. I win. I cannot lose, you know? Mm. And that resolve was instilled in me by, you know, I, again, probably my parents uh, trying to make me the best version of the child that they had, you know? And as I grew up, I just wanted to, you know, as I said earlier, I became somewhat of a perfectionist really yeah. early on. I haven't lost that trait. I still want to be correct. I still want to be as perfect as humanly possible. I believe a lot of people on the um, autistic, autistic spectrum want to be precise. They want to be correct. They want to be right as much as possible. I'm very similar to that. That's incredible. I think that's a really profound insight that the moment your friends found out that you had you know, this, even as an adult, decided to treat you differently and all of that. And that yeah, brings yeah. me to... Oh, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to... Yeah, go ahead. I love the way your friends reacted. <laughs> right. My friends were like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> no, as in like, it was almost, it was like literally almost uniform. Mm -hmm. As in I was like, yeah, so you know, I think it's, uh, it's Asperger's. Mm -hmm. As oh, yeah, 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 that, yeah, 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 that, 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 <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so, uh, I can't imagine what stories they remember, but mm -hmm. yeah, if, yeah. So that's a shared experience for both of you. This brings us to the final um, thing I want us to address, sure. right? Um, how can we build communities that care? You know, this is, a, this is a thread that has ran through the conversation, you know, since yesterday, and I really love that we've done that. Um, you know, fathers have talked, and you especially, actually, I think you were one of the first to bring it up yesterday. You know, I, you know as a child throws a tantrum, I, you know, surround them with more love. So it seems sure. like everyone in the community, whether it's those with living with the, with the condition of, you know, the parents, caregivers, yeah. there has to be love, care, Definitely. empathy, Definitely. you know, and the wider community, uh, you know, as, as citizens of the nation, as people in community, we need to be aware that we have people that have special needs and special abilities, and we need Absolutely. to show them love and show them care. So on this final point, how, from your experiences, can we, you know, um, you know, grow communities that can care more and have more empathy? Mm -hmm. How do we use the media and entertainment to tell these stories and you know, to, to spread the gospel? Well, again, I think um, autism or no autism, if you approach matters with compassion and love and care in mind, then you, you get to a good result at the end, you know? Um, you cannot be too rigid as far as, oh, I want you to do this, you're going to do this, and that's all there is to it. No, that is dependent on the individual and how they pick up things and how they learn. But again, if you approach things with compassion, oh, I'd like you to do this. I'd love for you, you know, to do this. Not, I'd love you more if you do this instead of what you enjoy doing. No, if you enjoy something that I don't understand, guess what? I'm gonna have to study that as well so I can help you to, you know, get to that level and stuff like that. But, you know, Especially with my children, yeah? I find it difficult to switch off that loving thing. It's, it's just ingrained in me to approach matters with my children with love first. Um, if they're having a meltdown, for instance, I'm not going to be annoyed because you're having a meltdown. Half of the reason why you're having a meltdown in the first place is because I didn't pay attention to what you were looking for in the first place. So therefore, it's caused you to become frustrated, and now you're having a meltdown. In fact, I'm sorry. Do you understand? And mm. then we can work on it from there. Does that work every time? Excuse me? Does that work every time, that approach? It does for me, yeah. Okay. Like, I, I never come from an angle of, why are you doing this? Mm. It's more of, I appreciate you're doing this. How can I get involved? You understand what I mean? So if it's playing games, I'll get down and play games with you. If you're crawling on all fours, I want to know why. So I'll get down on all fours and start looking around and see why you're doing it as well. Mm. You know, uh, behavior patterns or traits are, are usually visual, and you can see it if you're observing enough. And um, I guess that's what being a behavior analysis 
is all about, you know, understanding why a person behaves in a certain way. So um, in order to open that door, first of all, the child must um, trust you. Yeah. In order to get that trust, you know, underway, they must understand that you love them. Mm -hmm. So I always approach with love first, yeah. Fantastic. So Remy, you mean you're a media man. You understand the power of, 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 yeah, of entertainment and its place in culture and how we can shape culture. We live in a society in Nigeria, you know, where we can do with a little more empathy, you know. So in your experience, how do we make our communities, our, our society more welcoming and more accommodating for people with, with special needs? Okay, so I'm going to approach this one two, from two, um, as two angles. Uh, is there anybody here who remembers that area with the, with, the, with the pastor that used the plank to knock the demon out of? <laughs> you remember, yeah? All right, so uh, one morning I went to visit the animator who I did it with, Namdi Woha, and he looked at me and started laughing. I was like, what are you laughing about? He said, you know the, the, the uh, daycare center that's near my house? He said, yes. He said he heard them revising it for their school play. Wow. I was like, oh. Then some years later, I, um, I was voice directing a, a project, and some kids came in to the studio to record a song for their school. And the studio producer said, oh, yeah, by the way, this is the guy that directed that area or something. And these secondary school kids did the, my performances better than me. Mm. Mm. No, we, no, which lets me know something. The stories that we tell, the people who listen to them will tell it in their own way, and it will be much better than us who told the original story. For sure. Yeah. Um, I, I currently, um, th through my organization, Voice, Voice Acting Africa, I'm making a push to crowdfund um, the production of audiobooks. Okay. Yeah? We have, we have um, stories about autism, but do we know about the African stories on autism, like Sailing on a Rainbow? Hmm. Hmm. No, that's a real book about a real Nigerian mom and her son who's on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Finding these books, finding these stories, converting them and taking them to places where they will meet people. Instead of just hoping that people will come and... You got it. Look, my personal shock, in, my biggest shock in the last five years of my life, but aside from knowing I was going to be a father twice, but um, <laughs> was the first time that I came here. I did not know this existed. Musan Center. No, no, not the no, conference. The conference. I did not know it existed. See, up to that point, I'd already locked my head and locked everything where I decided to myself, you know what? Nobody's going to help you. You may die alone, you know, but so long as you get yourself and you understand yourself, no, no problem. And then I got here and this was, the, this was like, I felt no judgment in this space. You know. As in like literally from coming through the doors, that's when I knew it was the real deal. Mm -hmm. That's when you knew it was? It was the real deal. It was the real deal. No, he's shaking his head because he knows entire room full of neurotypicals in some, you're already like, your mask is already up. I was like, okay, fine. So who is, <laughs> exactly. who am I, who do I need to be right now? Mm hmm. 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 You know, um, and it, 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 it works, but you know, it's, it's not, it's exhausting. Hmm. So yeah, I would say, please, um, let's find these stories, let's put them in formats that can reach people. If we are going to do short um, animation forms, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Because the mobile phone penetration thing, oh, something sick, yeah? Yes. Um, you know what I was telling you about iterations and how yeah. one of the things that iterations do is that they give you a very rough, they give you a rough idea of the future, but it's further along. Yeah, yeah. To the point where you ask the right people the right questions, even though they don't understand what you're asking about. Hmm. I asked a Google executive in 2011, I said, what did you think about the future of um, 
cell phones. And he said, you know, he, he, he just rattled, it was at a function, he just rattled off the numbers, gave me the percentage, gave me the projections. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew that, okay, you know what, animation is going to work. You know? So, um, yeah, the, the storytelling, the cell phone penetration has happened. It has even surpassed the figures you brought out. Let us tell these stories. People have their phones. People will watch. People are interested in other people's, I would say, gossips, gist. You get? Yeah. And the, thing about, the, the sweetest thing about gossip is that when, other person, when another person's gist becomes your gist, whatever that person defended, you will defend. Certainly. Whatever perspective that person had, you will be able to appreciate it. Yeah, we've seen these things happen over and over and over again. Why not for people who are on the spectrum? Hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the, clearly there's a, there's a place for, for social media, for, for you know, the fact that we're in this digital era where you know, everyone is consuming this much content. As, as long as we get that story out there, we can transform our community and get people to be a bit more empathetic and, and to understand that they should protect, uh, be the one to protect and be the one to be the advocate for, for the voiceless. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, for me, I wanted to become an advocate when my, my son was diagnosed. At the time, I didn't have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I was just prepared to fight for this guy every day of the week because he's my son and I love him. With that being said, I'm going to, you know, scream from the rooftops about autism. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, tell my son about the world. Now I'm able to tell the world about my son type of thing, you understand? So, um, again, for me, when it comes down to it, you know, be, be, being an advocate and, as we say, creating the village for, you know, everyone to be able to understand, have more understanding about the condition is what I've been doing for the past maybe, you know, 14 years and stuff like that. I feel like we've made a lot of great uh, breakthroughs and, you know, especially in London and, you know, in the West, there's been a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot more understanding about the condition, you know, so that's another reason why I'm, I'm super happy and proud to be here in Nigeria today as a part of this autism conference and, uh, you know, telling my story again. It's amazing and thank you all for having me, for sure. Thank you so much. Remy, any final, any final words? Uh, yes, so the world is not, the world will never be prepared for what you have not prepared it for. Yeah. Um, I, um, what we do with what we learn here, or what we learned over the last two days, um, is ours to do the best that we can with it. Okay. I'm going to try and produce the best audio books. I'm going to try and engage in the best animation regarding these things. Even doc the, the thing for me is that the story can be told in a way that is relatable. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be A for A, B for B. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things that life has taught me. Um, you don't... We, we literally all have the same goal, which is to just make life easy for ourselves. And usually that also involves making life easier for other people. Definitely. When it becomes commonplace for people to see someone having a meltdown and recognize that it's autism, mm. then I'll know, okay, you know what, we've, we've hit a, we've made a breakthrough. We've a made breakthrough. a breakthrough, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know the most frightening thing that can happen to you in Nigeria? Tell me. Um, being in need of first aid in... <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't matter where. <laughs> and everybody's like, ah, okay, uh, yeah, all right, how do we put the leg like this now? Then there'll be people who are debating and discussing whether or not uh, what they know is more important than you, where they heard it from, which film they saw, where they heard it from. All the while the person was on the floor needing first aid. I had to, when I was working in Sound City, one of the jobs that I was working at, I remember seeing some people gathered by, um, on my way to Lekki, I saw some people gathered around the, just in front of the toll gates. I told my other guy to stop. I thought maybe somebody had fainted. Mm. That's how I then walked over to the chap and found out that he'd been involved in a, in a, in a bike accident. Oh, no. mm. Right? 
and everybody was standing around this man soaking up his air mm -hmm. blocking his air not even trying to find out his name or what was going on everybody was like ah, i think that we should yeah, i think i should so you know the mask you have to put for that one now yes, yes. so i just like i like claire <laughs> so i made them move i then looked he was wearing a black shirt but i saw the dark patch so i knew that he had col blood. yeah collarbone mm. so i asked him what's your name do you remember your name do you remember today's date where's your phone so i just kept asking him these things then i asked my camera guy to go and get an ambulance the ambulance came the I told them, like, look, I think he has a cracked collarbone, this, that, 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 that. Put him in ambulance, left. His boss called me later to say, okay, he's at the hospital and he's going to be fine. I said, okay, fine. You know, that's good. Now, wouldn't that be awesome if some stranger did that for somebody having a meltdown? Ah, it's like, it, ah, the devil is... Claire, 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 Claire. Turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. You know, just recognizing and coming in you know everybody needs to be rescued once in a while now even me absolutely i think we need to put our hands together that was beautiful don't stop clapping as they rise to their feet as well as i take a photograph thank you so much if i if i personally had a prize to give everyone who's still in the hall now i would, i'll give you all a prize because you all have stayed attentive stayed engaged and stayed involved um, throughout this conversation. Um, okay, let me stop talking. So please put your hands together for yourselves. For yourselves. Thank you. And one more time for John Paul and Remy. You people should take a picture of them. I, I love this. I love this, you know, energy. You know, it would have been, I, 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 this is just, you know, I don't know, John Paul, if you want to give us like a little freestyle or something. How about that? Look at, and then we have JJC in the building. Come on. Are we about to have a rave or what? Do you, do you need a beat? Like, doom, ka, ka, doom, ka. Oh, yeah, hold your mic. And then everybody clap. Ka, 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 doom, ka. One, two, doom. one, two. Ka, 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 doom, ka. Woo. Doom. Ka, 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 doom, ka. Oh. Doom. Hope we're not putting you on the spot, though. No Hope. beat, no beat, please. No, no beat. beat, no pressure. I'll just freestyle without. I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. I've been on my own for ages. Go through my Facebook pages so far away, babe, that's outrageous. Rocky's rich and famous. Still, I'm on the roads, dangerous. I still go for the dough, but I know all the money in the world ain't changes. Still the same as always. It's never too late. There's more days. And I ain't playing no more games. We could be sweeter than sorbets, babes. If you get with me, I'll be open sesame. You bring out the best in me, especially when you're next to me, I swear. Yo, make some noise for JP, yo! <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. No, right, next year, next year, um, so we need to get a, a DJ on stage. You know, get a full band. Isn't that amazing? One more time, please make some noise for John Paul Horsley. God bless you, brother. All right. So, believe it or not, uh, everything that has a start has a conclusion. Um, I'm not with my agenda now, but I, I, in my spirit, I feel like I need to call to Luoni Pede uh, to shut down the, the conference. So, can we put our hands together for Tulu Luoni Pede? She's with the GT Co team. And she'll just give us uh, an impromptu, I'm putting her on the spot, impromptu closing remark as we bring the conference to a close. One more time for Tolu. <laughs> thank you, Shil. So thank you, everyone. On behalf of the management staff, team of Guarantee Trust Holding Company, we want to say thank you for attending, for being attentive. We appreciate your volunteerism. And we say, please... The takeaway is for you to be a voice, be an advocate in your communities, in your small villages, in the big villages, you know, little drops make an ocean. And before we know it, the world at large is changed for it. So thank you, everyone. Have a great travel back to your places. Um, and I would like to say that the, the presentations will be available on the website. The website is on the front page of your brochure. 
gtcoplc.com forward slash autism. And then you can go to the resources. You see presentations from previous years. And the one for this year will be there maybe by tomorrow or two days after today. So thank you, everyone. Have a safe trip. Thank you so much to Lope. To our online audience, uh, remember the YouTube videos for the two days are available online. And can we just thank our online audience one more time with a round of applause as we shut the show down. Um, the entire conference for the two days are available on YouTube, on the GT Bank um, YouTube page, so you can get that as well. It's been an honor to serve you. My name is Oluwa P. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the week.